Mm. Perfect. All righty. Uh, good morning or afternoon or evening, wherever you all may be, and welcome to the introduction to Zeek training uh, for May 20th. A um, couple of quick things. Um, one, please try to make sure that you stay muted uh, if possible. Uh, and also, as Fatima noted, uh, we'll be watching for questions in the Slack channel. Uh, it's a little harder to see the chat channel, uh, the uh, chat pane in here. So we are sticking with uh, the Slack channel uh, to be able to interact with you. And we'll also be paying attention in there when we break for exercises and we'll try to help out wherever we can. Um, so uh, please do ask questions in there. Um, doing remote training is really hard because I can't see all of you. Uh, neither Fatima or I can see you, so it's harder to interact with you. Uh, and it really helps to have questions to see if we're on the right track, if we're going too fast, uh, or if something we're covering is a little confusing. So uh, without further ado, uh, who are we? Uh, so my name is Keith Lehigh. I am currently the University Information Security Officer at Indiana University. Uh, I manage the engineering team within the University Information Security Office. Um, I've been running Zico since about 2009 on the IU network uh, and have a lot of experience on large networks. Um, in addition to that, uh, I've been a Zeek LT member for a number of years and was a chair for a while uh, and have done this kind of training in a bunch of different settings. Um, so Fatima, if you'd like to pop on and introduce yourself. Sure. All right, hi everyone. I am Fatima Banathwala and I, I am a security engineer currently working at ESNet, which is Energy Sciences Network. And I have been working with Zeek for more than seven years now. And ever since it was Bro, I have been using it. And then it recently had a name change if you guys have been following it. And then I'm also, uh, uh, with Skeet, I'm also a Zeek LT member and I am uh, the Zeek training subgroup lead as well. So welcome everyone for the training, looking forward to it. And I'll just give a quick plug for the uh, training subgroup. Uh, if you're interested in contributing back to Zeek uh, and you have an interest in trying to help develop training uh, or have input on it, um, please feel free to reach out to Fatima and uh, we would love to have more participants. Uh, we're always looking to get new people into that group. So some of the goals that we're gonna look to cover today, uh, we're gonna run through, Fatima and I will be handing this off. Um, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about who uses Zeek and what they use it for. Uh, then we'll talk a little bit about what Zeek is, looking at some architecture and some of what it produces. Um, then we'll walk you through how to be able to run Zeek. Uh, this particular course is focused entirely on working off of the command line. Uh, you can run Zeek in a cluster mode where you may have one or multiple systems that are receiving traffic and doing analysis. That's a little bit larger than what we can cover in this kind of course. So we're really gonna be focused on what you can do on a command line. Um, then we'll talk a little bit about what you get out of Zeek, you know, what it does. Uh, Fatima will give you a nice tour of the file system layout to help you figure out where scripts are, where logs get put uh, and basically get you oriented there. Um, then I will walk you through how to be able to do a little bit of customization of Zeek to start getting you pointed in the right direction. Uh, and then Fatima will introduce you to the Zeek Package Manager, uh, which is an excellent way to be able to extend the capabilities of Zeek based on packages that other people have written and offered up. Um, we'll go through a little bit of log processing, basically some simple approaches to how to be able to do a little bit of log processing on the command line. Um, again, sort of there's a lot you can do with seams, but there are a lot of times where you may find yourself dealing with Zeek just on a command line and having a little bit of familiarity with some basic Unix commands and how to use them uh, to interact with the Zeek logs can be helpful. Uh, and then we will close this out today by looking at a couple common frameworks that we think are particularly useful for people who are new into the Zeek world. Um, Couple quick housekeeping notes here. Uh, there's a link to the GitHub. Uh, I believe this is also posted in the uh, is also posted in the Slack channel. It should be pinned there uh, for the training material. Uh, hopefully, everyone has had an opportunity to pull the Docker image down and get that going. Um, if you're still having any problems getting the Docker image started, uh, please feel free to chime in in the Slack channel, uh, and either Fatima or I or uh, anybody else who's in the uh, training room can maybe give people a hand there. 
Uh, and then last but not least, uh, we're working off of the 4.0.6 version of Zeek. Uh, and there's a link there at the bottom to the official documentation, which you can also find by just navigating to docs.zeek.org. So who uses Zeek? Uh, uh, there are a number of different groups that make use of Zeek. Um, probably uh, one of the first ones are people who are looking to do malware research. Um, you may be able to get, you know, capture your own PCAPs, or you may get PCAPs from someone else uh, that have indicators of malicious activity. And you want to be able to have a tool that can tell you as much as possible about what kind of network activity went on um, to sort of build up in uh, build up indicators of compromise, uh, understand what an attacker did once they got initial access to a system, uh, and basically build up a corpus of information. Uh, on what particular types of malware are, uh, what behaviors they exhibit. Um, probably the largest group of people who are using Zeek are various network defenders. Uh, when I first got into Zeek in the late aughts, um, really most of the usage of Zeek was focused around the .edu world. Uh, and it's been really uh, exciting to see over the last you know, 14 years or so, as uh, or 13 years rather, as Zeek has really spread across .gov and into the private sector. Um, at this point, it's not uncommon to see job postings that specifically require or desire experience with Zeek, uh, which tells you how far it's come in just the last decade and a half or so. Um, those network defenders are using Zeek for monitoring and detection, um, as well as forensics. Uh, so Zeek comes with some things that can help you automatically detect uh, malicious activity or unusual activity on your network. Uh, and again, those uh, Zeek packages that Fatima will talk about later really can help to extend that. Um, whenever there's new high value CVEs that pop up, uh, frequently you'll see Zeek packages or scripts that someone will write and share to be able to detect activity related to those. And those usually come out fairly quickly. You can throw them on your system and start getting indicators that there's uh, some attempt to uh, exploit uh, the latest CVE in your environment. And then of course, finally, Zeek is really useful for network forensics, um, not just being able to tell you something bad happened, but then give you the context around what happened before and after that malicious activity. Um, Zeek also has a lot of uses that aren't purely related to information security. Uh, it's been used in various places to be able to conduct network research and understand what sort of behaviors you see in network traffic, uh, maybe in users, uh, you can use it to gather information about uh, SSL certificates, for instance, usage there, and what you're seeing, uh, trends that may be seen. Um, and then finally, there are, uh, there are a number of different companies out there that are building Zeek into their products. Uh, probably the most well-known one is Corelight. Um, there's uh, a lot of other companies as well um, that are uh, building Zeek into their products. And sometimes you may not even know that that's what they've got running underneath of the covers. So again, that comes back to, it's really encouraging to see all of the different companies that are starting to build Zeek in and make use of it. it shows you some of the power. So uh, Zeek has a long history. Uh, the first lines of code were actually written in uh, about 1995 by Vern Paxson. Um, over the first you know, decade and a half or so, the growth of the platform was a little bit slow. And like I said, really focused uh, primarily within academia and the higher education world. Um, it's grown a tremendous amount since then. Um, Zeek is not just a platform, but it's also a domain specific network monitoring language. Um, that being said, you don't necessarily have to uh, learn the language to be able to take advantage of uh, you know, take advantage of the uh, uh, to be able to take advantage of Zeek. Um, you may never write a script in your life, um, but you can, like I said, load packages. You can run Zeek. Uh, you can get a lot of mileage out of just looking at the the uh, looking at the the traffic that comes out. Um, and there was a question in the chat. Um, uh, there are, uh, I, you know, I think Bricada is still going. They were uh, a company for a long time that had Zeek built into their packages. Um, my, there's another one that's escaping my name or my mind at the moment. Uh, there you go. Thanks for throwing in some of the extra names. Um, 
And again, it's really helpful if people can ask the questions in the Slack channel. It's a lot easier with, for me to see uh, what's going in and there uh, with that popped up into a separate window. Um, again, so domain-specific network monitoring language. Um, Zeek is really policy neutral. Um, and this is something that sometimes people will, will struggle with a little bit. Um, a lot of network monitoring tools are kind of focused around being able to just identify malicious or suspected malicious traffic. Um, Zeek is really about telling you what's going on on your network and then allowing you to figure out what's important to you, what you think may be uh, unusual or malicious uh, based upon your environment. Uh, so again, it takes a very policy neutral stance for the most part. Um, there are ways that you can have Zeek tell you that something uh, it's identified as malicious, but um, by and large, it's mostly about trying to give you ground truth about what's going on on your network uh, and then giving you the tools to be able to use that data um, to make assessments for yourself. Um, and again, that kind of comes back to the idea of if you've come from, you know, if you're coming into Zeek from a lot of experience, say with, you know, Snort or Suricata or things that are specifically triggered around giving you signatures and telling you that that signature matched. Um, sometimes that can, it can be a little bewildering to figure out how to make use of Zeek uh, if you're used to a more structured environment like that. So uh, real quick look at Zeek architecture. This is a very, very high level approach to the Zeek architecture. Um, we'll work from the bottom of the, uh, of the triple cheeseburger here. Um, so at the very bottom, you've got a network uh, that you're monitoring. You may be getting, you know, you may be getting packets from a packet capture that you've obtained. Um, you may have a tap or a span port of some sort that's feeding your uh, feeding Zeek. Um, but you, what you have to have at the bottom is a source of packets. Um, those packets are sent up into the event engine. Um, Zeek is an event-driven system, uh, so. Every action that happens within Zeek for the most part will raise an event that you can potentially hook into from scripts that you've written or that other people have written. Um, you know, it starts with the uh, Zeek init event, uh, which is the first event that fires when Zeek starts up. That's an excellent place to be able to hook in and set up data structures or get your system ready, maybe make some changes to logs, uh, that sort of activity. Um, when a new connection is seen, there's an event that fires. When the connection finishes, there's an event that fires. As various steps along the way, the handshake happens. Again, there are events that are firing off that scripts can actually then take advantage of. Uh, and so again, at that event engine, kind of at the event engine level is where uh, all of the protocol decoding is also actually happening. And there again are more events that fire off. When an HTTP connection is seen, there are a number of different events. Uh, and we'll get some opportunities in a little while to run some tools and be able to see what the different kind of events are that fire off in a given PCAP. Um, up above that, at kind of the top level, is what you might think of as the user interface to Zeek, which is the output from Zeek scripts of logs and notifications. Um, Zeek scripts are where all of the analysis magic really happens. Uh, and we will have an opportunity to look at a couple Zeek scripts, give you a little bit of orientation so that you can kind of read through them and get a sense of what Zeek is doing. So one of the most powerful parts of Zeek are the multitude of analyzers that are available. Um, there are you know, the common ones that, that everybody's pretty much familiar with uh, and that you can get a pretty fair amount of mileage out of. Um, you know, DNS uh, analyzers, HTTP, which is um, steadily declining in usage, uh, but there is still a little bit of HTTP activity that you may see. Um, SSL that will tell you a lot about certificates that are passed back and forth. Uh, and then you can start looking for suspicious indicators in there or if you're focused on compliance, you know, Zeek will tell you that there are certificates that are self-signed or that are expired passing over your network, uh, and that may be of interest to you. Um, there's also uh, a lot of analyzers built around providing you with information about authentication, um, you know, Microsoft protocols. Uh, there is, you know, a lot of data that you can get out of unencrypted SMB connections to tell you about you know, PowerShell activity that may be happening within your network or people passing files over SMB that are of interest to you. Um, there's also a lot of support for being able to observe tunneling connections. Uh, Zeek can see plain IP tunnels inside of IP 
and then annotates the connection log to tell you that, hey, this connection was actually part of a tunnel. Um, when I first started out, uh, IRC was probably one of the most useful, uh, uh, you know, kind of one of the most useful and interesting ones because at that time, IRC was really popular as a command and control channel for compromised systems. Uh, so you could simply start watching through your IRC logs and hopefully not too often see, but sometimes see systems on your network that had been compromised and were then connecting into an IRC channel. Um, don't really see that much anymore, but it's a fun blast from the past when you do. Um, the SOX tunnel or the SOX protocol uh, or proxy log would also be another one to be interested in. Um, you know, if you see a, a system in your finance office that's suddenly starting to offer up a SOX proxy to the world, that's, that might be reason to panic or at least be concerned. Um, in addition to protocol analyzers that are focused on network traffic, there are also a handful of file analyzers that Zeek has. Um, these give you things like hashes of all of the files that fly back and forth over your network. If you think about it, SSL certificates are really just files that are being passed back and forth. So, so Zeek will helpfully hash those SSL certificates for you, generate a log, and then you can use things like the Intel framework to watch for malicious SSL certificate hashes on your network and then take automated action or review at a later point and track down what happened. Um, in addition, there's a file extraction uh, analyzer that will actually allow you to pull files out of the network traffic that's seen. Um, that can be really handy for grabbing those files and then throwing them into malware sandboxes or doing your own research and reversing on it. Um, by default, Zeek does not save a copy of the files that were seen on the network. Uh, it will just give you a hash. Uh, I think it's still by default uh, MD5 and SHA-1 hash, but you can also do SHA-256 hashes. Um, but it is fairly easy. If you're on kind of a smaller network, it's pretty easy for you to be able to enable the file extraction support and have Zeek start extracting out all of the files that you want. Um, there's also support, support for focusing on only certain MIME types. Uh, so maybe you only wanna save uh, Microsoft Office files are all you're interested in. And when you see those passing over your network, um, you wanna grab a copy of those to be able to look for macros or things like that that, are, uh, that might be a, a source of sketchiness. Um, one of the really interesting thing that's uh, kind of come to light recently uh, or been released is the SPICY uh, component within Zeek. Um, so SPICY is a C++ parser generator that makes it a lot easier for you to be able to build parsers for Zeek. Um, there are some uh, new ones that have been released. Uh, there's a rewrite of the DHCP analyzer that's done within SPICY. Um, you know, there's a TFTP one. Uh, all of these are available through the Zeek package manager. Um, and uh, later when Fatima walks you through that, you'll see how to be able to search for what kind of spicy packages might be available. Um, again, this is a really interesting way to be able to add parsers and hopefully will give people an easy way to be able to write a parser that they can then start watching for some sort of operational technology protocol that's weird and interesting uh, or extend the protocol capabilities of Zeek. So building on top of those analyzers, one of the other useful things, uh, probably powerful capabilities of Zeek is its dynamic protocol detection. Um, the idea here is that Zeek can identify protocols regardless of whether they're running on a standard port or not. Um, so starting to see you know, SSH on an unusual high port in your environment might be, depending upon what your, uh, you know, your security requirements are, that may be something that you want to be able to look into. Or, starting to see HTTP servers that pop up in, on weird ports in weird places. Um, so the initial way that Zeek figures out what protocol analyzer to attach is hints from a variable that's known as known ports. Uh, so for instance, with HTTP, Zeek will be told to watch for HTTP traffic on uh, port 80, 8080, uh, some of the common ones like that. So if Zeek sees traffic on port 80, for instance, it will first try to attach the HTTP analyzer and see if it can start to parse the traffic that's there. Um, should it fail to attach, um, maybe someone is running RDP on port 80, 
Uh, Zeek will then start to try a combination of signatures for different protocols, as well as trying to attach analyzers to that connection until it's successful. Um, and again, this gives you an opportunity to find things that are running on unusual ports. Um, I'll answer that question once I get to the bottom of the slide. Uh, there's a question about uh, the impact of TLS on network monitoring. Um, so once a protocol has been successfully parsed, um, that'll usually be reflected in a couple of places. Uh, one in the connection log uh, or con.log, there is a protocol field that will tell you what Zeek was able to parse out. As well, there's a files.log that will show you the analyzers that attached. And that'll be a comma separated list in case there were multiple analyzers that were able to attach. Um, and in a little bit, we will pop out and take a look at a couple of these. Um, so as it notes there, um, non-standard port doesn't always mean that that's necessarily bad. Uh, again, you know, that, uh, that SSH server listening on port 443 might be someone who just wants to be able to SSH from a hotel network that is extremely limited in what you can connect outbound for. Um, it could be someone experimenting, um, but it also might be not good. Uh, so part of this is, Zeek is useful once you start to understand what your own network is like and what is normal for the network that you're defending. Um, also out of Zeek, there's a, a log file that's generated called known services. And this is a log that will show you all of the services that Zeek detected on your local network um, as a running track. Uh, I think by default, it'll only log once every 24 hours. Uh, we'd have to poke around in tech to verify that. But that's a really great place to be able to quickly search and look for, say, RDP on ports outside of 3389. Um, so to circle back in the Slack channel, there was a question about how much Zeek has impact, TLS usage has impacted uh, the value that you get from network traffic. Um, it has certainly made network monitoring more challenging. Um, that being said, there's still a lot of information that you can get out of the metadata related to a connection. Um, so you might want to start looking at what are the uh, server names that are inside of the SSL certificates that are passing back and forth over your network. Um, getting back to those hashes related to malicious, known malicious SSL certificates, um, you can still tell a fair amount there. Um, you can get a lot of useful insight into how much traffic was passed in a particular connection. Um, you know, if a system gets compromised and it has large volumes of sensitive data, but you only see very small, very few, very small number of data flows out of that system, you can have some confidence that the, that the sensitive data that you had on there probably wasn't wholesale slurped out and sent off, your, uh, off of your network. Um, on top of that, uh, for the most part still, uh, DNS traffic is unencrypted. Uh, and so again, that tells you a lot about what uh, system was connecting to. Um, so uh, there is still some value uh, in, in, uh, you know, in Zeek and in network monitoring at large. Uh, and I, I, you know, I don't think that it will go away. Um, at this point, it's starting to be complemented by other tools like having Zeek plus a decent EDR um, carefully uh, deployed in your network can really, you know, those two tools can start to work together quite well. Um, so um, on top of that, there are still a fair number of protocols that are uh, not encrypted, um, you know, especially within the IoT and OT world. Uh, so that again, I think still a lot of value to be had there. And yeah, there's a comment about JAW3. Uh, I don't think we really dive into that too much. So very briefly, um, there's a way to be able to build a signature based off of the behavior of an SSL connection uh, that's known as JA3, and then there's JA3S, which is giving you the same thing from the server. Um, and in some cases, you can actually use JA3 uh, hashes to be able to work back to specific applications that may have some unusual behaviors. So um, my experience with that is it, it can sometimes be a little bit noisy. Um, but it is still yet another, uh, you know, yet another bit of metadata that you can get without actually having to look into the content of the connection itself. Good question so far. Okay, uh, and uh, with that, it is Fatima's turn. Thank 
topic. Um, <clears throat> thanks, Keith. Um, I can go ahead and share my screen. Okay, so I hope my screen is visible to everyone and it's, I'm sharing the right screen. It's always good to make sure uh, before you like leak any confidential data. All right, so running Zeek, um, before we jump into that, I would really like to remind you guys again that we will be running some exercises. And for that, uh, you need to have a Docker client on your system and um, you need to be able to run a CLI on the image that we will be using. The image that we will be using is available on Docker Hub and that can be pulled down using command docker pull security slash seek training 2022. Once you have the image, you just have to run it and run a run dash ID uh, image and then get a bash shell on that container. That's all you need to do. Uh, that's all you need to do. And then once you have the shell, then you are good to go for the coming up exercises. So do let us know in the chat uh, if you have any trouble in pulling down the image and getting a shell inside the Docker container that we'll be using. So once you are inside the, um, the container, please verify that Zeek is installed currently by running slash Zeek slash bin slash Zeek dash H. Slash Zeek is not the default uh, prefix for the uh, Zeek installation. I will get into that later on when I will do the when I will do the uh, walkthrough of the file system. But I have symlinked it so that it's a smaller path for us to type in whenever we are running Zeek. And even smaller if you export that uh, slash Zeek slash bin to your path so that you can just type Zeek and then it will it will know where to pick up the binary of Zeek from. So I can really quickly show you how. So this is the um, command line that I have on the container in uh, ls. So this is the slash seek. So this is the uh, folder that we'll be using. That's a symlink to the op slash seek. That's our actual install pa installation path. And um, to run it real quick, seek slash bin. And then you can use tab for autocomplete and help. So this should be the help page that should be displayed. That will kind of like verify whether the seek is installed correctly. It should be because we all, if we are all using the same image, you can, you are, you should be able to get to the, um, you know, help page of seek binary. And then I think I have already exported the path. Yeah. So if you have, if you have export, if you have not exported the, the uh, slash zines slash slash seek slash bin path, if you run Zeek, it should error out saying the binary binary was not found. So that's why this export step is necessary. So if you haven't done that, you are uh, you are recommended to do that so that you can just run Zeek and then it should just pick up the slash seek slash bin binary path. All right, so this is all you need to um, have set up so far for our coming up exercises. And then we will get to the command line pretty soon in the next few slides. So let us know if you have any trouble running one of those commands or any of the, any of those commands. Okay, so running Zeek, uh, there are basically two main modes to run, run Zeek. One is the um, online mode and like for me one is online mode and one is offline mode. So what does that mean is Zeek can actually sniff the packets from your interface which is called live mode and in that as well there are two methods to do that. So if you are just temporarily sniffing these packets on the um, on one of your interfaces you can run Zeek dash i and provide that interface and it Zeek will start sniffing the package from the corresponding interface. That's the command line part so it is not going to like demonize itself. So it will run on your on your CLI, just like TCP dump. You run TCP dump on an interface and it captures the packet. Similar way, Zeek will run on a live interface to capture the packets. So that's the live mode. And then uh, there is, uh, for capturing packets, there is another mode called Zeek cluster. So where you actually use Zeek control, Zeek CTL, and that Zeek control framework is used to start, stop, and um, reload or deploy, de deploy new scripts in Zeek. And that's the most uh, common way people use Zeek for um, capturing live packets from the interface. We will go through the inter we will go through the node.config file when we do when we do the file system layout, where I will 
uh, make sure to go through the sections where you can configure the interface to use the control framework to start and stop Zeek on your system. That's the most common way people use to run Zeek to sniff the live traffic from the interface and get the logs generated. Um, on the offline side, Zeek also is capable of reading packets from the uh, PCAP files. So if you do not have uh, set up an interface or if you do not want to capture packets from the interface, but rather you would do some offline analysis of already captured packets, uh, or if you have a packet capture dump, like a PCAP dump from some other tool, and you just want to investigate that PCAP using Zeek, then Zeek is also capable of doing that in offline mode. And most of the uh, uh, nowadays, most of the CTFs actually have Zeek exercises. So Zeek is really helpful to do forensics. So if you have a PCAP and if you really quickly want to look at what kind of common protocols are found, instead of running that PCAP in Wireshark, what you can do is you can have a Zeek install on a system and then you can let Zeek read that PCAP for you and see what different log files are generated by Zeek. And it's easy to do analysis on the tab separated log files then um, than opening a PCAP in a Wireshark for fast analysis. So that is also another great use case of Zeek where you just run it as a forensic tool to do forensics on a PCAP uh, or a packet capture dump. So uh, we, will we will primarily be focusing on reading from the PCAP, which is the offline mode. And uh, for that, we will be using Zeek CLI. So these are a few different ways you can run Zeek. So the first one that is uh, on the screen is Zeek read capture.pcap. What that does is, uh, by default, Zeek load all the scripts that are available in the slash base directory. Again, I will walk through all the directories that are there in the Zeek install. So we will we will talk about that uh, in that section as well. So when you uh, when you read a packet capture using just a Zeek command without giving any kind of other options, all it is doing is uh, it is reading uh, the pcap and it is analyzing the pcap based off of all the default scripts that are found in the slash base directory. So no exclusive, no other uh, exclusive policy will be loaded. It will be just like basic Zeek analysis of that PCAP. If it's a captured PCAP, a lot of times we run into the issue that uh, there are no logs generated and you just are wondering why there are no logs generated. So most of the times if the checksum is bad or the, uh, or the checksum is corrupted in the PCAP packet captures, Zeek, is not able, Zeek by default does not analyze those packets and skip the, analy skip the analysis of those packets. A lot of times we have people asking us the question on uh, the mailing list that I'm running Zeek on a packet capture, but I'm not getting any logs generated and why is it so? So most common problem is uh, Zeek uh, is looking for the bad checksums and if it encounters any bad checksum, it skips the analysis of that packet. So the recomm recommended way to run Zeek on a packet capture is always to use dash C option, which says Zeek that you should not look for the, um, uh, avoid the checksum checking on the PCAP file, and then you will be able to see all the logs generated by the Zeek on that PCAP. Okay, so the third command here is you're reading a PCAP, and then if you have a script that you have written, it's a custom script that you have written and you want to test a PCAP against that script, or if it's a script that is available in Zeek policies, but it is not loaded by default uh, on in Zeek, what you can do is you can actually run that PCAP and access exclusively load that script that is by default not loaded by Zeek. And then you can have uh, whatever whatever the script uh, logic is to run on that PCAP. So if you have a packet captured that has some malicious um, packets in it and you have written a signature to detect that, and if you want to add that script for the um, analysis part of the PCAP, then you can run that command and you can just provide the script on the command line and then that script will be auto automatically loaded when Zeek is reading that PCAP and doing the analysis. Other than all the default scripts that are loaded by Zeek in the slash base directory. The fourth command here, it says, at the end it says local. So Zeek has a Zeek path by default that it looks for, for checking what all scripts are loaded for Zeek to do analysis. So by default, local, if you run Zeek read cap packet capture, it will not load any kind of policies by default for you. There is a local.zeek file that is available in the site folder uh, in Zeek. And in that local.zeek file, you actually mention what policies you want to be enabled and what policy you want to be disabled. Like you want to load and unload a, a policy specific, specific, specifically. By default, Zeek comes with a site, uh, with a site local.zeek uh, Zeek file that you can load when you are uh, running um, Zeek uh, in your environment. And that is a very basic policy um, 
policy <clears throat> file that Zeek comes with. And it has by default some of the really important um, or cool policies that are enabled that would be useful for you to have enabled in your environment as well. So Zeek comes with the by default local.zeek file that has some local policies enabled. So if you like to have that um, those policies enabled, then you can actually give that local in the command line to say that, okay, on this packet capture, I want to run it with all the base directory scripts plus some of the policies that are defined in the local.seq file enable. And there will be difference in the log files based on the command you run on the number four and based on the command you run on number one or two. The fifth one, uh, the other uh, good flags that you can give when you are running Zeek in command line is the dash E, which is exec. So there is a um, there is a way where you can extend a variable, or if there if there are some um, enum or variable types that are redefinable in the scripts, you can either uh, edit them or extend them using the command line. So uh, when you run a packet capture through local, there are some policy scripts in local.zeek that are enabled that uses the site local nets variable to do the analysis. So when you use that. It will when you use local on your packet capture, it might show you a warning saying you, you have not defined any site local nets in your in your environment. So this in this command, what we're doing is we are telling Zeek that we have uh, we have slash 24 subnet as our local net, and that's what we are extending and we are redefining it. So we are going to run these commands and see the differences. So that's what you can also do uh, when running Zeek in command line mode and reading a PCAP. The sixth one is actually an example of um, third one where you can run a capture with a, a copy of a, a, a custom copy of your script. So here I'm reading a modbus.pcap and then uh, this script uh, strike mem memmap.zeek. It's a policy script or an all, all, uh, there in Zeek. It's not written by, like it's not a custom script, but it's not enabled by default. So if you have a modbus pcap and if you want to run it against that memcap.zeek, script that you can actually enable that script on the command line. Okay. So these are the few different uh, ways you can run Zeek in offline mode with different, um, trying out different uh, flags and uh, different uh, uh, local scripts and whatnot. And then you can see the differences in the output of, the, uh, of each command. Okay, so this is the exercise. So uh, we, what we have been doing in past is I will, uh, we will. We were running the exercises at the same time when we will. Uh, we were trying to let you run the exercise, and what we found is it's kind of like uh, you know a, a, a hit and miss condition. So what I would like to do is, based on what we have discussed, how to run Zeek in CLI mode. If you guys can try out these commands, and uh, see the difference in the output, and then I will go through this. Uh, go, go through this. Go through this exercise again, and you can verify or you can follow with me when I'm doing this exercise. So I'm going to give you 10 minutes to run these commands and see the differences and see what you see after running those commands. And then I will walk you through the exercise. Uh, I have pasted these command lines in the Slack channel. So if you guys want to copy paste from Slack, then that should also work too.
Uh, just wanted to mention quickly that Zeek command line, when you're running in offline mode like this, these commands will successfully run and returns you the terminal. So if you're not getting any output, just try to try to run ls command and see if you get the dot log files generated. That's the output we are looking for. That if Zeek is able to generate the log files um, based on what Zeek has seen in the packet capture. All right, I, uh, um, I can now run you through the um, command lines and see if you guys got the same output. All right, so the first, <clears throat> I usually, so when you run Zeek on the command line, <clears throat> It dumps the logs in the current current directory that you're working in. So uh, I would recommend, or I personally use slash zeek slash, slash logs directory because it's kind of like empty. So whenever you run zeek in command line, uh, it, you can easily see the output that if it is it has generated any output in the current directory. So I will be using that slash zeek slash logs and I'll be running all the um, commands in here and see if there are outputs. 
So the first command was to run Zeek and, and read the PCAP without any, uh, without explicitly mentioning any, uh, any specific policy. Okay, so it ran, it ran fast. Um, so if you now do ls, before ls was not returning anything because the log, logs directory was empty. So when you read the file, uh, which is capture of pcap, and then uh, Zeek does the uh, analysis of the pcap, it generates some of the log files based on what traffic is captured in that capture.pcap file. So these are some of the files uh, that has been generated by just by uh, reading the pcap on the command line. This, has, this is very helpful because if you're doing some kind of forensic work on your PCAP and if you really want to enumerate what all protocols are there in the PCAP, this is a pretty easy way to see that, uh, okay, so this has some DNS traffic, there were some file transfers that were going on, um, and it can also include the um, certificates and whatnot that gets transferred. And then uh, there was some web traffic, some NTP traffic, and then some mail traffic and then some SSH traffic. So this gives you kind of like a easy way to enumerate what kind of protocols you can you are seeing in that packet capture. And you can go over these um, log files to see exactly what has been recorded if you are not familiar with these Zeek logs. So the first field is the um, the header field. Uh, so the first row is the header header field, uh, field row that has all the um, column name. And then, um, and then it has the data and it's a tab separated file. So you can easily do any kind of like statistical analysis of how many unique IPs, how many destination unique IPs were there, how many destination, uh, how many unique source IPs are there, what are the ports involved and what kind of um, service you saw in that, in that um, con dot log file. Um, yeah, you can just go through these log files and see what has been captured. This is just the HTML, um, text slash HTML page from the um, web traffic, most of the web traffic. Okay, and then there is some SSH log. There are only two SSH um, attempts seen in the capture file. So, um, so yeah, you can go through these log files and analyze them. But for now, I'm just going to remove them before running the next command, because if you don't remove them, when you rerun the Zeek uh, again, the second time, these files will be overwritten. So, and if there are new files, they will get regenerated. So um, I will just remove the log files and make sure the log, make, so, make sure the uh, log script is empty. And then I can run the same command again, except now I will load the lo some of the local policies that Zeek comes with, comes with. But before that, let me show you what local.zeek is so that you know what exactly we are loading. So usually uh, local.zeek policy, um, file is located under the site directory. So if we go to um, week slash share slash week slash site, and then it has local, right there, it has local.z. So I can show you real quick what local.z looks like. So this is the local site policy and uh, you can customize it as appropriate. It has some of the policies by enabled, enabled by default. So um, this is the policy that uh, shows you what scripts are loaded uh, when you run Zeek on uh, either a PCAP or when you're running Zeek on an interface. Uh, this actually generates the um, capture, uh, capture loss uh, log file that records if you are running into the issue of um, capture loss seen by Zeek. So uh, there's a scan script that is by default disabled because it can be pretty intense uh, when you have like heavy, uh, when you run the script on a heavy network, uh, when you run the script on the network that has heavy traffic, there is like trace route. Um, there are like soft, soft, there's a software framework that reports these software versions and whatnot. And then um, these are all by default uh, uh, scripts that report the um, software detected and they uh, in the various protocols. So these will allow uh, us another new log file get the, another new log file generated in Zeek called software.log file. And these policies will dump whatever software is seeing on those protocols in software.log files. So that is also a pretty neat um, log file to do analysis. So you can see that these are the, the default policies that are enabled in the local.zeek. Um, 
which were not like if you don't load if you don't load local these policies these policies will not be loaded by default for your analysis so that's why we want to um, run the run the capture again enabling those uh, local site policies now we have more files so if you see the output difference, if when we were running Zeek on just a packet capture without loading any um, local site policy scripts, then the, it, it was just generating the low log files uh, that are based on the analysis of um, the cap capture based on the all the scripts that are available in the slash base folder. But since now we have loaded some additional scripts via the local.c, it has seen um, it has some more log files that are getting generated, like capture logs.log is one of the file loaded scripts.log is another log file that is new and then stats.log is another log file that is new so um other log files are the pretty much same log files that were generated before so this is the advantage of loading uh, local.zeek and you can add your customizations however we, however you want uh in your environment so that was another um another way of running zeek using custom site local policies all right, um, so let me remove. Oh, so another thing I wanted to mention is uh, the warning. So some of the policies that were loaded by the local.z were actually looking for um, site local net um, variable to be defined. But since we haven't configured Zeek yet uh, or I haven't customized it to our environment, it is, it is just throwing a warning that the uh, analysis might not be efficient because we don't have local nets defined. There are a lot of policies in Zeek that if you have local nets defined, you can do analysis like whether this traffic is inbound or outbound. Uh, for scan detection, if uh, if you have local nets defined, then it knows that somebody is scanning your environment because it knows about your local environment. So now next, what we are going to do is I'm going to remove the log files again from the current directory. And now we are going to define some of our um, local nets and see what happens. Now we should not have the warning. And then we have more logs. So now see the, um, we are running the exact same command with some more additions to it. So the first time we ran was just like this command to do this, just the bare minimum um, analysis of the PCAP. Then we added local policies to it and it generated some more log files, which were interesting. Then we added the site local um, uh, exit on the uh, on the command line, and now we have more log files. So known services dot log that was one of the log files that Keith was mentioning. That if you have uh, that that can be a land, that log file can be a landmine of services that you want to know what services you are running on your network. It is pretty helpful because if you if you have your Z deployment on north south, like if you are only looking for the um, inbound and outbound traffic from and to your uh, environment, and if you know that the SSH is not open on your network to the world, and but you are seeing the SSH service here, that means there are some um, SSH, SSH services that is in your network that is exposed to the internet. So that can be really helpful log file to, to just to do just the um, troubleshooting and analysis of your network that what services are open to the world and what um, services are not. So we have used known services.log file in past in a lot of different ways to, um, to harden our network and see what services are available and uh, what services are visible outside our network to the internet. So, uh, and then there is software.log file that records the versioning of different kinds of software Zeek has seen on different kinds of protocols. So um, there's an HTTP server Apache running uh, version 2.4.29. And then there's an SSH server, there's an SSH client. It has the open SSH version 7.6. And then um, they, they are not, there's not much of information right now in software block file because our PCAP is pretty small. But if you have like large PCAPs and you are doing analysis, then that also is a pretty handy file to look into. So these are some additional log files that are not related to any kind of protocol analysis, but it's just like um, some of the policies that are available in Zeek to do additional metadata analysis of your PCAP. So these are some of the log files that are pretty interesting to look at, and they, they, they are really helpful when you're when you doing uh, the log analysis uh, of 
zip logs. So that's uh, another way to run seek. I'm just going to remove the log files now. And then we should not have any other log files. And the last one was just to show you if So that's a pretty small PCAP, which is a Modbus PCAP. And then we are running. So this policy is not enabled by default in the lo site local, but I want to run that policy against my Modbus PCAP because I know that Seek has this custom policy to track map gap, um, a map map in um, in the um, in the packet. So I have run that exclusive strip on my PCAP, and then it has generated these log files. So you can just see the. Log, and it has all the connection information. All right, so that concludes our exercise of just running uh, Zeek in different um, levels of command line and enabling and disabling some of the policy scripts that are available in Zeek and see the difference in the output and see the difference in the log files. And uh, this is a whole, like this is a kind of like an offline analysis mode. And you can actually run Zeek on online live traffic on interface it's zero but we are not seeing any traffic right now so it will just listen it listen on it and if we like do a control c it is just saying zero packet three so it's just like pretty, pretty much similar to what you run um, using tcp dump so that's another way of like capturing live traffic to do some analysis of live traffic so all right So what is the TCP server? Okay, so um, Heath responded to that. I All right, um, so that brings me to our next section, which is running Zeek online. So the other great tool that I highly recommend to check out is the um, try.zeek.org. That's, the, uh, that's, that, that, that's the online version of the tool. So you don't have to have Zeek installed on your system. So if you just want to do a quick analysis or if you have written a script and if, you're, if you want to check whether that script has any errors or any problems, you can try that out on try.zeek.org and it will tell you uh, it will it will show you a scenario if you were running Zeek on your local system and if you were trying out a, a PCAP or a, or a script on your local system. So that is a pretty easy and handy way to get Zeek up and running or if you want to try out Zeek without having it installed on your system. So it's 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 a, it's a pretty standard web portal. And uh, here you can see that it has um, some different interesting um, Sections. So there is a basic uh, playbook of all the examples that are available, or most of the examples that you can play around with, and it has like different uh, uh, exercises in it. So if, for example, if you want to know how you can define variables in Zeek, this is how you can define some of the variables. Of course, these are very basic examples. You can customize it as you want, and they are highly advanced examples as well. Ashish might be able to um, show you more advanced version of the Zeek scripting, but this is a very handy. Um, way to try out some of this basic simple Zeek script. And if you are new to Zeek scripting, I would highly, I would highly recommend you to check out try.zeek.org. Uh, and it is also a great way to test your script, as I said, that if you have written a script and if you don't want the trouble of going through um, running that script on your system with Zeek and seeing what errors it is showing, you can just copy paste your script here. And then you just um, choose a PCAP. There are some sample PCAPs available and then you can just run it. And then it will just show you in a second all the log files it is going to generate based on what is available in the PCAP and based on what your script is doing. But right now, this script is just printing the two um, strings. So this is the output of the script. That means the script is working, but it's not, it is not doing anything else. So the analysis of this PCAP is just like the very basic analysis that Zeek does on any other PCAP. So these are the some of the log files that Zeek will generate if you would have run um, this, P, this PCAP 
on your system with Zeek version 4.2.0. So it's kind of like pretty handy um, interface where you can run Zeek without going to the trouble of installing it by yourself. And then you can just go through the different log files. They are, they are exactly the log, same log files that you would see on your command line. And then you can try out like different ways. Like if you want to, if you're writing a custom script and if you don't, don't know how to use a switch statement, so this gives you this gives you an example of this is how you can use a switch statement in Zeek, and then you can, you know, um, use that in in your script. So this is basically a very basic uh, interface to show you the different uh, things that you can do with Zeek, different uh, different modules that you can uh, use, and how to write a module, and how to write a variable, how to use a loop, how to use a function, uh, and so on and so forth. So it it, it is like a very um, Again, I said it's very basic. It's like a step one. If you want to take step one in the Zeek scripting, you can go through these uh, some of the basic examples and see how different things can be done. So this is like an example of a for loop um, and, and different kind of composite type, composite types. And it has like a, a small uh, kind of like uh, description as well that what it is trying to explain in this uh, in this Zeek script. So this is a pretty handy tool again, uh, and you can try it out by just going to try it or org and then uh, browse through it. Again, another good thing about that is if I have written a custom script and if I want to share that, so for example, if this is my custom script and I'm just, uh, I have just customized it, say, um, again, it's, it's a very stupid example, but still. And then I want to share that, um, script um, so when you have a custom script that you run on try or zeek it saves it uh, for a period time period of time i think it's 30 days uh, if i'm not wrong and then what you can do is instead of sharing this script uh, as a file what you can do is you can just share this url to whoever you like and then that person can actually go through that, uh, go on that URL and can see what you have written in your script. So this is another handy way of sharing your scripts if you have written it and verifying whether they're working fine or if there are any errors. So like if I do this and run it, it should error out saying that there's a missing um, code. So this is a pretty handy way of, again, testing out your scripts. All right, um, running Zeek only with scripts. The other thing is uh, if you do not have a PCAP and if you are just testing out a script, the other way to test out a script is to is just to run this script with Zeek and see if it is erroring out on anything. Uh, and this is like a pretty basic uh, example. Like it's a hello world example and I can quickly run it. So this is script, all it is doing, it is just printing out the hello world and goodbye message. And if you want to just test out the script, you can just run that script really quick with Zeek without doing without, without uh, giving any kind of flags or variables and it is just going to um, print the output. So this is another way of uh, testing out scripts with Zeek. So it's not like you have to give a PCAP or you have to have an interface that with packets to run Zeek. You can totally run Zeek on the scripts as well. So uh, can you build and test filtering on try.zeek? Log filtering, yes. Uh, I assume you can do that. You have to just add the script. So here is the add files, right? So whatever uh, files, there is this main file and if you have like uh, loaded some other files for the filtering i'm sure you you have to then just add those files here and then run it so it should it should work for filtering the log files as well if you mean filtering some of the log streams in seek uh, but yeah it should work try or or should work for the filtering of log files as well okay so the one last thing before we jump for our break is dump events 
So um, Keith was mentioning before the, the engine, the event engine that how Z performs the analysis and how it starts the analysis. I was going to give you a quick um, rundown of what different kind of events get triggered as soon as Zeek starts receiving the packets and how the hierarchy of the events um, look like when Zeek starts processing a PCAP. So there's a pretty handy script for that. So if you have a sample PCAP and if you want to know what is the um, what are the events that are triggering on that PCAP for those particular packets and what is the um, uh, organization, like which event is triggered first and which event is triggered after, then you can totally use the miscellaneous slash dumb, 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 dot, uh, dumb dash events. That's also useful when you're writing scripts. So if you have a custom script that you want to take an action when a certain kind of event is triggered, and you are not sure when exactly that, that event is triggered, you can totally run that PCAP on the uh, dumb events and see when exactly that event is triggered. So uh, we can quickly, uh, I can give you a quick rundown of, um, let me post that in chat as well. I'm just going to run it with the more command so that it doesn't uh, keep uh, spinning out the output. All right, so this is what is happening. So the, the very first event that triggers whenever you read a PCAP is Zeek init event. And then it actually starts um, initializing all different events on the based on the PCAP. And then there is a new connection event that gets triggered whenever Zeek sees a new connection with this um, origin, like with this um, four tuple. And then it starts initializing the event. Other things are not initialized yet at this point. It, is, it has just seen a new connection and C is the connection record that got initialized during this new connection event. Uh, DNS, it doesn't know anything about what service or what uh, protocols are being used yet. So it has just it started the analysis of the packets and it has triggered the first new connection. Here is the second new connection it has triggered. It looks like that it should be um, an NTP connection because the response port is 123. Still, it, it, it is still nothing else has been initialized at this point because the new connection literally just starts a record for a new connection, um, record C, and then starts uh, uh, populating that connection record. And then after that, you can see there's another event called protocol confirmation that, have, that triggered uh, protocol information here. So this connection, there was a new connection with the origin host and origin port response and response port. And then uh, it has seen uh, the uh, size of the packets and uh, the L2 address, but other than that, nothing else has been initialized. So for the protocol confirmation, what it is doing is it is trying to verify what exactly analyzer to use for the next step or the next level of, um, of analysis of the PCAP. So it looks like that from the from the port, it looks like that is a is an NTP connection. So the next step for Zeek is it, it has attached the N NTP analyzer to this um, to this new connection, and then it will start um, the analysis after that. So the next event is, of course, the NTP message. So this is the hierarchy of events. So the first event is like new connection, a new connection record is formed. It is trying to confirm the protocol that what protocol is been seen in that uh, in, in that connection. It will attach that corresponding protocol analyzer to that uh, connection, and then it will start uh, populating corresponding records for that um, analyzer. So NTP message is another event that gets triggered based on the analyzer, and then it will start populating the um, it will start populating the um, service and uh, other uh, other NTP related um, uh, message record. So this is another a record type message NTP message that gets populated at this point because of the NTP event NTP message event triggering. So that's the next event that will trigger, and then broker log flush. So now it has completed the Zeek has completed the analysis of that connection which was the NTP report, and then now it will flush um, the log pipeline and, and it will log the NTP dot log file with that with that uh, data. So this is how the different events get triggered based on what traffic has been seen. So another new connection, I think it's a DNS connection. And now you can see all the different kind of DNS events getting triggered. So after the new connection is detected, 
the new, new, new connection event is triggered, now DNS message event is triggered because Zeek is analyzing whether it's actually is a whether that connection is actually a DNS connection or not. So this is the DNS message um, connection record initialization, what it has seen, DNS message, what is the length of the um, of the capture, and then the based on DNS message, whether it's a request or response. So DNS request is another event that gets triggered right after the DNS message. And then it's, it's, it will start populating the corresponding um, services in the report, corresponding fields of the corresponding services in the report. So the report will get bigger and bigger. And then the analyzers, DNS analyzer, once it confirms the protocol that yes, it is not a dynamic protocol on different port, but it's like actual DNS protocol. If DNS packets going on on DNS port, then it will confirm the protocol and it will attach the analyzer to that connection. And now it will start analyzing the DNS. And then finally, the DNS end is the last event that gets triggered. And at this point, the connection record has all this data. But of course, like SMTP is initialized and other, other protocols are not initialized uh, because this, it's a DNS message. So this is the kind of like end. And then this is the DNS message that gets kind of like populated as well. So number of queries is one. And then there's another new connection, which is a DNS response, so on and so forth. So you can you get an idea of how the event engine um, starts as soon as you start uh, reading a PCAP in, in Z. So it is it's just going to go on. So this is a pretty handy uh, this is a pretty handy way to uh, know the hierarchy of events, what event is triggered with uh, next uh, next according to your packet capture. So run that and see uh, if, if it makes sense to you. And if you have any questions, let us know. And I think after that, uh, I think we were planning for a break, Keith. Or I can hand it over to you, whatever you like. Uh, yeah, let's give people five minutes just to stretch your legs or uh, five minutes to play around with uh, the dump events, maybe run it against your own PCAPs. Uh, so give everybody a chance to get up stretch and then we'll dive right back in in five minutes. Cool. And yeah, uh, I will be monitoring the uh, Slack and, and chat. So if I have missed any questions, I will try to answer it during this break period of time.
Okay. Alrighty. Let's hop back into this. Should be able to see my slides. So now we're going to talk uh, briefly a little bit about what Zeek does uh, or what you get out of Zeek. So the most important thing, uh, by far the most useful thing out of Zeek is the rich set of logs. Uh, you've had a little bit of an opportunity to look at a few of these as you ran Zeek earlier, but we're gonna dive a little bit more into some specific parts of the logs that are output. So by default, uh, Zeek logs are always written in ASCII format uh, in, uh, as ASCII logs with a tab separated value format. Um, there is the ability to write Zeek logs in JSON. Uh, if you saw in the Slack channel, uh, someone asked about that, and there's a little short way to be able to create an alias to have Zeek write those as JSON, uh, if that's your thing. Um, Zeek will generate uh, log files for the protocols it sees. Um, there are also some other logs that are related to uh, the behavior of a connection, uh, or rather of a cluster. Um, and then there are some sort of interesting logs. So uh, hopefully this is kind of readable. Uh, this is off of a live system. Um, some of these are logs that you will only get if you load additional scripts. Uh, so for instance, uh, con underscore long is a log that is only generated if you load the con log package. Um, what that script does, or rather that package, is creates a special con log that starts logging uh, after a connection has been running for a certain period of time. So um, that is for the situation where maybe you've got a connection that lasts for hours. Uh, so if the connection doesn't end, if it runs for hours or for days, you won't see an entry in con.log because the entry will only show up in there once the connection is completed and Z can tell you everything it saw for that connection. Con long will by default log after set periods of time and that way you can kind of see that, hey, there's this connection that started and is ongoing, uh, but I haven't seen it in my con log yet. Um, uh, as you note there, there are some of the common protocol logs that you expect to see. Um, con S0 is a log that was generated by a popular little script that's floating around that will separate out single packet connections. Uh, if you're on a large network, uh, those can be pretty giant. Um, and they may be uninteresting. So that's a quick little hack to be able to cut down the volume that may, maybe you're sending to Splunk or Elastic or whatever your seam of choice is. Um, throwing all of those single packet connections into your seam can be expensive and may not be interesting to you, but you may want to know that they actually happened. Um, there's also a set of interesting logs here. Uh, there's an Intel log, which we'll actually dive into a little bit later. Um, there are the known logs, a couple of which we've already talked about. Um, software log that came up when somebody took a peek um, I was mentioned. Uh, and then the notice log, which we'll get into in a short bit. Um, there's also the weird log, which will tell you that things like uh, Zeke saw a connection that appears to violate expected behavior of a protocol. Um, Fatima has actually done a couple of talks at Zeek Weeks, diving into the weird log and finding some of the interesting things that you can get out of that log when you dive in. Um, you'll note there's also a log here called reporter.log. Uh, that's where errors that are non-fatal will show up. Uh, so maybe you've got a script that has a value that's undefined and you're trying to look at that value, uh, that will generate a log in there as well. Um, so again, some of these logs are ones that, uh, that, you, um, that you get from loading other scripts uh, or from loading other packages, uh, but a number of them should be familiar to you uh, from what we've already seen today. So uh, let's go ahead and pop out to the shell real quick. There we are. Is the font large enough for folks to see? Yes. Perfect. Okay. Here. Great. Let's get rid of the logs from the previous run. And we're going to do the old Zeek dash C. I wanted to look at smaller PCAP here. So we'll run this. 
And then we're going to take a look at uh, three of the logs here and point out some interesting fields. Um, so first of all, wanted to show you the header and footer. So for tab separated format, every log will have a header that gives you indicators about what the separator is. In this case, it's the tab separator. Um, that's a redefinable value. So if you wanted to have, uh, you know, if you wanted to have comma separated logs, uh, you could redefine that value and uh, get that. Now. What you'd run into is a collision with the set separator, as you can see here, is also the uh, comma character. Um, it gives you indicators of what the empty field or an unset field, uh, and then particularly useful, it will tell you the path. So we can see that this is the con log, and we can see the timestamp for when the log was opened. Um, we'll pop to the very bottom here. There's also a footer that you can see that's a single line that tells you when the log file is closed. Um, and again, this is useful metadata about the log and uh, when it was written and gives you a little bit of detail about it. So specifically in the con log, um, a couple of fields that are particularly useful, maybe the most useful field in here is that UID field. Um, that's a unique connection UID for this specific connection. Um, and the, you know, the connections, uh, the, the field there is large enough uh, that you're unlikely to find collisions, even if you run for very large, long times on very, very busy networks. Um, that con ID is going to show up in lots of other logs, and we'll look at a couple other ones to see. So this is an excellent way to be able to find all of the log entries that were associated with a particular connection. Um, beyond that, you'll see, you know, the standard five tuple telling you uh, the source and destination port protocol or uh, IP and port. Um, got a little bit of detail about the service value, which we've been talking, uh, there was a question about that showing up as empty. Um, that tells you what protocol Zeke was able to actually identify uh, on the connection. Um, there's a whole bunch of different fields in here, but a couple more that we want to make sure to point out to you is there is a field that is known as the connection state. Uh, so this tells you that Zeke saw a fully established TCP connection uh, and that it was torn down with fin packets in both directions as well. Um, so this is where, uh, I don't know if we have any S zeros in here. Um, looks like we do not. Um, So S0 was the connection state that I talked about a, a, a moment ago where Zeke only saw a single packet. Um, if you poke around in the scripts, you'll be able to find the full list of what all of the connection states mean, uh, which can be useful sometimes for when you might uh, see one that, that rarely occurs. Um, the other really useful field to look at sometimes is the history field. Um, this is the field that we see here. I'll try to highlight one. Um, this is a field that tells you all of the different uh, states of the TCP connection that Zeke observed for this particular connection. Um, so here you can see that Zeke saw uh, the capital S in the lowercase h uh, tells you that Zeke saw a full three-way handshake in either direction. Um, capital letters tell you what states were observed for the, uh, for the originator of the connection and lowercase will tell you what states were observed for the responder. Um, so uh, here we've got, you know, as I noted, SH, um, capital A's and lowercase a's, which means acts were seen in both directions. We've got D's to tell us that data was seen passing in both directions uh, and that there was uh, a fin in both directions. So it was a normally torn down connection. Um, you'll note up above, uh, there are a couple connections that don't have that SH uh, and you'll also note that the service field is undefined. Um, what you can usually infer from that is Zeke picked up these connections probably in the middle of the connection. Um, the fact that you see, you know, fins in both directions kind of gives you a hint that this was probably, you know, there was maybe a little bit of packet loss, or in this case, um, whoever created this packet capture started it with some connections that were already flowing. Um, Zeke also gives you information about uh, missed bytes, um, which can be helpful for when you see a file transfer, let's say over FTP, and you expect that there would be a files.log entry with a hash for the file that was passed. 
Um, if Zeek misses bytes in the connection, it's not going to attempt to write a hash for that file uh, because it would be invalid since there are some missing bytes. Um, so that's a quick place to go and look for that. Um, the last thing I want to point out here is the tunnel parents field. Um, this is where earlier when I was talking about how Zeek can see um, tunnels that are plain text or, or clear uh, tunnels, it will log the connection ID of the parent tunnel. So if this was, for instance, a connection in a, uh, a Teredo connection, you would see an entry for that tunnel uh, in your condot log. And then everywhere that Zeke saw a connection inside encapsulated inside of that tunnel, um, it would annotate the original connection ID in that tunnel parents field. Uh, so there's a question about a ridge bytes versus IP bytes. Um, that's essentially the full a ridge bytes is all all bytes in the packet, uh, and uh, the IP bytes is just the IP portion of the of the packet itself. And yeah, that's a really useful um, having that con dot log uh, uh, docs uh, HTML page available to you is really useful when you're trying to dig through these. Um, as I noted, that breaks down all of the different fields that you could possibly see in the history. Um, Another one that we may uh, that I don't think shows up in this PCAP is for the history field. There's a caret flag that will tell you Zeke saw the connection, but inferred maybe it missed the first packet of the connection. And based on Zeke's behavior, whenever it sees the first the first observed packet, Zeke assumes that is the originator of the connection, and then all packets go in the other direction are the responder. Well, if Zeke for some reason misses the very first packet uh, of a connection, it could get confused about which, which side is the originator and which side is the responder. Zeke can sometimes infer from the actual connection, maybe from being able to attach the HTTP analyzer that, oops, I've got these two mixed up. Uh, and it will actually internally logically flip the originator and responder, and then it'll note that it took that action with a caret field uh, in the history field. Perfect. So uh, any other quick questions? Um, there's, again, there are fields that can be added to the connection log by adding other scripts. They may extend the connection log. Uh, you could write your own scripts to add things, um, you know, Popular things for people to add are support to be able to log the country code for where the IP address is associated with the connection uh, came from. Um, you know, I know people who have written fairly extensive, uh, fairly extensive scripts that will annotate their con logs with local information. Maybe you've got a way to be able to figure out who the user was that was authenticated to the system that was generating the traffic. That might be something that you would want to be able to tag onto your connection record. So the next log that we wanted to look at real quick is the files log. So here we see, uh, again, that common field, uh, common set of headers at the top uh, and the metadata about the log itself. Um, we can see that there are now two sets of UIDs that are in here. Uh, there is a file UID that is unique to the file that was seen in the connection. And then there is also the connection UID that was observed where this file was observed. Um, and in this case, we can see that the SSL analyzer attached to this connection. Uh, and then we can see there are three files that are quickly passed here associated with a single connection. Um, let me try to highlight that. So we can see that that's three unique files that were seen. Um, you can kind of start to guess that that's probably TL, uh, TLS certificates that were passed back and forth uh, that Zeke observed on the wire. Um, one thing to take note of here is Zeke has uh, in the files log, there's a transmitting hosts and a receiving hosts field. Um, the plural there is because it's possible for a file to be sent, say, using parallel FTP. So you've got multiple hosts that are sending and maybe only one receiving. And Zeke wants to be able to, to note that in the log if that's what it observed. A um, couple other things that are interesting here are you can see there are uh, a number of different analyzers that were actually attached. Um, so we're getting an MD5, uh, the SHA-256, and the SHA-1. 
uh, as well as the X509 file analyzers that were all attached. Um, in addition to that, Zeek will give you a mind type. Um, this mind type is derived from a script that Zeek has itself that has magic hints in it. So it doesn't use the traditional magic file that is shipped with, say, a Linux system. Um, but this is rather something that the Zeek pro uh, project has uh, created and maintained. Um, the other thing you'll note here is there is a file name field. Uh, one thing to be mindful of with that file name field is Zeek will try very hard to have high confidence in the file name that was passed. So for instance, if a file is passed over HTTP, Zeek doesn't currently try to derive the file name out of the URL. Uh, one, that can be really tricky. Uh, two, there may not actually be a correlation between the file name and what the URL path was, uh, and that can be misleading. So oftentimes that field will, will generally probably more often be um, be null uh, rather than filled out. Um, and then the last couple things that I wanted to point out here were uh, there are the hashes. Uh, again, by default, Zeek is spitting out uh, MD5, SHA1, and SHA256. Uh, and then there are a couple extracted fields. We don't have the file extraction script loaded here, so those fields are going to end up being null. Uh, again, same deal with the UIDs to remind those are great ways to be able to pivot around. Uh, so if we wanted to, we could copy that and then we could grep for this uh, con UID. And we can see that we've got entries in the con log, the files log that we were looking at. And then finally, there's an entry in the SSL log. So let's go ahead and take a look at that SSL log. The start of this is what you would normally expect to see, your timestamps, your con UIDs, uh, metadata about the IP connection, and then you start to get into some of the useful data about the TLS connection itself. Um, you can see TLS versions that were passed, uh, the ciphers that were passed. Um, you get details about the file UIDs that were observed, so you could pivot back to your files log and find hashes for these uh, certificates that were passed. And then, of course, one of the most useful things is getting all of the details out of the certificate itself. Um, so we can see here that this was a certificate that was issued to a common name of Standard Chartered Bank SSL. Um, again, this is really useful for maybe you've got IOCs that, uh, that a malicious actor is using a particular common name in their certificates. Uh, you could dig through your logs to be able to figure out uh, to see if maybe they've generated some new certs uh, that are using the same common name but might have different hashes. All righty, so uh, any questions about the couple logs here or about logging in general? Okay, we'll uh, pop back out to the old slide deck. Moving along. Perfect. So what else can Zeek do? Uh, Zeek can do alerting. Um, the most common form of alerting that people interact with is alerts that are written to notice.log. Um, there's a variety of different log of notices that can show up in there, uh, often based upon the scripts that you have loaded. Um, Zeek also does have the ability to email certain notices. So maybe you've got uh, you know, an email queue that you have people watching and you want really high priority alerts to be emailed to that queue. Um, you could use the action email to be able to do that. Um, there are a bunch of different types of notices that can be raised. Uh, and this is just a very, very small selection of uh, notices that can be raised. Um, these are all notices that would be generated by scripts that ship with Zeek by default. Uh, there are many packages that might add additional notices. Um, there is an Intel framework that we'll look at uh, a little bit later. Uh, if Zeek sees something that's an Intel IOC of interest, uh, you can have the Intel framework configured to actually raise a notice in addition to writing to a log. Um, Zeek also ships with uh, a good old Heartbleed detection script uh, that is underneath of the uh, policy tree. Uh, it's not loaded by default, but you could load it. Uh, 
I've got a question in Slack. Is there a Z command to get all logs in correlation to a connection ID in the order it has seen them? Not a Z command per se. That would probably be more something you could do from, say, the command line using Unix tools to be able to sort by timestamps potentially. Um, but I think you'd, yeah, you'd probably need to have the right timestamp, which you'd get with JSON. Um, yeah, that'd be the quick, easy way. Uh, and Ashish probably has a brilliant idea on how to get that. So uh, um, as you'll note here, a couple other types of notices that you can generate. Uh, there is an address scan. There's a scanning script that Zeke ships with um, that will try to detect people scanning a single port uh, across uh, your network or scanning a bunch of ports on a particular host. Uh, and that's what the address scan and the port scan is. Um, generally, you want to be a little bit careful if you try to run that scan detection script on a large network. Uh, it can impact performance on Zeek. Um, but if you run it, say, on a command line tool um, or on a smaller network, uh, you, you may be successful. But that's one to just be a little careful with loading um, without doing some testing or some careful observing. Um, there's that SSL certificate expired notice that I had mentioned earlier. Um, you know, you may be in a high compliance environment where you want to make sure that your local users are not using uh, expired certificates. Um, and then finally, there's a couple of interesting uh, notices uh, listed here that come out of the SSH script. Uh, so uh, the SSH script will watch for things like interesting host names. Um, so if it sees, you know, a host name outside of your network that's maybe mail.somewhere.com, uh, which you might infer is a mail server, it would be unusual to see someone SSHing from a mail server into your environment. Um, and maybe that's an indicator that someone has compromised a mail server somewhere and they're using that to uh, then move into your network. Um, now, it also might be that there, that one of your users is at a, uh, you know, at a, at a cafe somewhere that has a weirdly set up network. Uh, and so that is not, again, this comes back to the idea that Zeke tells you that it saw something interesting and then you have to apply your own local context and knowledge to figure out if it's actually truly malicious uh, or if it's just another weird day on the network. Um, there's also a set you can define to watch for uh, logins from particular countries. Um, you know, if you're, uh, if you're monitoring a network where only people from the United States should ever be logging in, uh, you could load other countries that might be of interest to you, country codes, and then Zeek, if it sees a successful SSH connection, will raise a notice to tell you, hey, I saw some successful connection uh, to, you know, into your network from a country you were interested in. Um, and uh, we'll actually talk a little bit about how to be able to define uh, in the Zeek customization section. Um, I'll try to remember to come back to the question that was asked about where to define the country codes. Um, so maybe when we look at the script uh, and talk about customization, I can point out where you find that and how you redefine those. Um, and then last but not least, the SSH script will try to observe password guessing uh, based on number of repeated attempts um, and looking at uh, analyzing the lengths of the connection to try to infer whether a connection was successful or not. Um, one thing to note with that password guessing and with Zeke's uh, SSH, successful SSH connection heuristic is if you're in an environment that has an overly long banner, pre-auth banner on SSH, that can actually trick Zeek into thinking connections were successful because part of what it looks for is certain number of bytes passed. Um, so just something to keep in mind for your local environment. Uh, and then last but not least is uh, Zeek can, can provide you with custom logic. Um, it's obligatory to have an XKCD uh, cartoon anytime you can. Um, this is the custom scripting and custom logic that you can build into Zeek. Um, again, I would emphasize what I noted earlier. You don't necessarily have to learn to write Zeek scripts. You can really extend the power of Zeek. Um, but, uh, but there are lots and lots of scripts that other people have written that you can take advantage of. Uh, and if you've got a little bit of programming knowledge, you can generally speaking, read through a Zeek script and get a sense of what it's doing uh, without knowing how to be able to write your own. And 
And next, uh, Fatima will give you a nice tour through the Zeek file system. Perfect. Um, thanks, Keith. So let's now jump into the file system layout. So why I what why I would like you to know the file system layout is when I first started with Zeek, I wanted to know where can I find the context files? Where are the binary loops are located? Where are the uh, custom scripts are located? Where are the policies located? Where are the base policies located? So all these things that Zeek bundles up and comes with, I wanted to know exactly where they are so that in case if I'm investigating something or in case I'm, in case I'm interested in looking in a, in a particular script, I should know the exact paths. So this is how like my personal brain works that I need to know the, the um, file system layout and the, the hierarchy of like the tree hierarchy of the software to know exactly where can I find the different kind of like log files and script files and binaries and whatnot corresponding to that um, to that tool. So that's why we think that it would be useful to uh, for you guys to know exactly the file system layout and where to file where to find some of the important um, scripts and uh, files and whatnot that comes with Zeek. So we have been talking a lot about, so when we ran Zeek on the command line, remember I was talking to you, talking to you about if you run Zeek with dash R and PCAP and do not give anything, Zeek will run that uh, PCAP against all the policies by default enabled in this base directory. So what does that mean is I will go through this file system and I'll tell you exactly which scripts are loaded when you run that particular kind of command. So uh, this is not an exhaustive tool, I'm only going to, uh, look into some of the directories that are really useful and important as a as a investigator or as a security user of Zeek. So really include and lib, they, they too are the uh, directories that we do not touch much because they all they include slash directory includes the header files, which hardly we touch uh, anyways. And then the lib slash directory includes the libraries uh, that are that Zeek links with when it starts analyzing the packets. So these two are the least useful folders to look at as in a user perspective, not as a developer, but as a user perspective, when you're investigating or analyzing your log files. But other than that, all the other directories, they are kind of like pretty important to know, at least to know about that, okay, these are the things that are useful and that comes with Z when we install Z. So back to the default path. So there are two ways uh, of installation of Zeek. One, you can install Zeek from binary pre-built packages. When you do that, um, when you are using the uh, pre-built uh, repos for Zeek, it installs by default Zeek into op slash Zeek folder. Uh, that's the prefix that they use. But if you are running Zeek and if you are one of those persons who likes to compile your own code and who, li who likes to customize the build, then uh, you can compile Zeek from source and install Zeek from source. When you do that, Zeek gives you an option of defining a prefix or the location where your basic Zeek installation will reside with its, with its file system. So usually when we uh, uh, compile Zeek from source, we usually give the prefix of slash user slash local slash Zeek. That is pretty common prefix to use. And uh, those are the two, and you can you can customize it however you would like to, and whatever the um, Zeek uh, Zeek home uh, environment variable looks like in in your in your network. So these are the two default paths. Most likely, you will find Zeek installations in, and some of the directory like most of the directories that those two install paths have will be uh, will have our uh, bin etc include lib logs share and spool, and we will go through each of them and find out what exactly is is inside uh, inside them. So first, let's talk about bin. That's an important um, directory uh, with the Zeek installation because all the binaries related to Zeek are in that in that directory. So some of the important ones I have, there are a lot in the slash, bin slash directory, but some of the important ones that I would like to highlight that as a user you should use very often are uh, these six, uh, these five binaries that comes with Zeek installation. So Zeek cut is a pretty handy tool that you can use uh, to filter down uh, the log files when you're analyzing them. So you can easily extract the columns based on the column names. And, uh, and then you can uh, do this statistical analysis or whatever you would like to, uh, if, you like, if you like to do command line Kung Fu on some of the flat files that, flat log files that we generate, then Zeek cut is a pretty handy tool you would want to use. Again, it is um, used on the TSV files, which is like tab separated where you give the Zeek columns. For JSON logs, if you have JSON, um, logging like the logs enabled in json format and not the tsp format then we use uh, jquery that is a pretty uh, 
pretty uh, pretty handy tool that comes while you are dealing with the JSON log files. So um, Zcut also converts the Unix um, Unix uh, epoch time so to the human read, human readable time. So when you look into the log files of Z, it is very um, inconvenient to see the Unix timestamp because it's like a pretty like long string of numbers. So if you want to convert that to human readable form, then you can also use Zcut and it comes very handy in doing that. Another one is Zeek wrapper. Usually you should not be using that unless you want to get rid of the deprecation warnings. So if you are using some of the scripts that are right now still backward compatible to grow, but now if they are no longer uh, uh, supported in Zeek, then you will get all sorts of warning or even the error message saying that now you have to, you know, upgrade to Zeek, you know, Zeek version because these bro, old bro scripts and old bro functions are no longer supported. So when we were doing the transition from Go to Zeek, we were still a backward compatible to some of those functions and scripts so that people who are still on bro should not uh, like, um, it does not have a breakage. So that's why there is a Zeek wrapper where you can actually define a variable called Zeek is bro to define, uh, to get rid of all the deprecation warnings that you would find when you are running um, Zeek. The third important one is Zeek control. I touched I touched base on Zeek control a little bit when we were uh, when we were uh, discussing running Zeek, and I said that Zeek control is like um, kind of like you know how like System D has its own service level uh, of um, commands that you can use with System D uh, system control. Similarly, Zeek also has Zeek control that allows you to run uh, some service level commands on Zeek. So if you are running, if you want to run Zeek in a divinized mode, right? Like if you are running it in production and if you do not want to run Zeek dash I on terminal, which is like, you should not run Zeek dash I on terminal, but you are using the um, cluster configuration or even standalone configuration using some of the config files that we will talk about in XC slash, then Zeek control comes very handy to start your cluster, to stop your cluster or to re reload and redeploy uh, the new scripts that you have just loaded in your cluster. So Zeek control is a cluster management tool that comes really handy when you are running Zeek in production and you are running Zeek in a clusterized uh, format or the standalone format. Zeek, again, that is the binary that we have been using a lot uh, in, the, in, in the past um, couple of exercises when we are running Zeek against the uh, PCAPs in offline mode and uh, adding scripts to it. So you, you are used to using Zeek right now because of the exercises that we have done. So that's the actual Zeek binary that you can use. Uh, one important thing I would, would like to note is if you have Zeek running, you do not, if you have Zeek running in production and it's a clusterized environment, right? Like you are running Zeek control cluster management tool to start your Zeek cluster and it's still running, but you still have a script that you want to test against Zeek, then uh, you don't need a initial Zeek installation on some other test system or environment to just test it out. So what you can do is you can still use Zeek binary to test that script without touching your cluster. So cluster will run just fine, but you can still use that Zeek binary to just test out that script on the same system usually, like if you want to. And if you do not want to go through the pain of doing just like Zeek read the script and have Zeek installation on some other system. ZKG is Zeek package manager, and we will be talking more about ZKG in the upcoming um, slides where uh, just like any other package, package management um, tool, Zeek also comes with Zeek package, uh, Zeek package manager that manages all the custom scripts and plugins and packages that are available that you would want to install in your Zeek installation or in your Zeek productionized environment. So these are some important binaries that you will find really useful when you have Zeek installed and running. Etsy, that's one of the important um, uh, directories that you should be aware of when you are running Zeek in production. Because so far we have run Zeek on command line, so that's why we were not touching those scripts. But when you run Zeek in production, you, you most likely will be running it on a network interface, right? So because you are sniffing the traffic. So these are the three important, the first three are the three important uh, config files that you would want to customize before running Zeek in the production. The first one is network.cfg. So remember, we were getting the warning that there are no site local network uh, defined when we were running Zeek-R on the PCAP. You define your... And that was the offline mode when we are when we re, when we were reading PCAP. But when you are running Zeek on the production, where would you define the local net, right? So that's where that's where uh, one of the places where you can define your actual local nets that are local to your organization. So that Zeek Zeek has some 
um, environment sensitive information that, oh, it is aware of your environment that this IP belongs to the internal network and this IP is external. So it helps it in a lot of uh, custom scripts that are like scan detection or brute force detection. So if Zeek knows that this is the IP of your organization, it will look for brute force attack against that IP or against that um, local network of yours. So it helps the uh, scripting, uh, the, it helps the custom scripts a lot to generate those custom detections. So network.cfg is where you uh, define the local net. Node.cfg is the configuration file where you define whether you want to run Zeek as a standalone or whether you want to run Zeek in a cluster mode. And that's where you define different configuration. I will go through them on the, I'll pop out uh, to a command line and I, I will show you all these um, files, but I'm right now just giving you the theory of uh, what they are. So node.config is the cluster um, configuration where you can either configure Zeek in production either to run on standalone mode or to run as a cluster. Zeek control.cfg is basically the configuration file to, con to configure your cluster management tool. So it will have all the settings of um, Zeek control, like uh, your email that if you want to um, send out an email about your Zeek health or, you know, the um, Zeek management tool uh, uh, variables, uh, then you can uh, you can um, have that defined in zcontrol.cfg. Other than that, the log rotation. What is your default log directory? What is your default site uh, site uh, local directory where Zeek should Zeek should look for your local .zeek file? So all these variables are defined in zcontrol.com. That that helps Zeek control to look for specific things when you are running Zeek control in clusterized clusterized mode. And then um, zkg config when you have a zkg installed zkg now by default comes with z so you don't have to explicitly install zkg on top of z so if you have installed z you should already have zkg installed so zkg zeek package manager related configuration can be found in zkg slash config so that config file tells you the zkg configuration so uh we'll go through them uh, after we uh walk out this file system Spool, you usually do not touch the spool directory, but it has all the state uh, state files related to different um, components of your cluster. So if you are running Zeek in production in clusterized mode, you will have different components like logger, you will be running a, a, you, will, you will be running a logger, you will be running a manager, proxy, and worker. So all these state files corresponding to those components can be found in spool slash directory. So you don't touch it usually, but it has one important log file for logger where exactly the um, log files get dumped uh, whenever Zeek rotates them from your current directory. So, uh, and you can change that in Zeek control uh, configuration if you do not want to use these uh, default um, log directories. So uh, current is just a current is the name of the folder. So if you are running Zeek in clusterized mode, it is not going to dump log files on your on your on your uh, terminal. It's going to it's, it's going to save them to that log directory uh, path. So in that log directory path, you will have current folder, which will be a sim link to the logger um, spool slash logger directory. So it's the name of the folder. Current is the name of the folder, which will be a sim link. All right. So one of the most important uh, folder that you should know about is share because that's that's all that's where all the juicy stuff lives. So we have been talking a lot about base scripts that Zeek runs by default, enabling all the base scripts it has. So all the base scripts that Zeek comes with. Is in uh, is residing in um, is uh, resides in share slash Zeek slash base folder. So all the base scripts, and we will go through them. Um, yeah. So if we have a question, so it it will have the it will have as many workers as you are running in that spool directory folder. So each worker will have its own state file. So um, so yeah, that's the question. Uh, good question. And then uh, so the base folder will have all the base scripts that are by default loaded. You don't have to touch anything in that base folder, but if you want to take a look at what base scripts are enabled, then you can absolutely do so by going to the slash base folder and finding all the Zeek scripts there. The policy script is, the policy directory is the directory where all the additional scripts uh, come into the play. So remember we were loading local.zeek when we were running Zeek in offline mode. So all the policy related uh, additional scripts that are either enabled or you can enable comes into the um, comes into the slash policy folder. So you can go and take a look into all different additional uh, policy scripts that Zeek comes with. Some of them are, again, I said, some of them are enabled by default, or I should not use enable. Some of them are loaded by default in local.zeek, while others are disabled. 
So depending on your um, on your resources and appetite of how much traffic Zeek is consuming, you can either enable those additional scripts or disable based, based on what kind of policy scripts you want to run in your production environment. So those policy scripts reside in Zeek slash policy folder. Zeek slash site is the Zeek slash site is the local site folder where your site specific configuration lives. So if you have a custom script that you have written, or if you have a custom uh, package that you have pulled down using a ZKG, uh, and if you have all the like um, local additions to your um, to your Zeek cluster apart from what Zeek already comes with inside policy folder, you dump that usually in Zeek slash site folder. And that's the folder where you will find your local .zeek file. One important, th one important thing to note is whenever you upgrade Zeek from like say 4.1 to 4.2 or 4.1 to 5.0, the local .zeek where you have added your additions will not get overwritten. So it's not like you just kind of like scraped it when you upgraded and you, you lost all your local customization. So that's important thing to note that site slash local dot seek will not be overwritten whenever you will do an upgrade on your seek uh, cluster. Okay, so coming to the log directory. So we have seen binary, we have seen configs, where the config resides, we have seen the scripts directory where the scripts reside, and now where exactly the logs will reside. So when you're running Zeek in uh, production, which is clustered environment, the uh, there is a directory called current which is inside the slash uh, log slash directory. That's the default path when you are running in cluster mode where Zeek dumps all the log files. And that's the path where Zeek control picks up for the log rotation. So the logs will be rotated every hour and then they will be dumped into a folder which is named by the timestamp of that day and hour. And then all the archive logs will reside there. And the policy of how long you want to retain those archive logs depend on what you have configured in Zeek control config file. The current directory, the first bullet point, is the is the directory that we were uh, you like the, where you will see all the logs dumped when you are running Zeek in CLI mode. So when we were running Zeek in CLI mode in our in our previous exercises, what we were seeing is wherever you are running Zeek, it's just going to dump all the log files in that current directory. So that's why like we were mentioning that you should just create a, a new directory called logs and then just CD into that directory and run Zeek in offline mode in command line so that you have dump of all the log files in that logs directory and you can then remove and do so and, and so on and so on and so forth you can do the uh, analysis so that so not to clutter up the your current uh, directory whatever it is in your current directory with the log files that are generated in uh, offline mode when you, when you run Zeek. so this is the um, log files where the log files reside before jumping to the Zeek script i would really really quickly want want to jump into the um, pop out into the shell to show you guys the different folders that we have talked about. So I have installed Zeek on this Docker image using the um, packages. So I have not compiled it from source. So that's why it should reside in op slash Zeek. And this is my installation path. So all the folders that comes with the Zeek installation resides in op slash Zeek on our Docker image that you guys are running. So here, let's take a look into the um, pin directory. So apart from what we have talked about, the important ones, there are all other different kinds of Zeek binaries that are uh, available. Btest is mostly the tool that you use when you are um, uh, when you have written a plugin or when you have written a script and if you want to convert it into the ZKG package and you want to make sure that it runs fine and what is the difference between before running that plugin or script and after running that, plug that plugin or script to the log files, you run Btest to verify everything is like good. And then that is one of the requirements for you to run before you submit your package or your script to be considered for the ZKG package manager. So that's why we that's why every Zeek installation comes with Btest because just in case if you want to submit a package, uh, that's one of the one of the uses of Btest that I have used Btest for. Um, other than that, Zeek ones are important. So this this is our Zeek binary that we we have been using when running Zeek in command line. Zeek archiver is the um, binary that you can use to archive the logs. And you can see, you can run them and you can see their help uh, to see all the options available as well. So these are the options with Zeek Archiver. I haven't used it personally because uh, usually when you run Zeek in production, you do not use the Zeek Archiver binary because the archiving of logs is uh, done using Zeek Control. Uh, Zeek Config shows you the different configuration um, variables that were used when you were building Zeek or you have Zeek installed. So um, 
these are the different uh, options available. Maybe we should just check out Zeek Path. So my Zeek Path is, um, so Zeek Path is the path by default Zeek looks for to find all the strips that you want to load in your, uh, whenever you would want to run Zeek. So it is looking for in opt slash Zeek slash share set. This is one folder it is looking for, for all the Zeek scripts. This is another folder, and then this is the third folder. So these are the three important folders it looks for to find the scripts related to Zeek um, whenever you run it, run it either in command line or in cluster mode. So um, other than that, Zeek cut, we have um, seen it. Zeek control is the um, config cluster configuration management tool. So see, it has like, if you have, if you're, if you're not running Zeek in, in cluster, but if you see, uh, if I run Zeek control status, it will say me that I'm not running Zeek right now. So right now, standalone mode is stopped because this is the mode that is by default enabled in node.com that I will show you. So that's why it's saying we stop because I'm not running Zeek in cluster mode right now. So these are these are the different commands uh, available with Zeek control that you can use. And then what else? Um, ZKG. ZKG is the Zeek package manager that is used for installing and then um, purging, removing, and all the things that you can think of to do with the Zeek package on your, on your system. We will be playing around with ZKG a little more in our next um, section where I'm where I exclusively talk about ZKG. So let's clear the clear it real quick. So that was binary. Let's talk about um, Etsy. So these are the four important. Um, these are the three files and the folder that I talked about. So in networks, you can see if I can quickly walk you through networks. You can see you can define your local site networks here, and then Zeek will pick it up from here, this file. Node.conf is where you define the um, uh, Zeek control and uh, cluster configuration. Right now, this is standalone is enabled. That's why when I was doing Zeek control status, it was saying standalone is stopped because other, other things are commented out. So this is the standalone mode where you can run Zeek on an interface and then do a Zeek control start and it will start sniffing the interface and start dumping the logs into the um, op slash um, Zeek slash logs folder. And but if you want to run it in production in a cluster environment, then you have you have options of enabling it um, in like a cluster mode where you can run logger, manager, proxy workers, how, however many workers you want to, uh, want to run. It has more options, like it has more customized options when you are running it as worker. And if you want to use multi-threading, you can use, depending on if you have the plugin installed, like for AF packet, you need to install an AF packet plugin. And then you can add here how many number of ports you want to use for that worker, so on and so forth. All the documentation regarding that should be available on Zeek.org's documentation site that how to run Zeek in a cluster mode. And you will have more detailed information about how you can configure the um, different components of the cluster in that, in that documentation. So that was node.conf, which is really important log file. And now this is the control.conf. I was talking about that you can have like recipient mail address to send out emails to, um, although we don't use that much. Logging options. So the log and rotation interval, you can uh, set, by default, it's one hour, but you can set to however long you want to. And then um, log status expiration interval. And then other options includes, uh, you can customize the policy script. If you do not want to call it local.z, you can call it something else. And then this is the path it looks for. Whatever prefix you have uh, defined, if it's if you build it from source, it should be the prefix that you use when building with source. If you have installed it via packages, it should be opt slash opt slash zeek. So that's the zeek path. And then um, the log directory, that's the default log directory, that's pool directory where the current logs file are, current log files are written is op slash z slash pool slash current. And then there's this broker store. And then this is the config directory. So these are the default enabled, like you don't change them unless you really want to, and you really want to be very specific with the, uh, where the config file should reside and where the log files should reside. But these are the pretty standard, um, configuration that comes already enabled with Zeek in Zeek control. And then I can show you real quick the ZKG config. It's a pretty small and straightforward file where it says that where Z ZKG should look for the libraries, where ZKG should look for the scripts, the script directory, or where ZKG should put the scripts when it is uh, installing the scripts and plugins, and then where ZKG should put the plugins when it's installing the plugins. 
So that was etc directory. Um, include is like, it has all the header files if you want to go over it. I mean, we usually don't touch it. So include a library, we don't touch it. Logs is the directory where logs will be residing. If you are using, um, uh, if you are using Z in a, in a, uh, in, uh, in a sniffing mode, in an interface sniffing mode. Uh, spool does not have much right now because we are not running it in the cluster mode. So it doesn't have much, many state files. And then var is just like it has library and then and it has zkg uh, related logs log files all right so that was i think i covered the important yeah oh share share was the important one that was remaining so share is where all the juicy stuff lives in terms of scripts so it has policy folder, base folder, and site folder. So if you go into the base folder, you see the frameworks and then the uh, mistakes and the protocols. So if you look into the protocols, it has all these different protocol uh, protocol folders that should have their base uh, scripts. So if I look into say DHCP, it has the main.zeek, it has the load, and the, so basically all the base scripts that we were talking about that zeek loads by default, resides in the slash base directory. So you can go through the scripts if you want to and see how they are written. So if you want to like get customized to writing Zeek scripts, that's a really useful way to learn how Zeek scripting, Zeek scripting works because they are very well written Zeek scripts with all the um, uh, useful information in the comment section. So that's base. And then policy has um, additional scripts that are available for you to um, load. So it has scan detection script, it has unknown protocol script, it has weird stats. Dump events was one of the policy, policy scripts that we ran to dump all the events um, Zeek encounters when analyzing a packet trace and then detect trace routes. So these are like additional scripts that Zeek comes with that you can enable and that you want to enable, can, that you want to enable you can in the site uh, directory. So that's policy. And then the site is uh, our local site where you customize your uh, scripts, packages, and the uh, policy scripts that you want to load. And I think I have shown you the local.zeek before. So this is the um, your site local script, your site local file where you add or where you load the scripts you want to in Zeek. So you see, these are some of the additional scripts that were loaded when we were running a Zeek in command line and giving local at the end. So these were the additional scripts that were getting loaded. So GOIP data was there, um, detect MHR hash all files. So you were getting all the hashes um, in the files.log and then um, detect SQLite, SQL injection in the attack. Software.log was getting generated. Capture loss was getting generated. Software.log was generated just because of these uh, scripts. So these are all the pretty cool scripts that you can have by default loaded in your Zeek environment. So that ends the file system layout tour. And then um, this is a simple basic example where you can uh, you know, look into the um, Zeek slash share folder to see all the cool Zeek scripts that comes with Zeek. So I think I have shown I have shown you share slash Zeek, but you can do a find you can run this command and find all the scripts that are um, currently available with Zeek. So it will even tell you which folder it is in inside the share slash C. Almost 540 scripts that comes with C inside base policy and site folders. 
So that was pretty much it um, for uh, the Zeek file system layout. And then we have a break. So um, you guys can explore, you guys can explore the, uh, the, the find command with Zeek and you guys can take a little tour of Zeek file system layout. And if you guys have any questions, let us know and we would be able to uh, answer them. And then we have a break. So let's take a 10 minute break and then come back after 10 minutes. Meanwhile, I will looking at the, um, I was watching this Slack channel and chat channel to see if we have any questions and I will try to answer them.
All righty. Let's get back to this. So uh, we're going to start out here. Uh, so this section will be looking at how you can customize the behavior of Zeke. And we are going to start by taking a quick look at the script uh, to give you a sense of where to look for values that you want to change. So uh, there's that muscle memory. So we will look at, so as Fatima is noting uh, in a Zeek directory, um, there will be often in a script directory, there will be, um, there may be a number of different scripts, but uh, main.zeek is often where you will want to start to poke around for values or variables that you can change. Um, so in a Zeek script, uh, Generally speaking, you will have uh, you may have a set of load statements at the top that make sure that uh, certain other scripts that may this script may depend on are loaded. Um, and then there will be a module name, which is useful to keep in mind, uh, because later you'll need to use that module name when you're referring to a variable uh, to make sure that you're working within the right scope. Um, and then beyond that, probably the most important section for looking for values that you can change. Uh, will be looking for this export section at the top. Um, so we can see there's an enum defined here that is a log. Um, there's a uh, global uh, log policy. This is part of the logging framework where you can hook in and change the output of logs, um, make filtering on the logs. Um, we unfortunately won't have time to cover that, but there is some documentation about the logging framework and other frameworks. Um, but uh, what we'll want to pay attention for is there are, uh, you'll see entries in this particular script, it's been converted to use the configuration framework, which we'll talk about in a short bit. Um, but this allows you, as it says, to change a setting so that if passwords are using basic auth, uh, whether the password that is observed will be logged or not. Um, so we've got an option value that's defined and then the name of the option and the default value is set to false. So by default, Zeek will not log the password of uh, basic auth requests that are observed on the network. Um, the rest of this is uh, useful to look through. Um, oh, there we go. You can see this is the record that defines the fields in the HTTP log. So sometimes if you're not sure what a value, you know, what a log entry is actually telling you, uh, you can go hunting for the script that generates that log. And uh, in pretty much all cases, you'll find at least some useful definition or comment that tells you, you know, what the value, you know, what they're expecting to see there. And you can see some of these are decorated with a log uh, argument. Uh, some of them are decorated with an additional optional to tell you that this doesn't always have to be present, for instance, method or host may not always be visible or available um, in a connection. Uh, and then some, again, state record, you know, a, uh, some values to set uh, the uh, use records uh, to keep track of state. Uh, and then we've got another set of some options here that define things like um, HTTP headers that typically indicate proxy requests. Um, maybe you've got some weird custom proxy tool that you're seeing in your environment. Um, that has a different header field to indicate a proxy connection, you could, in theory, append to this set, uh, and then it would recognize that there's a proxy connection uh, and log that. Um, and then again, HTTP methods, uh, there are, you know, probably all of us have experience with weird custom software that uses strange HTTP methods. And again, this is an option that you could uh, modify. Uh, and then you'll note that uh, there's a closing brace here that closes out the export section. That's pretty much the section that is most important for uh, for a user who's not, you know, who just wants to understand what they can, you know, what knobs they can tweak and turn. Um, 
We will quickly take a look down through here to point out a couple of other things that we've mentioned today. Um, one thing I want to note is this ports field. Uh, so this is kind of the ports hint field that tells Zeek when it sees a connection, if it sees it on 631 TCP, it should try to use the uh, use the HTTP analyzer because HTTP is commonly seen over this port. Um, the next thing you'll note here is the Zeek init event. Uh, so when we mentioned earlier, this is the very first event that fires when you start Zeek, uh, as you may have observed when we ran the dump events. Um, what we're doing here is creating an actual log stream. So this is where we want to log uh, the HTTP log. Uh, and then you'll note that there's a path value here that tells you that it's HTTP. Um, if you wanted to, you could, through the logging framework, redefine that path to be something else like web traffic or foo or whatever works for you. Um, so uh, beyond that, you've got a bunch of functions that do things like, uh, you know, setting HTTP state, uh, creating new sessions, and then there are a series of events that are handled uh, within here, uh, the HTTP request and reply header events. Um, if you're trying to learn the language one way, one approach is to just read through some of the scripts that ship with Zeek to get a sense of what the conventions are. Um, and again, if you're trying to do something with a header, sometimes you know it might be useful to look at a script that's doing something similar uh, to get a sense of how to approach a problem. Um, so uh, again, the main things to take away from this are paying attention to what the module name is for the script where you want to make a change. Uh, and then looking through that export section to look for option fields uh, that you can redefine. So there was a question earlier. Um, we don't actually have, oh, let me get to the right Slack channel. Uh, so the question is with the uh, uh, known ports value, if there's HTTP traffic picked up by DPD, not on those port values, does it create an entry in weird.log? It does not, but it will log it in http.log. And if the server were on your local, if the server was inside of your local nets, you would also see an entry in known services. So again, that's a good place to, you know, troll through known services, um, use a little bit of grep foo and filter out the common ports, and you might be able to start seeing uh, other HTTP servers that are listening on non-standard ports. Hope that's helpful. Uh, so there was a question we won't actually be able to demonstrate, but there was a question about uh, defining the watched countries value for the SSH script. Um, unfortunately, in the Docker, uh, in this Docker container, we don't have the GOIP libraries installed, so uh, this wouldn't actually work. But I thought I'd show you how I go about finding you know, I see a notice uh, or I see something mentioned and think, hmm, that's an interesting knob I might want to tweak. Um, what I would start out by doing is searching for, you know, part of the notice that we want to look for. Uh, it helps if you pass the all important dash capital R, which will tell grep to search recursively through the current file system. And now we see that there is uh, two hits in a file that's policy protocols SSH geodata.zeek. Um, if you'll remember from the last section that Fatima just covered, uh, policy scripts are not loaded by default. So we would need to actually load the script and then make a modification. Um, but uh, I had already looked at this, so we'll pop into here and we can see that here's that notice that we uh, mentioned earlier. Uh, and then we can see that there's a set uh, that is watched countries, uh, and then you can put country codes in there. And uh, by default, it looks for, it will alert on connections from Romania. Um, this is because Seth Hall, I think, was the one that contributed or wrote a good chunk of this. And uh, when he did that quite long ago, um, there was a lot of activity that he was interested in out of Romania. Uh, so. Don't be alarmed if you see Romania pop up in there. That's just an artifact of the old script. And I see that I have gotten, there we go. Camera got a little wonky and got a little blurry. 
So again, grep-r is really helpful for, I know this is a value that I'm looking for to change, but I just don't know what script it's in. Um, the other thing to do is to start thinking in terms of, you know, is, it a, is this something that's related to SSL protocol? If so, start looking in either base protocols SSL or policy protocols SSL uh, to track down what you're looking for. So let's pop out of here and hop back over to the slides. So we took a look at the script. Uh, so customizing Zeek, um, as has been noted, uh, local.zeek is the place to do that. Um, these can be done, uh, the local customizations can be done either inline in that local.script or you could write a separate script that contains the customizations that you want and then load that in through local.seq. Um, and through here, you can enable or disable scripts. Uh, maybe there's one that's creating some issues for you and you want to disable it, that's possible, uh, though I think that's a pretty rare thing for folks to do. Um, or you can enable scripts, which is probably one of the most common things to do, uh, and then change variables. So let's look at a couple examples of how to be able to do that. Um, We'll pop forward one here. Uh, the other, uh, we don't have VI on here either. So nano is what you would want to do. Um, you would use nano to either edit the, the copy in site uh, under the site directory, or uh, you could copy local.zeek into your local directory where you're working and then edit that version. And we can see that an example of loading a script, in this case, we're loading the, H, the header names uh, script. Uh, that's part of the HTTP protocol. We see that it's under the policy directory. So that tells us that it's not loaded by default. Um, the argument is just passing an ampersand and then load. And that tells Zeek that you want to load a script. You don't have to give the full path. You can just use policy. Um, and in fact, you don't actually have to tack policy or base on there. Zeek will be smart enough to look in both places. Um, you may be wondering where Zeek looks for uh, the search path. Um, so you could look either at the output of the help command, uh, which will show you the Zeek path and the file order for the currently configured uh, or compiled version that we're working with will by default look in the current directory. Uh, and then it looks under uh, share Zeek uh, policy and site. So again, we're looking here at uh, the example from the main, uh, the HTTP main script, and we've got that capture default password uh, or default capture password value. Um, if we want to change that, we would just add an entry to local.zeek um, that does a redefinition using the redef argument. Uh, then we need to pass the module name to make sure we're operating in the right scope. Uh, and then the name of the option that we want to change uh, and in this case, we're changing it from false to true. Um, the other examples here are changing a, a value. So uh, if the SSH password guest field is too low or too high for you, you could redefine that, um, adding an entry into your local.zeek, um, changing it to 15. Um, another example here is Zeek has, the SSH script has an option in there, a set, uh, which is denoted by these uh, curly braces to be able to say, I want to ignore password guessers. Um, maybe you've got you know, some pair of hosts on your network that are super chatty and they regularly cause a password guessing error uh, or notice that you've determined is a false positive. Um, you could add an entry to the set um, by using the plus equals and then the curly brace open and you're saying, we want to ignore any alerts that involve uh, 192.168.1.2 uh, as the source and 1.20 as the responder. So again, if you've got a little bit of programming knowledge or experience, a lot of this is probably kind of, some of the concepts are um, a bit familiar to you. Um, one thing I wanted to touch on very briefly here is the config framework. Uh, so. Zeek now has a config framework that allows you to change values on the fly. Uh, so for example, in when we looked at the HTTP script, we saw that option tag. Um, in this fake example here, we've got a module called test. We've got an option that's called enable feature and it's defined as false um, by default. Um, we can use the trusty old redef argument 
uh, in our local .zeek and just say test module enable feature. We want to turn this feature on, and then magic will undoubtedly happen. Um, the other option that's available to you is to have an actual config file that you can define. Um, so, oops, sorry. Script the uh, the uh, slide here is a little sloppy. Uh, ignore the one nine two one six eight little copy pasta mistake. Um, we're redefining the config file location here to say we want to have uh, want Zeek to look for config options in a path that is at path to config dot um, Maybe you put that under site dot your site directory or maybe somewhere else where you'd have it under some sort of uh, configuration management control. Um, but basically, this is a file where you can have single lines to tell Zeek what features you want to make changes to. Uh, and so in this case, we are the format of the file is just the option name. Uh, so again, remember that module name and then the option you want to change separated by a tab or a space and then the new value that you want to change. Uh, and you could have a file with dozens or hundreds of configs, uh, config options that you want to tweak. And Zeek will watch this file for changes. And if it sees a change, um, to the file, it will then change that option on the workers for you. Uh, so again, this is a way to change the behavior of Zeek as it's running. Um, this is most interesting when you're running in a clustered environment. Uh, it's not really something that people would probably generally use when they're running on the command line, um, but I wanted to make sure that you were aware of, uh, of the config, uh, config framework. So, um, if we want to take uh, this one might be just a five minute exercise it should be pretty quick but if you want to pop out to your uh, you know to your docker instance uh, and go ahead and play around with this you can um, like it, as it notes there you want to copy the local.zeek into your local directory uh, and then add those couple names uh, those values that are there uh, and then run that against the HTTP auth pcap that is under the training resource directory. Uh, and then take a gander at the HTTP script, uh, the HTTP log output. Um, and if you want, what you might want to do is just run that uh, PCAP without changing local.zeek, take a look at the HTTP.log, maybe even make a backup copy of it, and then change your local.zeek and be able to compare the two files. So um, we'll give folks about five minutes here. Uh, I just want to make sure we've got time to get through the rest of the material. Uh, and we've taken a couple breaks and whatnot. So five minutes and then uh, we will answer any questions that you might run into in the training Slack channel. Oops. And Fatima helpfully copy pasted those into the Slack channel uh, for people who wanna do the old copy pasta trick.
All righty, let's go ahead and quickly pop out to our shell and run through this. Uh, I think this one's a pretty simple example. Uh, didn't see any real comments or questions. So get to where I can see this. So as we noted, uh, we can dash C dash R. Got the HTTP auth. Uh, and if we look at our HTTP log, got two entries in there. This should make it pretty easy. Now we will copy over. Helps tell it where. So generally speaking, when you're adding these entries, um, didn't mention this earlier, but uh, most of the time you can generally place them in anywhere if it's say a base script that you know is loaded. Um, but if it's a say a policy script that you're loading in addition, then you'll want to make sure that you load that script first and then change the values that you uh, want to add. So uh, as we know here, um, we're wanting to do that. So we do the load. Uh, wow. So there we've said that we want uh, the header names added uh, and then we're doing a redef of Those are the two that we wanted to change. And so now we save out. Don't necessarily have to remove all of the logs here because since we're running against the same PCAP, um, we should get the same values. Uh, and so if we now do this, and we need to specify local since we're running on the command line. We want to make sure that local.c gets defined and run. Oh, man. I'm going to blame it on being, uh, being later in the day, we'll say. All right, so we want to call the Zeke binary. We need to make sure we've got that checksum uh, turned off. And then we're reading Zeke training HTTP auth. And again, you get the complaint about local nets. Uh, and now we can see that we've got a bunch of uh, header field values that have been defined in here. Uh, so let's use handy old less dash s. So there's client header names and server header names that are now defined in here. Uh, there were apparently no server header names observed, uh, but there's a long list of client header names. Um, and then you'll also note that uh, in our original script here, our original log, we've got the eth-students and then the password field is empty. Uh, if we now look at this, we can see that we now actually have the password as networks, uh, not the most secure choice in the world. Uh, but maybe it's a low quality or low value resource that they're connecting to. Um, always be mindful of uh, user privacy and uh, be careful about storing passwords. Uh, but you can see there a pretty simple example of how to be able to tweak local.zeek uh, and change the behavior of Zeek. Um, best way again to learn about things like this is poking through the scripts themselves and looking at what those options are uh, and again, reading the comments are, are usually pretty helpful to point you in the right direction. And I think with that, uh, Fatima is going to take over and talk about uh, package manager. First, I will answer, no, there is no ability for decrypting SSL traffic in Zeek. Uh, 
uh, that would be out of scope. That would be something you would want to handle, say, on a load balancer. Uh, but uh, currently, I don't think there's much intention to add that feature in there. Um, but again, you know, you could you could do that with a load balancer of some sort uh, or other tools. Perfect. All right. Let me stop sharing here. Oh, I, uh, I think you stop, Keith. I'm sharing the screen. Perfect. All right, so I will really quickly talk about ZKG stuff. So Zeek Package Manager, as like any other um, package managers uh, you, will, you would find on a different Linux distributions, Zeek also came about with the concept of if there is a community that is, um, you know, building all these custom scripts and then uh, what would be the efficient way to share it with other people in the community? So when I started with Zeek, when it was Pro, there was no ZKG at that time. So what I used to do was if I am looking for a scan script or an efficient brute force detector. So what I would do is instead of reinventing the wheel, I would first go on um, Google and type if somebody has already written that script. And most likely somebody would have already because this is a very common use case. So previously the process was like you go up go out, do a research, see if somebody has written that script, if that person has written that script, how that person has shared it, whether it's on GitHub or whether you contact that person directly, whatnot, and then get a local copy of that script and then um, customize it based on your environment and then uh, copy it over to your Zeek installation, load it, and then run your cluster. So that was a pretty long process of getting a custom script that other person in the community has written that can be valuable to other people in the community, right? Not to reinvent the wheel. So Zeek uh, developers then came up with the concept that why don't we use a package manager where people who are a part of community who have written really useful and uh, valuable scripts and plugins that can be useful for other people in community, why not we why not we have a common repository where we share all of that stuff and then that make that available as a, a repository of the um, packages for people who have Zeek installed on their system. So it should be just like then one click that ZKG install that package name and it should automatically install and save the person the trouble of pulling down a copy and make it customizable customizable uh, to your environment and then loading it manually to your uh, to your installation. So that saved a lot of effort. So that was kind of like the background of why ZKG came about and what was it what it used for. And now it's very valuable because now it's just like one command away. If there are uh, vetted uh, plugins and scripts that community people have already um, shared with the, uh, with the Zeek package manager, um, uh, a web page where they where you can install those packages and that's the uh, that's the link of the packages.z.org so if you want to go to the packages.z.org you will see that there are like more than 100 packages available on that uh, on that um, package repo that are easily installable using zkg so uh, there is a whole process that if you are a developer and if you want to uh, publish your script or a plugin as a zkg ZKG package, then you need to follow some of this, uh, some of those steps. We will not go through those steps, but this it is available in the Zeek documentation. So if you want to contribute a Zeek package, uh, then feel free to do so using all these uh, all that steps. Uh, and you, it's easily uh, you can easily find them on Zeek documentation. So we will be using ZKG to install some of the important uh, or cool packages that you would like you know to have played around with. And before doing that, uh, there are like uh, what what all things you can do with ZKG? We will just go uh, through that list real quickly so that you know the basic commands that are available with ZKG, so that uh, you can play around with ZKG easily. So uh, analyzer examples, there are uh, really great analyzer examples that are available out there that are now available to install using ZKG, which is like quick and works sonar. So if you are seeing a whole bunch of UDP traffic on 443 and you don't know what's going on, then there's a quick analyzer available. So most likely that traffic is quick traffic. So if your Zeek is not able to detect the traffic or parse that traffic correctly, then you might need you might want to give a try uh, to install Zeek uh, Quick uh, Analyzer using ZKG uh, Manager. And the same with Perksonar. Uh, there are some scripts. These are DSCP. There are a lot. Like there are more than hundred uh, packages which are like plugins, analyzers, plus scripts that are available with ZKG. So you can again go to that website and then you will see the whole bunch of like top watch packages. You can search for a package here and whatnot. All right, out of scope. So let's use Zeek. I will go through really quickly some of the very basic uh, ZKG. I mean, there are not a whole lot of like 
hundred different commands already available with Zeek. But these are some of the important commands that you might find useful when you are dealing with ZKG on, in your environment. So uh, ZKG refresh. So anytime somebody uh, adds a new package to be considered uh, towards ZKG, and then if it, if it gets approved and if it gets added to the package repo of ZKG, then you, you kind of like do a Zeek, a Zeek refresh on your um, installation, and then it will refresh and it will pull down the latest um, refreshed list of uh, packages available out there. Zeek, a ZKG list all, of course, will um, list down all the packages right now available in the Zeek, ZKG repo. Pretty simple command ZKG, just like you do yum install and other um, package uh, manager tools installation command, S similar, to with, similar with ZKG, you, you just do ZKG install and the package name and then uh, it will install that package. Now, where do you get this package name? So before, like, you don't have to guess, you just do a ZKG list all and you will see all the packages that are available out there. And if there is a package that you are interested in to install, then just take that name and then give that name uh, in the install command and ZKG will be happily uh, installing that on your, uh, on, your, on your environment. Check if it, get, it got installed, there's a, um, Another command called ZKG list install. So list all will list all the packages available out there. List installed will list only the packages that you have pulled down and installed on your system. By default, when ZKG installs a package, it loads it or it's auto it auto loads it in your local dot um, local dot Zeek, uh, Zeek file in the site. So unless you want to unload, we will find, uh, we, will, we will go through the load and unload command separately. But when you do Zeek install, it is by default loading that package. So uh, make sure that you know that install loads, auto loads the package and it's not like it's just install it and now you have to load it manually. Uh, it, uh, so all the installed packages again resides in the slash site directory that we have gone through in our um, file system layout. And then one, just one important thing you need to uh, remember is add the add the rate load packages line in your site slash local.z so that anytime any package that is maintained and managed by ZKG is available uh, in the local.z and then you can either load and unload and do whatever commands you or whatever actions you want to on that package. So we will be adding that line uh, when we are doing exercises in the ZKG realm. Load and unload. So as I mentioned, that by default, when you by default when you do ZKG install package name, it will install. It will pull down the package. It will install it on your system, and it will by default load it in your uh, ZKG installation. So whenever you would do a ZK restart again, it will be loaded. So if you not, if you just want to install the package but just do not want to load it, then you have to explicitly tell ZKG not to load that package by using command unload. And similarly, if you have unloaded the package, but now you are like, hey, I want to load it again, you can look, you can load that package, or you can load that package again using ZKG load and the package name. ZKG info will tell you what uh whether what is the um metadata version and who is the author and whatever information the Zeek uh the developer of the package has provided in the metadata fields of that package. So Zeek info will just tell you that and it will have some more um options whether where it will show you whether it's loaded whether it's installed or whether it's unloaded on your system remove and install all the packages so zkg purge will remove all the packages installed on your system there is an explicit command remove so if you do not want to purge all the packages but you just want to remove one package from your system then you can just remove you can just use zkg remove and the package name and it will that package will get removed from your system and then after doing a purge, if you list ZKG list, if you do ZKG list install, it will not show anything because everything will be purged. There are specific commands to pin, unpin, upgrade, and refresh some packages. So if you are doing a, um, a refresh of ZKG, if you are doing an upgrade of Zeek, but you do not want to upgrade that package that is available with Zeek, then you can pin and unpin, unpin those package. That means that Zeek will either exclude them or include them while doing the upgrade. And then um, ZKG, we have seen the ZKG refresh in the previous slide that will just refresh the list of all the available packages out there in the um, on the packages.seek.org um, website. So now I'll just quickly go through all these commands so that you have like a little bit of experience running these commands. And then I will, I will add the this line inside .local and then you will be all set to use, uh, to do the Zeek exercise of installing two packages and see what's going on. So let's do that real quick. So this is the slide. 
I will share that screen and then if you do ZKG list all, it will show all the packages that are available out there. I mean, these are the packages. Some of those spicy packages and whatnot. And then um, EKG. So to install a packet, you just need to give the name of the packet. It will ask you, are you sure you want to install the package? Say yes. And then it is going to run the unit test. These are the B tests it's running on that package, making sure it's ready to go. So see, it says install and it says loaded. So that package is all loaded. So when you do CKG info on that package, it will give you all the information available about that package. That what's the version, what is the GitHub URL where the package is available, install status. So it's current hash, the current hash of the package is this, version is loaded, yes, it's pin false. So when you do a ZKG pin unpin and the package name or ZKG load unload the package name, and then when you do CKG info again on the package, these variables will change according to what you have selected. The metadata file and then the description. So just let's uh, let's add the um, low add the rate load packages inside dot local and then let's try the try the exercises. Now the packages are loaded, and now you should all be set to use the um, to do the exercise. So in this exercise, you will be installing JJA3, which is the um, TLS fingerprinting TLS fingerprinting package that fingerprints the TLS connections from client to server, and then creates a hash and logs it in the SSL.log. So if you don't have the package installed, you will not see the J3 hash. But if you have it installed and then rerun Zik on Zik on a SSL.pcap, then you should be able to see that log file in here. So that's the exercise. And that's, we have another exercise, but depending on the time, we, we might skip that. But the, in another exercise, we are just going to do a ZKG install on file extraction. That's the package that installs, that's the package that extracts the files on in a connection. And um, Keith was mentioning that there are different file uh, um, extensions that you would want to not extract. Those can be defined in uh, the um, in the slash uh, uh, config.zeek in the file extraction. So the file extraction package comes with config.zeek that has all those extensions, whether you want to enable or disable them. And then it's just like you need to, uh, since you have edited the config, you need to add the, you need to load the plugin for the extract all files of zeek. And then you just run the command, and then there should be another new folder that gets generated called that's what created called extract files and it should have all the files extracted from that pgap so let's give the exercise a chance and then we will resume in like next this is pretty simple so it should just take five minutes so i'll just resume it in five minutes and i'll copy these commands over to the slack as well
all right, that, that exercise should not take that long. So I'm just going to, um, unless you guys are, I'm not seeing any um, chat messages where people are finding any issues with the exercises. Uh, yeah, so there's a question about JARM. I am sure that there's a package available for JARM as well, but as long as there's a Zeek package available for JARM or if somebody has written it up in Zeek, then Zeek should be totally able to do the JARM fingerprinting as well. You just have to load that package, just like JAP. So I will quickly go over the exercise um, and see if you guys have the same result. Okay, so I'm just going to go and install J3. Okay, it should be loaded, so let's see. So. Okay. It is just complaining about some legacy extension in the CVE package. So I should just unload it and then rerun it and it should not have any problem. The other third warning here is about the no site local addresses. Again, we are using local at the end. So it is expecting us to um, define the site local addresses. So those warnings, those two warnings, I should be the only one who, who would be getting those warnings because I have that CV package installed. You guys should not be able to see those. You guys should not be seeing those warnings, but you guys might run across this warning that again, we have gone through that before. So let's see if we have anything in the SSL.block file. Okay, so we have, I think, new columns. So now we have two additional columns called JA3 and JA3S. And this is how plugin works. It adds two new um, columns to the SSL.log log screen, and then it logs the uh, PLS fingerprintings in that, in that columns. So um, it should be second, last, and last. Okay, so these are the two columns of the JA3 fingerprinting and JA3S fingerprinting. So S I think stands for server, then J3 is for client. So the client TLS fingerprinting is this, and then the server fingerprint is this. So that was a pretty straightforward. So see, it's, it was just like one click away and you have the J3 installed and ready to go. So that is very beneficial if you have ZKG um, installed and ZKG by default comes installed, but if you want to use ZKG to install different packages. I'm going to skip that exercise because we are almost uh, running um, against time here and we have other two sections to cover. But if you guys want to hang around, we have a lunch break from 12 to 1 PST. And if you guys want to hang around during that uh, period of time, I will be running this exercise just to just out of kicks. So if you want, if you guys are like hanging around that time, I can go through this exercise and then you guys can also follow and ask questions. With that, I'm going to hand it over to Keith now. All righty. What we're going to do here is a real quick section. I'll go through this kind of quickly. Uh, whoop, go through a quick section here to just give a few tips on not having your camera go blurry. That's better. All righty. So try that again. So we're going to do a quick run through of just some tips on being able to do log processing from the command line. Um, a couple of these are Unix commands, maybe uh, hopefully not too boring for all of the audience. A um, couple things to note when you're uh, some general approaches. Um, we'll be working on building up some command pipelines uh, to be able to look at uh, text logs. Um, it's generally good to try to scope your searches as much as possible. So focus on a single log at a time if you can, makes it uh, much less confusing for you. Um, it's also a way to be able to respect your user's privacy, uh, depending upon 
you know, what the source of your packets are, um, that may be something you want to keep in mind. Um, it's always good to baseline your the network you're operating on if it's at all possible for you uh, to help you understand what's normal so that abnormalities stand out a little bit more. Um, using an iterative process, uh, sticking one command at a time on and then trying to run against a short snippet of your logs will help you, especially if you're dealing with larger log volumes. Uh, and then the last thing is that reminder that the uh, con UID and the file UIDs are extremely useful for pivoting around uh, and finding logs. Um, if you were all paying, uh, watching through the Slack channel, there was earlier a question about how to be able to see all of the entries for a particular con ID uh, in the order that it, they appear in the log. And there was a handy little sort command. Um, so um, the first tool that we want to introduce is one that ships with Zeek itself. And this is the Zeek cut script. Um, what this does is allows you to extract only specific columns from the ASCII Zeek logs. Uh, Zeek cut doesn't understand JSON. Um, you might want to use a tool like JQ to be able to parse those out. Um, but Zeek cut is very handy. Um, maybe you're looking at some HTTP logs and all you really care about is the timestamp. Uh, you wanna see the host, uh, you know, the, uh, ID or, the uh, ID or Ridge H or the originator of the connection, um, the host name, and then the URI that was uh, accessed um, instead of that big long stretch of all of the fields. Uh, so you can pass the arguments to Zeek, the fields that you want to see, you pass as space separated list. Uh, and then we use a redirector to read in the HTTP log and you can see the output that we get here. Um, one of the other thing that's handy about Zeek cut is you can convert that Unix epoch into a human readable time. Um, you can also do that with the date command one at a time. Um, but uh, I think most people probably can't track Unix epoch time and having it in human readable format is, uh, is quite handy. Um, so just a couple other commands that we wanted that I wanted to introduce very quickly. Um, we can use the sort command. Uh, this allows us to sort by value. Um, we are actually, so again, we're using the Zeek cut command to be able to pull out just a couple of fields. We're only interested in the originator IP and then the responder bytes. Uh, and then we basically want to sort the commands, the connections in the con log um, by the uh, responder bytes, starting with the largest value first. So we pass sort, uh, we're reversing the order, we're doing a numeric search uh, or sort rather. So that's what the N does. And then the K2 tells sort to sort on the second field, uh, second field value. And then we're trimming this off because we only care about you know, the top 10 hits in this particular log. Um, another useful command is the unique command. So um, we want to get a list, uh, as it notes there, you know, it's a way to be able to report or filter out repeated lines in a file. Um, again, using that handy Z cut to pull out just a couple of fields that we're interested in. Um, we sort them to be able to feel, fill, send them into the unique command. Um, that dash C argument tells unique to give you a count of the number of times that each unique value is seen. And then we pass it back through sort uh, keying on that first value. And we can see that um, the IP address 131 is shown up here uh, twice with port 53. So that's pretty darn fascinating. Um, the last command to, uh, to be familiar with that's handy if you're trying to handle logs on the command line is the awk command. Um, this will allow you to start picking at certain fields uh, and taking action based on them. So here we're saying um, if it's port, a if it's the uh, service field is HTTP and it's not on port 80, then we want to print that out. Um, this is another way to get at what you can get out of the known services log. Uh, maybe you just have a con log available to you. Um, the next line there is, again, just showing you an example of how to be able to use the awk command to sum up values and then at the end print these out. Um, we're whipping through this pretty quick, but as Fatima noted, we will be making the slides available and there is uh, lots, of, lots of help online for being able to play around with some of these commands. So last but not least, just real quick show uh, a few examples of uh, being able to use this. We will pop back out. Normally we do this as a exercise for all of you, uh, but 
again, we're a little time crunched. Uh, get rid of the old stuff. We'll go against that capture file so that we've got a pretty decent corpus to work with. Uh, and then the first thing we want to look at is the top five destination ports in descending order. Um, so again, we're going to use Zcut. Uh, we're going to look for uh, the responder port, um, read that out of con log, and we can just pipe that through sort and unique. Uh, and then again, similar to what we were showing in that uh, in the example in the slide. So since we only want to know the top five, we can use head to filter those out. And we can see that in this particular script, uh, port 80 has the highest number of ports that show up, uh, followed by 53 uh, NTP, something on port 5,000. And then the zero is probably some ICMP entries that show up in there uh, because Zeek overloads the source and destination ports to be the ICMP type and code uh, when it wants to log an ICMP packet. A um, couple other ones to look at here. Again, playing with the, uh, this time we'll play very, very quickly with awk to show you an example. Um, and so with awk, we can define the field separator that we want to use. Uh, and so we're saying we want to separate on a tab. Um, and for this particular one, we're wanting to see all connections that are longer than five seconds. So field nine is the duration field. Um, so equal than, we do five, and then we pass a print argument uh, because we want to print out that line. Uh, and we want to read out of con.log. And then we'll do the old less dash s. And we can see in the duration field here, these are all of the connections that were five seconds or longer in, in, in length. Um, so there's a couple other uh, examples in there uh, or uh, other items in the exercise. Uh, as Fatima noted, uh, she'll be hanging around uh, for a little bit after this ends. Uh, and if you want to play around or have questions, uh, you can ask in there. Otherwise, when the slides are available uh, on your own time, you'll be able to poke around. So again, there's lots of seams these days uh, when you're operating usually in an enterprise environment, you're probably going to be shoving stuff into a seam and you'll be able to be able to do a lot of neat things. Um, but it's useful to have a little bit of uh, familiarity with the Unix command set uh, and the stuff that you can do on the command line. And I will then pass it back to Fatima and we are going to dive into frameworks a little bit. Alrighty, I'm just going to share my screen, uh, screen real quick. Um, okay, so notice framework. So one of the important frameworks that you should know about when you are uh, like starting with Zeek and you know diving into what else you can do with Zeek is the notice framework because that is uh, where you can um, customize your scripts to generate some interesting notices for you to take a look at. So we have been seeing different log files that we generate, right? So notice.log is one of the log files that we generates if you have any uh, custom policy scripts enabled. So if you have like local, um, dot zeek and if you have uh, some default scripts enabled for detecting the boot forcing or for detecting password guessing for detecting sql injection all those notices gets triggered and logged in notice.log file so that is one of the log files that we really need to uh, keep an eye on so uh, yeah one of the easiest way to customize your uh, zeek scripts is writing a local notice policy and you know whenever you see any interesting event interesting event then just raise a notice and let zeek let zeek uh, log it into the notice.log file so uh, notices have built in suppression so if a, if a person is keeping um uh, brute, keep brute forcing your your servers it's not like for every attempt zeek is going to uh create a notice for you so if uh, zeek is seeing um 
the same same connections over and over again and the same events that are triggering the notice um, that are raising the notice it is intelligent enough to suppress it by looking at two important fields one is the um, the 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 the, mess, the note so notice.log has different fields in it so one of the fields that Zeke looks for uh, notice suppression or duplicate notice is the note right a note note field that has uh, an identity that has the notice uh, name that identifies the notice so for example if it's a boot force it will be uh, ssh colon colon ssh underscore boot force so that's the field and the other field it's called identifier so what identifier is is it's nothing but a four tuple uh by default and then you can you, you can write your own custom identifier to tell zeke that if you see the source ip destination ip source port destination port same for that same node then don't raise the uh, don't raise the notice and zeke by default does that it looks at the uh, port tuple and it looks at the node and it suppresses the notices so that you don't get bombarded with like thousands of notices in the lock notice or lock file for a brute force attack or for a password guessing so that's pretty intelligent and um yeah it's it said that it can be controlled and defined by the script writer as well so if your script doesn't look for the four tuple like if you have the same four tuple but uh, you you want it to you want it to be logged every time you see it you can write your own custom identifier to say that uh you whatever string you want z to tell apart two duplicate notices books allow modification of notices so another important thing um to talk about is different actions so when when uh, keith was going over the first section of the alerting um and the custom logic uh for alerting part there are four important actions that notice framework can take for you the, the default notice action is a uh, notice log which whenever there's a notice that is raised from one of those custom scripts it auto logs it into the uh, notice.log file so that's the default action that that zeke takes uh, zeke takes on the um on the notices that gets arisen when whenever there's a uh, corresponding traffic the other three important actions are action alarm action email and action page so what action alarm does it it actually logs the notices into the alarm underscore um, uh, notice.log file plus it actually emails um it sends out the it sends out an email to the uh, addresses and the destination addresses that you mentioned in the notice info record the other action you can take is action email that action email will uh, actually do not log anything but it will just send the notice via email to whoever the recipient is for the um, for that notice and then action page so it also sends an email to the email addresses uh, which are defined in the email destination field in the notice info record so these are some of the actions and what hooks does it you can actually um, like hooks provide the mechanism for applying those actions and generally modifying the notice before it gets sent over to the other action plugins so if you have if you have a notice um ssh boot forcing for example and it only so it equally logs it into the notice.log file but you want another action to be taken before it logs it like say you need to be notified via email then you can totally use the um hooks notice policy hooks that can uh, modify the actions um, of that notice before it gets logged into the notice.log file as well so that's where the hooks come into the picture and then you can um, you can do all sorts of different uh, actions whatever you want to take corresponding of corresponding to whatever notice is getting triggered okay so that was um yeah that was a pretty fast uh, overview of notice framework but uh, all you need to know about notice framework is um uh, if you're writing custom script and if you are writing your own detections the easiest possible way for you to get notified is raise the notice in the notice.log file like if you are planning on okay where i should log i have a custom script and now it is creating some some log interesting logs so should i create a new log file or should i just raise a notice and then add it to the notice.log file that automatically automatically gets created by zeke so it's like an, a call that if you need actions to be taken on some of the notices then then let's write that to the notice.log file but if you just want a log file then just write the uh dumb that log logs that are getting generated from your custom script to a log to a log file so this is a notice exercise it's it's a pretty straightforward i have i have shown you the load miscellaneous slash scan which is disabled in local.seek um file and what are, what we are going to do is we are going to enable that in the uh, local.seek file and then run a mal pcap against the local and see if we if we get a notice.log file generated and generated and what is logged into that notice.log file 
So it should not take more than five minutes. So I will let you guys play around with these commands and I'm also going to post them in Slack and then I'll run through them really quickly after like five minutes. So let me do that. So yeah, uh, take five minutes to uh, go through the, uh, the exercise and then I will come back and show you the commands that are run. All right, I am quickly going to um, run those commands and show you how the scan detection works. I hope you guys had a chance to run the commands by yourself and let us know if you've run into any problems while doing that. So we are going to enable the miscellaneous scan script. So it should be somewhere down. Here, that's it. So it's after the miscellaneous stats. So this is disabled right now. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to enable it and then write it. And now the local.zeek has the scan script enabled. So all I'm going to do is now is run zeek against the malpica.
Hmm. All right, so we have some block files and we have a notice dot log. So you can see, let me show you. So this is the notice.log file generated. And the notice that got generated is for the scan port scan. So this is the node that I was talking about that is one of the uh, fields together with identifier that is used for notice suppression. So the notice type is sport scan and Zeek has detected this IP doing a scanning of uh, the host, this, and then like this is one of the hosts it is doing a unique port scan on, but if there are multiple hosts, it just I think dumps the first 10 from the buffer and then it just says that it is it has scanned at least 200 uh, unique hosts or ports. So it has at least um, scanned 15 unique ports on this host in zero, zero, millisec zero milliseconds and uh, 0 0.1 milliseconds. So you would notice that the action is action log. This is the default action, but if you want to take another action called email or alarm that you could have, you can do so by using the notice hook. All right, so that was the exercise. That was a pretty straightforward, ex pretty straightforward exercise of enabling the miscellaneous scan dot Zeek script and seeing if we can generate a notice on the scanning using PCAP. So that said, um, I will now hand it over to Keek for going over um, another important frameworks. Alrighty, really on the home stretch now. So the last framework that we're going to talk about here is the notice or the Intel framework. Uh, so the Intel framework is very, very useful for being able to load a set of indicators. Um, and then Zeek will watch for them. Uh, and Zeek is smart enough to look only where it might expect to see the, the indicator. So um, there's a, a variety of different indicators that Z can watch for. Um, you can look for addresses, URLs, you can look for software, email addresses, usernames, um, file hashes, insert hashes. Those are particularly useful. Um, and again, Zeek is only going to look where it would make sense to look for an IP address, for instance. Uh, it's not going to run a regular expression across the content of an HTTP page because you may not care if a malicious IP address shows up in a public web page, um, but you definitely might care if you see it as you know the responder of a connection from one of your domain controllers. Uh, so again, Zeek looks is it, is smart enough to only look for these values in places that it makes sense um, for them to actually be meaningful. And again, where does it look um, for SMTP, for instance? Uh, it will look in places like the receipt from uh, the receipt to the uh, in from uh, into, looking in headers and reply tos. Um, maybe there's a you know email address that you know fishers will use. Um, as their initial test address. Uh, and so you could watch for that or an address that they commonly use to get replies back from people. Um, DNS, again, it's going to look in places that make sense, like the request or response fields. Uh, it's not going to look in a non-DNS connection uh, because it may not necessarily matter uh, or it would be prone to false positives. Fatim is on that one. So the Intel framework works off of the input framework. Um, there are a bunch of frameworks. Uh, again, I would really encourage everyone to take a look at docs.zeek.org, uh, where you can see the book of Zeek. Uh, there was significant work put into that over the last, uh, probably about a, you know, six months to a year ago uh, to really overhaul the Zeek documentation. Um, and there's good documentation on all of the frameworks if you want to get familiar with them or just see a short list of them. Um, the Intel frame or the input framework rather that the Intel framework builds on allows you to watch files for changes. Um, so with the Intel framework, uh, what it will do is watch for a file to change. It has to be, uh, you know, it has to be an atomic change. So you have to do a move into the new file name and then Zeek will realize that this file has changed and it will automatically reload the Intel file 
uh, and then distribute it across the workers if you're in a clustered environment. Um, it notes there, by default, old entries are not removed without a restart, uh, but there is a policy script uh, that you can use to remove entries on update. Um, so you have to use that script. You can't just, as it notes there, just deleting them out of the file won't actually make the change that you want. Um, and then last uh, note here is there is another policy script that is a do notice script um, that will raise notices when uh, an Intel value is seen. By default, the Intel framework will simply log to a file called intel.log, uh, but there may be some entries that you think are of high value to you, and you could have notices raised in addition. So in order to enable this, um, first of all, you have to, uh, you wanna make sure that the Intel scene values are loaded. Um, so we do an at load statement for that, and we may want to have notices raised as well. So we make sure that we've loaded the do notice policy script. Um, then we need to define the actual Intel values that we want to look for. Uh, and so we, the format of that log file or that source file rather, um, again, the tricky part here is the values need to be tab separated. Uh, that's probably the number one thing and it needs to be a literal tab character, not a series of spaces. Um, that's probably the most common mistake uh, or trip up that we see when people are working with the Intel file. Uh, so here we have the fields defined. We've got an indicator value. We're looking for zeek.org in this example. Uh, we have an indicator type. So we're telling Zeek that this is a domain. Uh, again, that triggers that knowledge to say, only look for this in places that it would make sense for a domain name to be. Um, there's a meta source field that you can define. So uh, you know maybe you're pulling files from a bunch of different open source Intel sources. Uh, and you want to know, did this come from you know, malware domains or did it come from the abuse CH uh, SSL blacklist? Uh, and so you could tag the Intel entry to tell you where that came from. Uh, here, we're just using a, a dumb mockup of source one. And then the last part that we're doing here is we're defining true for the do notice value uh, to tell us that whenever someone visits zeke.org, uh, we want to get a notice raised. Uh, so. Then the next thing that we need to do is tell Zeek about the Intel file itself. Um, you'll note here, this is a set. So we could have a whole bunch of different Intel files. Maybe we create an Intel file per source, uh, or you can merge all of your values together into one big file. And it's reasonably efficient. I mean, people run you know, hundreds of thousands of Intel hits uh, and, and really don't suffer much in the way of performance. Uh, and the memory usage should be reasonably low uh, unless you're getting to obscene uh, Intel file sizes. So this one will uh, give you the rest of your time here to be able to um, go ahead and, oh, yep, uh, go ahead and play around with this particular exercise. Uh, we'll give, let's actually say about five minutes, then we'll pop back on here. Uh, run through it uh, to show you how it works. And then the last couple remaining minutes, uh, if there are any other questions or comments that you all have, uh, we would appreciate to hear from them. So take about five minutes here on this and then we'll run through it and then we'll wrap up.
Okay, let's pop out to our shell real quick and run through this momentarily. So we've copied, uh, for this, I copied local Zeek into our uh, local home directory uh, or working directory. Uh, you can see here we're doing the at load to make sure that the Intel scene values are loaded. And then we're redefining the Intel read files set to include the path to a already helpfully created uh, intel.dat file. Uh, and then if we run Zeek, We'll run against, we're going to run against that same mal pcap that we used in the last exercise. And we want to make sure we pass local argument so that the local.zeek file gets read in. And then we get that local nets complaint, uh, but that won't cause a problem for what we're doing here. Uh, and now we can see that we've got an intel.log. Uh, and And we can see we've got uh, a lot of hits for the address that we're interested in. Uh, again, this is our scanner from the previous example. Um, you can see that it tells you the indicator type that we were looking for an address. That's what was seen. Um, you can see the scene indicator. So it was this address. Uh, it was uh, of the type Intel adder. Uh, it was observed in the orange uh, H field. Um, the node where it was seen. Um, and then you've got malware IOCs uh, is the source that we have defined. So if we actually look in the file here, we can see there's the meta source, uh, meta description. So that was a field that we could potentially add as well. Uh, and then there's also a URL that you can pass. Uh, so a neat thing you can do with the URL, for instance, is if you're looking at, for instance, let's say file hashes, uh, you could create a URL that can be clickable that you could, or copy pasted into your web browser that would take you, for instance, right to the virus total results for that particular file hash or indicator that you're looking at and start to get some extra context around this. Uh, see where you've got an error in there. Requested field indicator. Hmm. See, Fatima's answering. So I'm going to go ahead and stop sharing here. All righty. We are one minute over, but we started one minute late. So we, uh, we landed this plane right on time. Um, uh, Fatima will hang out for a little bit. I'll make her a host. Uh, I need to drop off uh, very shortly. Um, Really appreciate everybody hanging in here with us. Uh, hopefully this was useful. Um, I hope everybody here picked up at least a couple interesting things and we've sparked your interest in Zeek. Uh, there's the Slack channel uh, for general, for packages, a lot of different sub channels, uh, great places to join and uh, see what other people are talking about. Um, there's mailing lists. Uh, those are being moved to Discord uh, as uh, you know currently uh, or very soon. Um, so hopefully that is an active place for you to get engaged. And again, uh, if you're interested in joining the training subgroup, please do reach out. Uh, you can find information on how to reach out about that on zeke.org. Um, we'd love to get more people's views uh, and input into the training subgroup. Uh, and with that, uh, thank you very much again. Um, if you've got comments, please send them along to us, suggestions for how we can improve or things that you'd like to see about. Uh, we would be happy to take that input. Fatima? Yeah, it's, sorry, I was just looking at the Slack channel. So I would be hanging around. And um, yeah, as Keith mentioned, if you guys, like, thank you for attending it. If you guys have any questions, we will be here to answer. Don't forget, we have second session in an hour, like at 1 p.m. PST, like the top of the hour. Ashish is going to, um, provide the training on advanced Zeek scripting. That is pretty cool. So you will get more insights and hands on on how you can build a script and how you can customize your script. So that is a really cool, highly recommended training. And it will be like, it will have your uh, 
feedback uh, in the um, in the Zeek scripting land. So we were having questions that what scripting language Zeek uses and how to write scripts. So that will be a really good training to attend as well if you want to uh, get more insights on the Zeek scripting side of the land. And I am I have uploaded the um, slide deck for the um, introduction to Zeek, and I'm going to post that in the Slack channel real quick. The link of the GitHub. So that is our PDF uh, of the slideshow that we um, slide deck that we went through in our training. And um, I was just going to hang around. Uh, you guys can feel free to take breaks and uh, come back for the easy uh, advanced training uh, at the top of the hour. But I was going to go and um, play around with the ZKG exercise that we the that we skipped during the uh, ZKG. Uh, uh, ZKG um, info session. So I'm going to share my screen. So if you guys would like to follow, you can like more than welcome to follow and ask questions if you are stuck at anything. The link for the second session. So we are uh, using the same Zoom room. So I'm not going to close the Zoom room. So this is the same link. Ashish will also be joining at the top of the hour. And uh, people uh, should like, yeah, we are not having another Zoom link for the second session. We will be hanging out in the same same Zoom room and we will be hanging out in the same Slack channel as well. So you guys, if you guys want to take a break, come. Um, you can take a break and come back and join the same room. And this room will be up and the recording will keep going for that session as well. All right, so let's work on that slide. So you guys should have the slide deck that um, I posted right uh, in the Slack channel. So you guys can also follow now um, with the instructions like here that I will be following. And um, let's jump into it. So what do I have? I do not have anything here. So as I mentioned that ZKG is very helpful in, um, in installing and loading and unloading packages that are available out there that are like third party packages. So I'm going to uh, play around with the file installation because that comes really handy on the production network because you know if you have um, Yara kind of rules that goes through the different file, uh, different files that you extract and have headers, then that would be really another open source cool tool to have in your uh, arsenal that you can use Zeek for extracting out the files and then you can use Yara rules on top of it on the extracted, ex extracted executable files and see if you get any hits for the bad executables in your network. So that comes really handy. So let's uh, install the um, extraction. Script. Yes. All right, so we should have okay, so we have three packages which includes JA3 file extraction and the CVE package. So now what I would like to um, do is So this is the packages. So let's let me do let me do this instead of just breaking editing it. Let's go to the site folder and see what is in the um, packages. So this is our site local um, folder that we uh, uh, that we walk through in the file um, layout session. And here you can see that all the packages that we have installed using ZKG are available here. So these are all the sim links. Unfortunately, I cannot like show you the colors, but these are all the sim links. So if I do an LSH LAH, the packages here are all the sim links that actually refer to the packages installed inside the packages folder, which is this package. This package is here. So JA3 is inside the packages, file extractions inside the packages, and CV, this package is inside the packages. So let's go to the Package directory and see our installed packages. So this is all done by Zeek 
um, ZKG for you. So you won't have to worry about loading them explicitly or unloading them explicitly. So you can take a look into um, load.seek and see all of them are by default loaded. And it says do not edit this file because this is managed by ZKG. So these three are loaded. And um, you can use unload command to unload any one of those, but they are right now loaded. So I'm just leaving them alone like that. And for the file extraction, this is a directory. So let's go to the file extraction directory. And it has the config file. So this is the config file I was talking about that you can uh, see here that it says that it is loading the plugins and it has to extract common exploit types. So um, what we can do is um, let's do CD plugins. So these are all the different plugins that are available for the file extraction. And then you can check um, that it has like, it doesn't have any uh, policy check, any, any specific uh, file type, like the file meta type. <clears throat> Let's get P. Here, here we are checking for the mime type of DOS .exe for the um, portable executable. So these are all the different extraction plugins available for different mime types. So all we are going to do for our exercise is um, we are going to add the plugin extract all files that I just showed you that it's extract that is extracting all the files uh, that will be seen in the uh, PCAP by, by Zeek. And then we are just going to load the uh, dot slash plugin slash extract all files dot Zeek. And that should be, uh, that should do the trick for us to extract the files. So, so we are in the plugin directory and we are going to uh, load this file in the, um, the, in the uh, site uh, config dot um, Zeek. So comment about like that and strike all stop seek. Now we, now we should be all set. So let me come out of this directory and then run Zeek. Okay, so, uh, Ignore the warnings, but now what I have done is uh, all I have done is I have installed the file extraction package. I have loaded the extract all files dot Zeek, uh, which Zeek script which is inside the plugins available, uh, and I have added that to the config dot Zeek, which comes with the file extraction configuration file. And then I have done what I have done is I have run Zeek against an extract pcap, and that is a specific pcap that has a whole bunch of transfers going on, and I have. Um, run ran it against the um, local argument to load our file to, to load our to load our file extraction module. So now what I have here is let me clear the screen. I have a folder called extract files. So I'm just going to cd into the extract files folder and then do an ls. And this is all the files that Zeek has seen in the pcap and it has extracted that out for us. So you can see a whole bunch of PG and GIF files, JS, JavaScript, TXT, HTML. Um, I don't think so we have any exe file, executable or PE, but they are all like basic um, web files that gets transferred when you make a web connection. And some of them are SSL cert files as well. So these are all the files that, that were extracted. So that was pretty cool to know. So um, let come out and um, start that log. So <clears throat> this was the exercise I was uh, I wanted to go through when we were doing the um, ZKG 
uh, walk through. So let me know if you guys have any problem. Let me paste all these commands first in the Slack channel so that you guys can also try it out. And if you have, if you are running into any problem, then um, or issue, then let me know, and we, I will be able to. I should be um, here to help out with that as well. Okay, so there was a question, is it possible to filter on specific file types such as the .exe? So you can extract the specific .exe files based on the uh, on the plugins that are here. And you can actually, uh, just like I was just looking at the extract-p.z, uh, these are the plugins where you just match the mime that you're looking for. And then it, will, it should be able to um, extract that specific mime type for you. Um, like this so if you if you really want just the um uh pe to be ex, uh, extracted out then you can use the uh, the mime type uh, which is the uh, which is which is which is denoted by that for the pe file in the uh, mime types that are recorded by zeke in the um in the in the in the, in the, in the in the file and then you can just break it out and then only those files that has the mime type of application slash, slash x dos exe will get extracted for you. So 
these are some sample plugins that it comes with, but you can totally write your own plugins depending on what kind of file extension extension you're looking for. And some of the file extensions are also provided uh, in, in here. So if you look into the file extensions.seq, here is the map uh, file for the extensions to the uh, mime, uh, file mime type. So this is the table basically, and it is just like the table of string of string. So this is these are the all mime types and the uh, corresponding extension that you're looking for um, to match on, to extract those, those kind of files. If you guys have any other question regarding Zeek or anything uh, apart from what we have covered in the uh, in the training, feel free to you know chime in, and I would try my best to answer those. And um, yeah, if you are still stuck at some of the previous exercises and we just brush through them, and you are like you want to go through them again, I can I'm happy to do, happy to do so as well to walk you through the exercises again. And also to remind, this is just the break time. So I'm just hanging in there. If you guys are interested in, you know, um, if you guys have any questions or to answer any, to answer any questions you guys have. And Ashish, Ashish's session will be starting in next uh, 39 minutes. So if you want to quickly go grab some lunch or need some quick bio break, then please do so. And again, once again, we will be using the same Zoom room and same Slack channel to hang out uh, for Ashish's training as well. So there is no new Zoom link. Also, we have a quick feedback form uh, for both the trainings, this one and that, uh, this one and the second one, which is advanced scripting. And I will be sharing the link for the feedback form um, shortly on the Slack channel. So we would really appreciate any kind of feedback that you, that you want to give, like what we can improve on and whether it was fast or it was slow. Um, we would really appreciate uh, the feedback from the community so that how that will help us to improve the training in future and how we can, you know, add more content that is more relevant to people and what you guys would like to see in future. So I'm going to put that link um, as well in the Slack channel and we really appreciate your feedback.
All right, everybody, good afternoon. My name is Ashish Sharma. Uh, I know it's been a long day already and uh, uh, we are almost reaching uh, 1 p.m. Pacific time. So I was gonna start the training session two, which is Zeek hands-on scripting. Uh, if you can see my screen, uh, uh, you should be able to download exercise from GitHub uh, URL. Uh, I, I pasted the commands to do this. And I'm already assuming that everybody is able to run Zeek on their local machines. So in case not, uh, there are certain some instructions on how to install Zeek as well. All right, so uh, I will be actually conducting the training pretty much alone. There would be some help on the Slack channel. If you have questions, either interrupt me on Zoom, uh, you can unmute yourself or uh, paste questions in Slack. I will keep looking uh, on another screen here and try to answer your questions. Uh, <clears throat> so it's one o'clock, uh, let's start the hands-on scripting session. So. Uh, so my name is Ashish Sharma. I work for Lawrence Berkeley National Lab. I run Zeek at LBNL and uh, uh, my primary job responsibility is pretty much cybersecurity. It involves on-call, uh, pretty much incident, uh, intrusion detection, incident response or anything related to security which comes in the group. Uh, sometimes it's about new systems getting in the picture and then we have to go and talk about like how to secure them as well. So pretty much anything related to cyber. Uh, a little bit about Berkeley Lab. Uh, uh, there's, uh, it's right next to the UC Berkeley campus up on the hill. There's a lot of faculty staff, students who actually come from the UC campus to the lab. There is a whole lot of other scientists, researchers who actually come from all parts of the world to the lab to run their experiments and stuff. Uh, so lab is a pretty open uh, environment and uh, uh, we actually feel proud about keeping our networks pretty open. So uh, there's a rich history of discoveries, 14 Nobel Prize winners and so on and so forth. And uh, yeah, this is one of those uh, bragging walls we have. Uh, so, and we know that last two years have been a little difficult in terms of physical conferences and physical training. I would have personally wanted to even give this one pretty much in-person training. So someday we'll do an in-person training. Meanwhile, uh, bear with me. I know it is very hard, both for the audience as well as me to actually not be able to see reactions, not be able to know who your audience is and still talk about the training. So uh, a little bit more about the lab. Uh, uh, if you folks haven't heard about Cuckoo's Egg, uh, that's a good spy thriller, pretty much a story coming from the lab. Uh, if you haven't uh, heard Cliff, stall talk i think it's a uh, worth a uh, youtube watch and then there are certain other networking tools which have come from the lab including tcp dump uh, lippicap trace route uh, zeek has its origins from lbnl as well so let's let let me now talk about the training uh, so uh, after Keith and Fatima's training, which was about intro to Zeek and like covering all aspects of Zeek. This one gets a little deeper insight into Zeek uh, language scripting and programming. Uh, so consider Zeek scripting like a programming language and like other, any other language, there are 10 different ways of doing things. So what I am teaching here today or going through the material is not probably the right way to teach it. There are more better knowledgeable people who will say, you know, do it this way or that way but I am teaching you a way to do it along with some do's and don'ts on uh, certain experiences. Like, you know, this is not a good idea or if you do it this way, uh, you might actually get uh, uh, stuck on certain places. And my goal here is that, you know, everybody here should be able to write Zeek scripts eventually and uh, contribute to the Zeek packages. So uh, now most of this material, which I have, is pretty much a derivative of uh, the Zeek manual and the literature. So if you cannot keep up with the training, if you find uh, it pretty obfuscated, difficult, certain sections fast or incomplete, 
uh, I would say go look at Zeek manual. It's very detailed, very comprehensive, and it's very actually illustrative. There are a lot of examples in there. It explains things very well. So uh, make this URL your friend, uh, Zeek manual. And actually now there is a book of Zeek as well. So you should be able to uh, definitely make this uh, your regular reference. And uh, further down, uh, here is try.zeek.org. So you should be able to check this as well. Uh, this is a really good uh, uh, application service which Zeek project has where you can actually try certain Zeek scripts, put your own PCAPs if you want, uh, and uh, you can run the code. You can see what the output is. You can in fact even go and see what kind of versions uh, uh, your heuristics can work for or can, don't work for and so on and so forth. But another advantage here is that, you know, you can actually take a URL and then share it. Uh, so if you're writing a script, which has a bug or something, you need help with debugging, you can actually copy the URL. It saves your particular uh, run and you can share it with other people and you can actually debug together. So uh, in this particular session, what we can actually do is that uh, I would prefer that you open command line and run things on command line. If you are unable to do that, I would suggest that you can actually go on try.zeek.org, paste the exercises there, upload the corresponding PCAP, and you should still be able to run pretty much all the exercises we'll be going through. And this, this screenshot is pretty much uh, one such example where uh, uh, if you are running on command line, if you see zeek-r, here is the traces, and then you run the script. So this is the way we would run on the command line, but you should be able to run this on fry.zeek.org as well. So both ways should work. Uh, so uh, if you haven't checked it out, check it out, uh, try command line. If you have still difficulties getting Zeek running, uh, do let me know. So another aspect of this training is that, you know, uh, in any given talk or a training, the the smart way to do is to know your audience. And that is the biggest uh, shortcoming uh, I have. I, I, I actually don't know who my audience is right now. Like, are you solid Zeek background? Are you actually a seasoned Zeek uh, script uh, programmer? Or it's like, oh, this is the first time I want to learn Zeek. So, uh, so the way this particular training is designed is actually, I actually try to create three different things, pack three different things in one particular training. So uh, there will be like three parallel streams. And uh, if you uh, are a beginner, uh, then you should be able to actually uh, just keep up with me, try to go through this material slowly and uh, ask questions and stuff. Uh, I also have something called find the bugs. And I have often learned more by actually creating like introducing bugs in my code and then trying to debug that. So I actually just put some of those scripts too. So if you know, if you think that, oh, I know this elementary stuff, go try find the bugs, see if you can fix those bugs. Uh, that would be fun exercise to do. And then I actually have tasks uh, uh, or uh, certain exercises which are slightly more advanced. So most of you folks may not be able to, like if you're beginning uh, Zeek scripting, today or in last few weeks, you might actually find those a little challenging, but if you have been a seasoned Zeek, like more familiar with Zeek scripting, then you should actually definitely go and start doing those tasks. And my grand aim was that, you know, while I do this training, how about like magically at end of the training, we end up creating our own heuristic and a package, but that is uh, me being too ambitious. So uh, we won't even go there. And actually, to be honest, uh, I have no hurries here. We are here till 4.30 uh, Pacific time. I know it's already afternoon or late evening at most of your places, maybe nights too. So uh, I have, uh, my plan is to convey uh, the thoughts and the ideas more than to finish the slide deck. So even if I don't do the entire training, which is what, 140 slides, uh, I, I'm in no hurry. So I will just keep going with a certain pace. And if everybody thinks that, you know, we know this stuff, just let me know please do anything you tell me would be helpful. So the way the training layout is done is that I actually am covering uh, in different sections. So chapter zero, of course, is hello world. Then I'm going through fundamentals, basic data types. Then we explore the events. 
uh -huh. then we get into a little bit more into like sets and tables and actually these uh, container types are really useful when you are writing zeek scripts because you will almost always be relying on these container types then i will get into a little bit of records and the reason for that is so that i can actually talk about logging and notice framework if time permits let's see if we can get to input framework bloom filters clusterization but uh, let's see how things progress and so this is the training layout like i will be covering at least the sections which can actually get you very familiar with zeek scripting as well as get you to a level where you should be able to generate notices so write your own detection and generate a notice bring it to the attention and the chapters are actually laid out in this particular manner so there is like fundamentals and basics so like i think the first 20 30 minutes is where i talk the most but after that it's actually exercise after exercise so there is going to be a lot of exercise coming in the uh, like by second hour of the training so i talk about fundamentals basics then i talk about uh, uh, so fundamental and basics mostly is zeek literature so if you go on zeek documentation you should find most of this material there actually even in be better more descriptive manner and then there are use cases where you will here i can talk about my personal experiences or what i think is uh, use cases there and then ex there are exercises so there are problems there are solutions to those there are base codes and these base codes are like you know how do i for example, use Bloom filter, there is a base code for it. You can actually refer to that code and write your own if you need be. And then there are find the bugs and then there is extra, extra credit stuff, which if you think the, this is boring or you already know all that, go attack those problems. So here is uh, uh, where we will start. So uh, I would say that, you know, create an alias called Zeek and uh, and uh, just copy this command alias zeek dash c uh, let me just paste this in slack as well uh, there is slack okay so here is the slack uh, here is the trading and uh, so you should actually put this as an alias and then make sure that zeek is in your path make sure that you should be able to run zeek dash h so let's, okay, I should, I should, uh, uh, yeah, here. So you should be able to do this and you should be able to get a Zeek help uh, screen on your screen. So uh, I'll give a few minutes for folks to do it as well as I believe Fatima already pasted the clone URL. Uh, Yes, let me do this too. Uh, is this better for everybody? Okay, so, uh, okay, so, a tiny bigger okay let's do even bigger okay okay so i, I think any bigger than this would be uh, a little more like i might need a more bigger glasses or i may not need glasses at all either way but uh, so uh let's uh, go back to this here so get this alias be able to do this and now when you are running the exercises uh, what i have tried to do is that every uh, like in exercises you see like hello world basic type zero one two three four so these are the numbering is the chapters in each chapter if you go inside let's say just go to zero four uh, there will be uh, Primarily four things, three things actually. One of them is traces, all the PCAPs will be here. The scripts where the Zeek scripts are there, that's where you'll see the find the bug. And then these are the cautions, which are actually more of an extra credit uh, uh, kind of thing. So, so that, but uh, the way I try to do convention and less confusion is that if you're running a particular script, the PCAP for that corresponding script is going to be with the same name. 
So let's uh, zero four scripts. So see, there is a zero one. Actually, I think easier is to do zero three scripts. So here is see zero three valid invalid basic set additions one two three four five. And if I go into traces, you should also see. Uh, so the pcaps for corresponding scripts is going to be the same name. So and the way you would run them is actually Zeke, uh, whatever is the particular name of the exercise. And in case of traces, you can actually do dash r the traces and then whatever is the script related. If you do not see a trace for a script, means that script did not need a trace, or it does not need a trace. So. Uh, Let's start with hello world. So uh, basically what we'll do is we'll run this thing uh, here. Let's go clear the screen, uh, Z zero zero and hello world. So let's run this and you should be able to uh, see two functions, Z init and Z done. And one says hello world and one other says I feel good. So uh, hopefully everybody should be able to do this. Uh, and uh, Let's see, has every, is everybody able to run this thing? So what I will do is also here, uh, cat. So here is Zeke, hello world. So I can take this, I can go to try.zeek.org and I can actually paste it here and I can run the same thing on try.zeek.org. So let's just do it better, dot z dot r. So uh, here, hide the text, change this, paste it and run. And you should see the Zeek output here too. So hello world and so on and so forth. But uh, what I was saying is that, you know, you can take this URL, it's a safe thing. If you want, you can actually paste it to somebody else who can help you with debug. So. And this is one specific case, but you know, uh, later on, I'll show again in a demo where we can use a PCAP here. I would personally prefer everybody be able to run this. So if we are able to do this much, I think we have a great success already. So, so uh, let's talk about this particular script. So this script, if we cat or this, it actually has two events. There is a Zeek in it and there is a Zeek done. And what Zeek in it does is it says uh, Zeek in it and hello world. And the way you write, like print something on standard out is by using this particular syntax called print. You can format. We are not getting into pretty details about formatting and like what all different ways you can do that. But for now, let's just say uh, I am for printing this particular string uh, inside double quotes. Uh, so, but what happens is Zeek in it is an event which runs at the very start when the Zeek starts running. And Zeek done is an event which will fire at the very end when the Zeek is done. So we know that Zeek started, Zeek is done, and this is the output from there. Now, yeah, so basically I already asked if everybody can, if somebody is unable to run Hello World, let me know, uh, or they can try it on uh, try.zeek. But I'm gonna continue. Uh, so what is the use of Zeek init and Zeek done in real world? So uh, like Zeek init is primarily used for like setting variables, constants, redefinitions. Uh, I don't do this as much right now. And the reasons for that is because I actually use like input framework, configuration framework, but you know, you can actually set certain things. Like for example, in we will see later in the uh, course that in logging framework, you can actually set up log streams in Zeek init too. Now, the second thing you can do is use input framework. So you can read into the tables from input framework. So let's say you have a, a, a raw file, for example, a list of all the tar exit nodes, and you want that to be read inside the Zeek. So you can actually put that in a file, configure input framework to read that file, set that up in Zeek in it. And when Zeek starts, it will read the file. And by the time Zeek actually is processing the traffic, everything should be in the data structures. Uh, you can define filters for logging frameworks, you can initialize clusters and define worker manager events, schedule timers and events. And this is actually stuff you may not actually understand for now, but there are certain things you can do in terms of 
uh, housekeeping, both in Zeek init and Zeek done. So for example, summaries are a good thing out of Zeek done. Uh, you can do cleanups, purge data. If you are using a backend database, you can do all, uh, or you can preserve certain states as well. So now, now chapter two actually is gonna get a little uh, theoretical. Uh, I will still try to talk at a high level about script, get, a, get everybody a little sense of what Zeek script is, a feel of it. And, uh, and then certain pointers of like, okay, how do you, uh, go and learn more about it. And then I'll get into some very specific things uh, at a certain more depth. So first question is, why do you want to write a Zeek script? What, what, what use is it? So if you look at this diagram here, it's a pretty simplified model of Zeek and uh, it's again available on the literature. So the way Zeek works is that it actually sees the, uh, hmm. so it actually sees the bytes on the network. So it actually sees this package. Now those packets are analyzed by different analyzers and those analyzers actually are configured to fire certain events. So those actually between network and event engine, there is a whole lot of mechanisms uh, there. Let's not get into that. It comes down to that analyzers fires, fires these event engine. Uh, analyzers talk to the event engine, which fires these events. These events actually go into policy script interpreter, which is the Zeek script layer. And this is where you, uh, Zeek actually provides you with uh, all kinds of data uh, in a format which we as humans can also understand and interact with. So basically, uh, for example, HTTP. So you HTTP on the wire will have get and post requests for to simplify. If you want get, what is the get request? Ultimately, an HTTP uh, get event will fire, which will actually go and allow you to tap into the policy land and be able to see the val values of uh, uh, get request. So basically, a script is a communication medium between the Zeek and the packet processing engine. So, and actually, not only that, it's even a medium between me and Zeek too, because I will write my own scripts and I want to make sure that uh, I can get what I want out of the data. So it also gives you a mechanism because what Zeek does is that at a, a network layer, it will populate all these different data structures and Zeek script actually allows you access, access to those data structures, which are populated by Zeek. And then based on the values in those data structures, you can decide this is good, this is bad, uh, aggregation of this is good or aggregation of this is bad, correlations and so on and so forth. So Zeek scripting allows you to write new heuristics and detection. And here are certain examples like, you know, uh, long ago, uh, like IPv6, like there was no, there is no ARP protocol in IPv6 like, in, as, like we have in V4. So how do we know that there's a MAC IP binding? So IPv6 does router advertisements and solicitations. So what Zeek does is it sees these router advertisement solicitations, fires the relevant events, and then you can tap into it and say, you know what, I saw this router advertisement for this particular IP, this was the MAC. And then you can create a new data resource, which is a MAC binding between an IP6 IP address and a, a corresponding MAC address. Uh, you can do all kinds of policy enforcements. For example, DHS has a policy of no Kaspersky. How do you implement that? You write your own uh, scripts. Now, how does a Zeek script look like? So this is a bare bones Zeek script. There is uh, like pretty much all the Zeek script should start with module, what particular module it is. Think of module as namespace. Uh, then there is a load. And what load does is that it, think of load as basically hash include in C, C++. So if you want to load uh, dependent scripts or certain extra uh, base scripts, you can actually use at load directive. Then comes export and export allows you to actually define the scopes. So you can define scopes of variables, functions, and events based on export. And I'll go in more details later on, like what the scope is. And uh, we'll go in pretty in depth on this part actually. And then Zeek scripts have functions, they have events, and they have hooks. And a lot of the events are actually fired by Zeek uh, event engine itself, but you can create your own events too. So you can do 
your own personal like events called my event, for example, or you can use the built-in events for example, new connection or connection established, which Zeek would fire when it's actually going through uh, the TCP uh, uh, analysis of a particular uh, session. So now let's populate this a little bit more. So the module, for example, module is my module. And if you look at the code, I think most of it is gonna be module training. So if you are writing a new vulnerability, heuristics for a vulnerability, let's say uh, log4j, so you can create module uh, log4j. And this would help you is that it also, uh, this namespace uh, gives you a scope later on. So let's say you have certain data structure defined here or a certain function here in this module. If you want to call it from other modules, you can actually be able to do that pretty straightforward. We'll get into those parts too, but uh, yeah. And then you load your other scripts, then you can export global variables, you can export events, you can export functions. And when you do something like this, you can actually call these events functions along with namespace clarification at uh, other, uh, in other scripts and uh, functions too. And then there are events. So this is like, for example, built-in event, which is called uh, uh, new connection and this fires every time Zeek sees a new connection. Uh, how does Zeek see new connection? We'll get into that eventually. And then there are functions and then uh, we already talked about Zeek in it and Zeek them. So now uh, what I did was I, I was looking at it and I'm like, you know what? Uh, I, I forgot to write these things. The stuff I have said is not on the screen. So I actually just wrote these things like what they are in case if you are looking at it eventually later in the talk. Now, because we are early into the talk, uh, you may or may not have paid attention so far, but you should pay attention to this slide. There are like three slides which really need attention and this is one of them. It's a very loaded slide, but it's, it's gonna be a very good, good useful reference eventually. So Zeek has three things going on. There is events, there's functions, and there are hooks. And that's what we showed up here too. Like, you know, uh, Zeek script, we have event, then there is a function and there is some kind of hook. Now, what's the difference between event function and hook? So the way events work is actually that Zeek looks at the net network traffic. It uh, attaches the analyzers to that traffic. Those analyzers parse the protocol and then go through all the sessions connections and then they start firing events. And those events are the ones which we will tap into either to see what's going on in the network uh, by stream or to actually make sure that we watch for certain extra things in those network by stream. So events actually are uh, called by either event engine or you can write your own event. So you can call event by event statement or you can actually even schedule an event. So you can say uh, schedule, uh, my event in five minutes. And then after Zeek runs for five minutes, it will schedule an event and it will actually uh, put that event in an event queue and fire up after five minutes. So where do we use it? Uh, uh, there will be use cases I'll talk about, but like for example, you can say, I want a summary of uh, all the scanners every hour in a log. So you can schedule, uh, you can write in the function called summarize scanners. You can schedule, put that in an event and then you can schedule it to write a log file every hour. And now you have a summary of all the scanners which were seen in last one hour, something on those lines. Uh, events don't execute immediately, but they get added to the event queue. So if you think that, you know, you say call this event right now, and then based on that manipulation of the values inside that event, you are relying on the next thing. You may actually be in for surprise because that event may not actually fire until the event queue actually clears and that event finds its turn in that event queue. So every time you declare an event or Zeek has an event, it actually adds to an event queue and that's how it is. Events don't return any value. And then, uh, but at the same time, events, the best part with the event is that, you know, uh, multiple event boundaries, bodies can be defined for uh, event, uh, a particular event. So like, for example, by default, Zeek has an event called new connection. So you can actually take event new connection and then you can write your own little code uh, in with the same event 
and uh, uh, based on the priorities, uh, either the Zeek event can run before yours or you, yours can run before fire. So you can actually control the order of execution. So you can use the built-in functions and events and you can actually uh, expand them to write your own as well. And uh, same thing is multiple alternate event prototypes declarations are allowed, but uh, they need to actually match in the name type parameters going in and so on and so forth. And event will actually execute. You cannot break out of the event. So you cannot just return out of an event. You cannot break or you cannot actually, yeah. So, so, but event is something you should be very familiar with because most of the time you will be tapping into the built-in events which Zeek has. And sometimes you will write your own or expand those built-in. Now functions actually uh, can be called inside an event or hooks or another function. And think of these functions pretty much like C, C++. Actually in fact, C is a more simplified version. So functions in C language, for example, or Python or even Bash script. So, Functions get executed immediately. They can or may not return a value. And you can only define one single body for a function. So it's not that, you know, you create like in uh, uh, my function, my function, and then later on you can uh, expand, try to expand that. You cannot do it. You have to have just one single body. And there is no priority for functions, unlike events where you can say like, if there are three events, like three declarations of the same event, you can decide that event one runs first based on priority of one, two, and three, but you can't do that in function. And, and functions actually, you can do only one transformation in function, which is actually, you can declare a function with a list of arguments, or you can define uh, default arguments. Generally, you will not need to get into this part, uh, even at a fairly advanced stage, but functions can, return a value or they can not return a value. So we both is possibility. And hook is actually a hybrid between events and function. So hook is called similar to functions. Uh, hooks execution is immediate, pretty much similar to function. Hook may or may not return a value. And, but unlike functions, hook multiple bodies can be defined for hooks. So that actually is a more similarity to events. And then uh, some likewise, you can actually uh, order priorities for hook as well. But what hook does is that hook actually allows you to break out of uh, hook, which is either you can say, you know, break and then you don't have to run any further code of that particular hook declaration or uh, subsequent hooks with the same names. But, uh, or you can return out of this particular hook and the remaining hooks will keep running. So, for now, bear with me. If you get the sense of event function and hook, that's more than enough. We'll get into more details very quickly. So, but yeah, here is how you will, how these look like. So you can say event here is something called my event. It has argument of Boolean and a string. Uh, then there is an event called new connection, which is an argument of connection type C, C of connection type, which is a, itself a data structure, a record of connection. And then, as I told you before, you can call an event from inside an event too. So you can actually say in a new connection event, which is run by Zeek, call my event. And you can actually call that. And, or you can schedule an event. So that's how it will work. For hook, you can actually say that, you know, there are three instances of hook. So you can say hook, my hook one, there is a string going, but the priority of this hook is 10, uh, there is no priority here, so default is zero, and then there's a priority, which is minus five. And you can actually break out of it. So the way the code execution will be that all the three hooks will be there in terms of expansion of the code. This is actually priority 10, 10 so it will run, then this will run, and then because I have a break, this will never run actually. If you remove the break here, then the third hook will also run. Functions. Uh, so the first one is actually where you actually, you can see that there is defaults declared here. I, I have not yet written a function with a default value. I generally have written functions with default or non -def like arguments, and then I just pass things around or return a value. But there are other base scripts. There are some which actually might use it. So if you uh, call a function, you can call function as 
function with arguments or if you actually have gone with defaults then you can actually just call with the argument which is not default because the rest of them no don't need to be specified here but yes zeek script get familiar with the three things one of them is event another is a hook and then function and how, in which order do you want to get familiar get familiar with events functions and then hooks so now what is the script you uh, set up and usage so script is basically heuristics or helper functions and how does the script work in the zeek bigger zeek picture so script actually one or more scripts will make a package or a heuristic and then uh, those packages become your detection platform like oh are you running a package for log4j are you running a detection for j3 are you running a detection for some other uh, such uh, like scan detection uh, sql injection so bunch like one or many scripts will make a package you run your, all these packages and uh, that becomes your detection platform and uh, the default script which starts this all is actually in your share zeek site folder called local.z so this script let me see if i can show that one to you uh, so my zeek is installed in user local zeek so if you go here then there is share and this is where all the script stuff sets so in zeek if you oh i apologize the font needs to be bigger okay so we are in uh, user local zeek share zeek and if you look uh, there is directories called base policy and site so site is where all your site specific stuff generally is and there is a local.z and this is the policy which actually loads all the default excuse me default policies in z so i generally try not to modify this policy much but actually create something called my policy and then in that i would say load local.z so here my policy and here i can say load local.z and then i can do all kinds of stuff here so this is the way to go and that uh, and remember i mentioned load in the beginning so you can do it but yeah like default script which starts all is local.z and you can actually go into zcontrol.cfg and you can actually set up site policy path and site policy script so recall i mentioned my policy so i can actually go uh, set variable site policy path equals to uh, home ashish zeek and then uh, it will find my policy there uh, and then my policy is already loading local.zeek so this is the way you can actually do things outside the zeek ecosystem too and most of the scripts which are there is in going to be in base policy and site directory so site generally has lo local.zeek but if you really want to get familiar with the scripting look into the base and look into policies uh, Uh, directories uh, there is an immense wealth of knowledge in there so uh, and then uh, yeah so and again uh, for zeek scripting just go to google search zeek scripting and you will see zeek manuals and stuff so i actually this is a old screenshot uh, i just searched it yesterday and there it shows a later version of the manual system but the reason i did not update it is because i it has my picture in there and i am like i am going to just leave that one so uh, and funny is that it actually has uh, uh, the talk which became the basis of this particular training so i gave a talk in 18 which was like how to write this script in 45 minute so so but yeah uh, the point here is google just google zeek scripting and it will take you to the manual to the latest version and you should be able to use that so this is so far uh, just an overview of scripting uh, resources what where to look for what to look for as well as uh, just setting up our environment and getting a little familiar with uh, events and functions uh, warning uh, things are going to get pretty intense and in depth as we move in the uh, slide deck are there any questions so far
if anybody has any doubts any feedback just let me know uh, yes even great so far is a good feedback because that will help me uh, like just uh, uh, make sure that i am doing a fairly okay job and conveying so uh, my audience if you can be loud it will be great i am telling you if we are doing this in person we would be so loud that actually the uh, next floor would be complaining about us but here this is what it is the realities so let's get into the next chapter and now we are getting in depth into a certain things inside z so like all programming languages uh, z has these ba basic data types and we need to be familiar with these basic types and actually i i like this section a little bit more because you know like i come from c background primarily and uh, a little bit i can read a little bit c++ but the deal is you know data type is the first chapter everywhere so uh, the difference between like other programming language in zeek is that it has certain data types which are network centric very very specific to uh, uh network traffic and allows us to expand them expand on them very quickly uh, as, and we'll go through it so i'm going to introduce the data types what are the use cases then what actually uh, uh, is rediff what does rediff mean and then uh, here is another slide which will be important to pay attention to and it's called the concept of local and global scopes so the previous slide which was great important was uh, events functions and hooks the other one would be local and global scope uh, and then i'll talk about corner cases subtleties and then we start doing the exercises and i think that's when the fun part starts and, and trust me like here the slides are more theoretical but as we move forward you, the theory is going to be like two slides and we'll do more exercises so so what are the basic data types in zeek there is bool uh, which is boolean true false there is counts integers and doubles and these are the numeric types based on unsigned integer integer um, then there are time types which is like just literal time as well as interval which is difference of time then we have spring now network centric idea centric is a pattern so this is actually a regular expression uh, so you can de declare all kinds of regular expressions as type pattern and uh, use cases for those can be something like uh, uh, sql injection uh, uh, a pattern which flags sql injections in url for example but here are the types which actually made me attract towards z which was that it has a built in type called port address and subnet so if you declare something as an address it will actually pick it up as an address and it will compare things so and an address is pretty smart in sense that you can define ipv4 you can define ipv6 and both are fine but these are network types make them your friend then there are other types too which is anum uh, which actually is more uh, uh, for uh, creating your own records in user defined types so we will get into this in section chapter 5 so but in this particular thing make pattern your friend port address and subnet your friend get very familiar with them and then here are the container types which we will want to get very familiar you will end up using a table sets vectors and records quite a lot and then there is we have already talked about uh, functions events and hooks here and there are additional types like opaque and uh, for example uh, bloom, bloom filters are opaque cardinality is opaque of cardinality is there uh, let's let's not get into it for now but but yeah here is the data types let's go into simpler version of it so like you know port is a data type so you can define ssh port of type port and then you can say you know what 22 tcp is my ssh port but now it gets further down like you can say watch destination port so these are the ports i want to watch on and that becomes a set of port and here is all this four different ports which actually uh, are in my destination watch list same thing is for type subnet it's actually a subnet you can define subnet and then you can create a set of subnets so you can say you know what my vpn is actually Uh, everything which is one three two is slash twenty two and slash twenty four. So these are my two VPN subnets. So now you are actually defining ports, defining subnets, defining addresses, and you're kind of like encapsulating your network to this. Like you know what? 
here are my VPN subnets. Here are the subnets where my name sub servers are sitting. Here is the subnets uh, which are allocated in this building uh, or your mail servers. So the pattern is basically, this is how you will declare a pattern. Now this get thing gets searched into where you want to search. Uh, same goes for IP addresses and all. So now let's pay attention to something called redef. So you can redefine a variable. So uh, let's say by default in your first script, you said, you know what, here is my static list of uh, ports. And then you can say a redef and then redef will allow you to actually expand or reduce that particular variable. So in this case, you can say redef watch destination port plus equals to, and then you can add 22 TCP to this list. So it gets added uh, in there. So the use case generally here is that, you know, Ashish gets, gives you, publishes a script, you decide to run that script and then you know like, huh, you know what? I need to remove these ports. They don't concern me or I need to add certain things to this particular uh, watch list. So either way you can redefine them in your own site scripts and use it that way. Uh, one gotcha here is that, you know, remember it's a plus equals to, or you can do a minus equals to, if in case, if you redefine and forget a plus or a minus, you will override this entire list. So keep that in mind always. Like every time you type redef, make sure there has to be a plus equals to or a minus equals to. Equals to will literally overwrite anything before. And I will repeat it again. Be careful. Uh, Zeke will not give you a warning. Uh, same thing is happening here. I have a redefined, you can redefine pattern. And so this used to be the old times, but came uh, Johanna wrote configuration framework, I believe, and came configuration framework. So now uh, in the old times, what would happen is that you redefine this in your scripts. But next time, let's say I need to add port 672 TCP here. I have to stop Zeke, edit the, no, edit the file, stop Zeke, install and run. And that's when the values get updated. And that was painful. You don't want to stop Zeke or every now and then. So you have two choices, either flush all the state which Zeke has done, to add a new thing or you're like, no, I, I'm going to delay it. And that's not a decision we like. So Johanna came up with configuration framework where you can actually define a file, uh, point it inside the Zeek. And now anything you add to the file gets actually propagated inside the variable. So this is a much more uh, sophisticated yet elegant way of actually redefining variables. So now here is one more slide, little dense, bear with me. And uh, then we'll get to the fun parts. And this one is the scope, global scope of variables versus local scope of the variable. And no, this is the, this is the right, right place to ask this question about option. And uh, I'll paste you the link uh, once uh, I, I, we get into a break or something, but uh, well, actually, you know what? Good point. This is a really good point. I like your question because I haven't even updated my slide deck for this. But what option does is that, you know, you define uh, variables as either global, you local, or uh, expand constant. But then you can expand them with redef. But then when the configuration framework emerged, you can actually define a variable as type option. And what option does is that that tells Zeke that, you know, oh, there is one here. Option tells Zeke that, you know what, this is gonna be a configuration framework variable, which basically means that any changes in this file should get propagated and updated to this. So now uh, if we say option watch destination port, and let's say these three ports are added to uh, the file here, they will get propagated and they will get uh, updated in this. So option keyword is actually part of configuration framework, search configuration framework, you will see it. Uh, so, and so the other scopes actually, so the option, the scope of option binds with configuration framework. The scope of local actually binds with the local uh, def declaration and definition. So let's say you de define a variable inside a function, then the scope is starts from, uh, uh, opening parenthesis ends on the closing parenthesis. Uh, and you can actually define variables as a local scope inside functions, hooks, even handlers. And as long as they are local, they are inside that particular event, hook, function, or 
part of it. But the global actually uh, has little subtleties to it. One of them is that, you know, if you declare a global right after module, then the scope of global actually is until Zeek script finds another module, which would be like you have like 10 scripts running and first one so is module training. So as long as that module training code is in there, the global variable uh, identifier would actually be applicable. But as soon as let's say there is a new module comes in, which is let's say module HTTP. So the scope of global will go away uh, as soon as the next module comes into the picture. But if you declare a global identifier inside an export block, then you should be able to, even if the scope ends, when the next module comes in, you can call that uh, variable or a function inside another module with the namespace operator. So let's say there is something called module training. I declare a string called test. And then actually in another module called training two, I can actually call test with the namespace operator of double colons and I can say training colon colon test. And this actually expands the global export allows the global variables uh, and uh, functions and events to be accessed across module boundaries. So, so things to pay attention here is if you declare global in module outside ex, uh, export, it is only in that module until next module comes into the picture. But if you export it, then you can call it in other modules too. So now uh, we are on the, like, this exercise uh, and like a first break for the talk. So don't, don't do the exercise yet. Just look at the screen and uh, solve it mentally. So go through A to G and then see if mentally what your answers are. So the first one is like, you know what? I have declared local a port. And then this is a conditional if statement which says if 22 UDP is less than 22 TCP, if the condition is true, the uh, A port will hold value of 22 UDP. If the condition is false, it will hold the value of 22 TCP. What do you think A port will hold? Then is this legal? Like if I don't know the port, uh, is this legal? Like I don't know it's UDP or TCP. So just mentally uh, answer these questions and then we go into it, uh, the exercise. This one is the C one is, is uh, this equal to 192.168.100, print true or false. What will be the value of a, if I actually declare, define A as www.google.com. What do you think would be A? Would it be www.google.com or something else? Uh, so if you have already answered these questions, let's go to the exercise part, uh, which is here. So let's go to zero one basic types. Okay, so the first one is less valid and valid. So what I did is basically all these questions have now become basically here and then Zeek runs them and gets you the output. So how do we run this thing? So we can say Zeek 0, 0 valid invalid. So you just do this and it will get you the answer. So a port is unknown. So 22 unknown is actually a valid port inside Z. And Z actually allows you to do comparison. So like 22 TCP is less than 22 UDP. And I think we should get a little more deep into this one. And then like, let's say you declare a port as unknown. So like is 22 unknown less than 22 TCP? Yes. So now that actually tells you that there is a hierarchy in two protocol. And what Z does is that it actually says, unknown greater than unknown is less than TCP, which is less than UDP, which is less than ICMP. So, and, but where would you compare ports? Like you can compare port is like, is destination port equals to AT uh, TCP, which is fine. But like, would you ever compare 
uh, port uh, 80 UDP with 80 TCP, you will not generally do it. It's not like it doesn't make sense. But what has hap what happens is that you know you might write heuristics or detections where you are like you know what uh, if destination port is less than 1024 TCP, then ignore. And in that case, what will happen is that you know anything uh, which is actually less than 1024, which includes all the unknown ports, which are not defined yet, will be getting ignored as well. So uh, let's say in this case, if we say, you know what, if destination port is less than uh, 53 UDP, ignore. You are basically ignoring all the ports from zero TCP to 65535 TCP and zero UDP to 52 UDP. So you, you know, when you are doing an ignore with a comparison, make sure that you actually have a boundaries in place that you know if the port is less than equals to 53 udp and zero udp for example uh, otherwise you will end up at may you may end up ignoring the entire class of a protocol here so hope this makes sense and then let's look at the code so so we defined an ip address called ipv4 and then the here is how ipv6 gets defined so like any ipv6 address needs to be in a square brackets uh -huh. So they are represented with a square bracket. So now the question is like, is this is an IPv6 representation of an IPv4 address? Z, does, is Zeek smart enough to know that this is an IPv6 representation of an IPv4 address? And if we do a comparison, what would it say? So it actually does say that, you know what, both of them are same here. So, so, so these, this is what makes uh, me actually uh, look forward to using Zeek in terms of network security because you know it has this built-in smartness with it. And same thing as here, uh, when you define local A and there is no type of this particular variable, Zeek would assume the type. And in this case, what we said is it's www.google.com. So Zeek would go resolve google.com, get the list of IP addresses. There is gonna be more than one. So it defines A as a set of IP addresses. And that's what you will see here. A is a set of IPs with IPv6 address, which Google returned, and IPv4 address, which Google.com returned at that point of time. So, so the point here actually is more that there is a built-in uh, smartness inside Zeek as well when you are playing with these particular uh, data types. So now let's get to the exercise. So, so this was just valid invalid one. Now I would say that look at exercise one, two, and three. Those who are already familiar with these, I would say go look at find the bug and try to see if you can actually find these the bugs and fix them. Uh, and uh, for folks who actually are less adventurous or very new to the topic, I would say let's look at one, two, and three. So I'll walk through one first. So what we did in this particular case is that we defined a module called trading and then we exported variables. And remember I told you, if you can declare global outside uh, export as well, in which case its scope is only that particular module. But if you export it, then its scope actually goes beyond the module into other modules too, as long as you reference it with the namespace operator. So in this case, we said IP is 1.1.1.1 network is slash 24111024 and boolean and then in zeek init we are like is ip part of this subnet then the answer is true and then i cre created another module called module training and in this case i call i tap into event zeek done and then i actually call these variables which are actually declared in module training but the way i'm calling them is using scope of training so training ip training net and training answer so, and if you are curious, try the same thing. Uh, so comment out this printf, print command, and then uncomment this one and see what kind of error do you see. So let's run this first. So it goes through this and then the answer is that 111 is in slash 24 and it's true. But if I go and I, I say, you know what, 
I, I haven't def defined the scope here. If I run this, it will say unknown identifier IP or near IP. And that's because this IP is not declared in module training too. It's declared in module training. Even though it's exported as uh, it's not actually uh, reference with namespace operator. And that's why it's like, I like when it's running the code in module two, it's like, I don't know what this is. So this kind of gets you a little sense of global scope actually. So what we do is we say, you know what, here is the scope, training IP, training net, training answer. Let's run it this way. So the training two, I am running. Uh, it says you know IP is in one, two, and three. But what I actually did is that I created a variable called IP, which is actually of type. It's a set of addresses, and then I actually put the addresses in here. Then what I did is I re redefined this particular variable. And later on, I expanded that variable. So I said, you know, redefine IP and plus equals to two, three, four, five. So when I go through this in Zeek, then I say, you know, for each IP address in this set of IPs, print me the number. So it actually would print all three of them. So this kind of tells you that, you know, uh, you can expand one variable. Uh, and number two, uh, you can redefine, expand by doing redefinitions. And then uh, this is how you will end up actually part, like sifting through those. Any questions so far? Yes. So for so what I did is I exported the variable as a global, uh, and first define the variable IP as of type set addresses, set of addresses, and then I redefined them here. So redefine is basically expanded the set by adding a new value to it. Is there a way to determine where a global variable is being pulled from if it's not redefined? No, no, no. Redefine does not. Uh, redefine actually is more for uh, adding a value to a variable or removing a value from a variable. Redefine does not actually affect the scope of the variable. And by scope, I mean that you know. If the variable is global, then you can reference it across other scripts and modules as well, as long as it's exported. It's actually bet in between these two parentheses. But redefine generally is not for the scope purpose of it. It's more for cardinality, like for membership here in this case, where it's like, you know what? I want to expand this set and I, I want to add uh, something more to it. So. Is there a way to determine a global variable is being pulled from and not redefined? No, actually, the what will happen is something on this line. Let's just do this. So in this particular case, if you look at it, I actually defined the global variables in module training. And then I created another module called training two. And then I'm calling the variables from training one here. But because I'm not referencing the namespace of training, uh, module two does not know what these are because I haven't defined them here. And in that case, what will happen is that if I run, Zeke will say that this is an unknown identifier. I don't know what it is. 
So there is no way to quite determine it. The way to determine it is you, you do is f grab dash w ip and then you say star dot z and oh. So in that case, you know, you are like, oh yeah, global is defined here. Let me look at this particular file. And then you are here and then you say, oh, okay, IP is defined uh, as a global in training module. So that's what I need to do. I need to reference it like this. So this is more of a manual debugging actually. You know, if you, Kevin, if you go and look into the find the bugs parts uh, in this one specifically, uh, you will actually, oh, You know, if you go through these ones, you will get a pretty good understanding of the global versus local and how this works. And another one is actually here. Uh, let's see. Uh, so go to the Greek documentation in global and let's search for global. So what this does is that, you know, it actually says, yeah, here it is. So now it actually gets you more illustration, like variables are declared global. So this will help you actually get a better understanding on, of the description of, uh, actually, yeah, maybe read this entire thing, declarations in, uh, where is, so check this out as well. This might help you to get a more clarity. Uh, let's continue. So uh, to repeat, uh, in case if I confuse everybody else as well, uh, Z scripts are generally defined in modules, which are namespaces. Each heuristic is their own module. You can define variables locally in module as well as globally inside a module. If you want those variables to be accessible to other scripts, you actually have to use export and then you can export a particular variable or a function or an event, and then be able to call it in other scripts using a namespace uh, operator. So, uh, has anybody tried find the bugs? Let's see how many people I have so far. Okay. Yeah, just let me know if uh, anybody has questions, anybody tried find the bugs. Um, and if not right now, I would strongly suggest to try these. These are like the classic mistakes I make all the time. And then when I'm fixing them, it's like, oh yeah. Okay, this gets me a little more understanding of like what Zeke is doing or why it is doing something this way. Maybe what I can do is let's, let's do one. Uh, let's do find the bug global versus local. So let's do this one. It says, you know, uh, on line nine, there is a syntax error. So let me see what this is line nine. So I come here and this is line nine. So, so it basically is saying syntax error at event Z and it's like this. So why is there a syntax error? Seems to be okay. Well, uh, it's because, you know, the locals cannot be defined outside. So here, you can define local, locals inside an event, inside a function or inside a hook, but not outside them. So if I do this, can I run this? Okay, it runs. How about we do find the bug zero to zero one. Uh, so let's see. So now this one says, identifiers are not exported, training, sub and answer. So if we look at this particular one, so, you know, Zeek has improved. So even though I defined them global, they are not in export. So if I export them, yeah, 
now these actually get exported and uh, then their scope actually goes beyond the module training and then you can actually call it in module new training as well but if you don't export these then their scope is only inside this so that's the bug here so anyways let's let's go into more complicated stuff if you are still with me so so these what we talked about was data types just elementary stuff uh, and more in the scopes modules uh, globals locals uh, we can take a break right now if you want uh, maybe let's just take a 5 minute break yes the basically the when it comes to syntax it's very much similar to c++ it is pretty much c++ actually just derived uh, uh 
in a manner which actually suits more with the Zeek conventions of Zeek scripting, but underneath Zeek is pretty much entire Zeek is C++. So yeah, if you are coming up from the C++ background, uh, if you don't uh, get a sense of Zeek, why, why Zeek is doing it, try to apply your C++ uh, fundamentals. All right, so let's start again. Uh, we are gonna go into chapter two. This is going to be tapping into the events. And if you want to take, like uh, just have one takeaway from this entire exercise class, uh, I, I hope it's chapter two, because for beginners, this would actually get everybody into a mindset of like, okay, how do you tap into the events in Zeek? How do you use Zeek scripting actually? And uh, recall, I said there are three things which are primarily somewhat confusing. I have a hard time like convincing people with it, but this is the third one of them. So like the scopes of the variables, if we can figure that part out. Uh, in this one, what we are gonna do is uh, we are gonna tap into Zeek events and see what those are. And uh, uh, it's going to get a little ugly and it's gonna get ugly because you know, the outputs are little uh, uh, difficult to read. Actually, they are just harsh on eyes, but let's go through this. So it's like 35 to 40 is fundamentals of what events are, how do you look for right events? And then we go through the exercises. So now next like five slides. Now uh, the most of the class now is gonna be a very few slides and some hands-on stuff. So let's see if, if we can give 15 minutes or so for this one. So, so here is the thing, how does Zeek work at a high level? There are bytes going on the network. We actually put a tap or like a load balancer, something, a network card, which feeds the bytes to Zeek on the interface. Zeek applies this protocol analysis, which actually he, for me, it's like, you know, uh, something which understands the language of computers. So computers talk to each other, protocol analyzers understand that language and then basically they translate the, those language of computers talking to each other to humans. And then the way they do it is they actually organize these protocols into structures uh, and containers. And then they start populating those data structures. And then on certain conditions, which are defined inside Z, these particular uh, data structures actually uh, Zeek fires these events and then uh, puts those data structures as part of the event. So it actually is populated container, which actually we have access to if we can tap into that particular built-in function or an event. So event allows us access to the data. A and then what we do is either we build upon that data or we manipulate this data. And then we go into the next level, which is actually, is this data good or bad? Zeek does not tell us that. Zeke says, here is the bytes, here is the data. You decide if it's good or bad. So we actually manipulate this thing, uh, figure out anomalies, and then actually either our heuristics generate alerts or Zeke basically would uh, log it. So now let's get familiar with connection record. And of all places, this is the fun most fundamental uh, to Zeke. But once you understand this, this you should be able to understand across the board. So let, let me let me just go, uh, what would be easier to do? Okay, so let's show you something. User local Zeek uh, logs for current conduct. So this is actually, so this is actually running on This is Zeek running on my desktop. And it actually, what I did is I actually said, okay, 
show me the connection log, which is IP address, unique connection identifier, source IP port, destination IP port, what is the protocol, uh, what's the duration of the connection, how many bytes went in, bytes went out, and so on, so forth. History, was it a syn, synaf, state of the connection, and so it starts populating the entire thing. Uh, I, I'm sure you folks are all familiar with this particular thing, but this is a log. This is a Zeek log. So now what I am showing you here is actually a tab between the Zeek log and the network bytes. So what you uh, do is uh, in this case, if you go to Zeek base BIF, actually let's, let me just go do that. This. The CV plugins. So here, these are the BIFs are built in functions. So here, there are these files like built in functions which are defined. And each one of them actually is uh, like, for example, when you tap into the TCP connection, uh, the TCP connection reassembler basically fires these different events. So there is a new connection content. There is a new, there is a connection event. There are all these different events which are fired by the TCP reassembler. So for example, let's say partial connection. So this event is generated when a new active TCP connection, uh, for a new active TCP connection when Zeek did not see initial handshake. So maybe that the bytes get got dropped on the wire. Maybe the bad guys are just sending you a uh, X scan or reset package. So G Zeke will see all that. And what will say, you know what, I am seeing a ACK packet, but I haven't seen a SYN packet. What's going on? So it will fire a partial connection event. So uh, I'll just show again, but th there are all these built-in functions available for all these different kinds of protocol analyzers, which are put in place. Uh, we just pr primarily looked into TCP events, but going back here, if you grab on this particular file, TCP events, and just remove all the comments, you will see a list of all these different events, which actually are built-in functions inside Z. For example, new connection contents, connection attempt, connection established. Recall, I just showed you new connection contents and partial connection one. So here are these Z built-in functions and events, which get fired when Zeek sees a certain state transition in TCP reassembler. Now what we do is that the, uh, what Zeek does is at the very end of all these things, uh, events which are fired, it will actually create a log entry and that log entry is what I showed you here, uh, the con log, so this thing. So I don't want to just directly work with con log. I want to do something with, uh, after Zeek sees the packets on the wire and before it gets written to the con log. And this is what we'll be doing in this particular exercise. We are gonna get fami familiar with the connection record and we are gonna see how we can tap into it. So, so you know, uh, like you need to get familiar with different events in different protocol analyzers based on your needs. So in this specific screenshot, what you see is that I went into DNS uh, analyzer and then I grabbed on event and it actually gave me all the events which DNS analyzer provides to me. So let's say there is a uh, uh, basically DNS request. So when Zeek sees a DNS request, it actually files an event called DNS request. It actually puts the connection record in there. Then what is the message which is of type DNS message? What's the query? What's the query type and what's the query class? So these things are seen by Zeek on the wire. It understands it because it has a DNS protocol analyzer. Once it actually gets, parses all that data, it will populate these variables, uh, which are arguments to DNS requests. And what allows you is that you can call this event and actually tap into the values put into these particular arguments. So here is a little peek inside the connection record. So like how, okay, how many different events which are, uh, which are re related to TCP and uh, uses connection as an uh, uh, argument. So it's like 
If you see a sin packet, Zeek will generate an event, connection attempt, establish, finish. If you see the very first stack, it will generate an event, half finished, partial closed, pending, rejected, reset. So there is all this different. So if you look at TCP as a state machine, every transition across the, that particular state machine would generate a Zeek event. Now there are some which are useful to actually tap into and then there are others which are a nightmare. If you just tap into Zeek SYN packet, you're gonna get millions and millions of events and you will just DOS yourself out. So that is not a smart thing to do. Uh, sometimes you tap into connection event, but most of the time uh, you tap into the right ones, like for example, connection established. So if you tap, tap into connection established, it will let you create a list of all the services because now you know that the TCP connection has been established. There was a full handshake and now uh, this particular service actually is accepting the connections and responding back. It's, uh, like for example, tapping into attempt actually allows us for scan detection. And connection state remove is a good one to know because it gets you an insight into the entirety of that particular connection. How many bytes were transferred? What was the state? What flags were in that particular TCP? Now, uh, a question here can be, like I'm just talking about TCP, what happens to, in case of UDP or ICMP? So in UDP case also, Zeek actually treats UDP like TCP. So UDP has a source port, destination port, Zeek will treat that as a similar to source and destination port in TCP. But instead of like doing a TCP state machine tran uh, transition, Zeek does UDP specific functions like U U UDP request, UDP reply. So there would be, UDP specific events, which you can tap into. Same goes for ICMP. So now this is the theory. Now let's go through the exercise and let's see if I, we can make this a little more simplified than where we are. So here, uh, here you know. so now I am in actually uh, directory zero to exercise exploring events. So if you get there, uh, you will see four directories. There is traces, there is questions, scripts, and find the bug. So let's cat on questions. Okay, so everybody who already are familiar with connection events and all, uh, like how to tap into it, what I would like you to do is actually go and calculate, like do task one, task two, and task three, where uh, you want to calculate the total bytes used by a connection and then uh, uh, what else you can actually do in connection 2.pcan. So answer these questions. So this is for people who already know this stuff and for people who actually want to go ahead to, while uh, I'm gonna just slowly explain certain things in here. So I am now in scripts directory and if you look at it, there are uh, about uh, eight different scripts which we will look at. So the first one is, connection record preview. So what this does is that we recall there are some built-in functions and events and this one is a new connection. So every time Zeek sees a connection, it will fire an event called new connection. And when it fires this event, it actually uh, gives you access to a data structure, a record called connect of type connection. And that is C. So now what we are gonna do is that every time Zeek fires this event, what are the values of in, inside C? And please bear with me, this will hurt eyes a little bit. So Zeek uh, traces zero one, and then you run the script like this. Huh, oh. Okay, let me just explain what happened here so that others don't get surprised. What I did is I said Zeek, and then I said, here is the PCAP and here is the script. The reason this said unrecognized is because Zeek needs to read pcap so you have to say dash r if you don't say dash r it actually considers that actually as a zeek script and tries to parse the script so this should run so if i run this this is basically a dump of connection data structure inside zeek now what you see here is that there is something called id connection id which actually is a record has source IP address, source port, destination IP address, destination port. Then there is an orage 
And then it actually, this is another record which actually measures the size, what is the state, how many packets were in this connection, bytes, what are the flow labels? And then this is actually the L2 address, but this generally is the IP address of the routers or the tabs. So this is for origin, uh, which is source in simplified words. And then this is for response, which is actually uh, the uh, destination. Then it also shows you the start time of this connection, what is the duration, and then there is a history. Now, these are all empty. If you see these fields are empty, it allo allocates a unique connection identifier. And then there are all these uninitialized sub data structures in there. And these are all initialized because we tabbed into new connection event. Zeek does not know anything except that it saw a SYN packet. So if we cat on this thing on con.log, what we can see is that this is an SSH, but there is a full SF, but it just literally saw the first SYN and it actually generated this event. So in first SYN, what it would know is that there is this connection source destination IP ports, et cetera, but nothing more than that. Now, uh, I, I mentioned something called source and destination. Zeek doesn't say source and dest here. What it says is that orig and response. And this idea is because, you know, what is the originator of the connection and the originate definition is more of like who sent to the send packet. And response is who responded to that send packet. So that way, you, you, you get out of this source and destination, you get out of this mindset of service and client, client and server. So generally it goes with origin and it goes with the response that this was the originator of the connection and this is the response coming from the uh, responder. But so uh, now we run this as basically this thing and the above is a dump of internal data structure of connection record. So, so this actually is again, let's go through it, a new connection event. Now we will go to exercise two. And this is now connection state remove. It's exactly same trace, same PCAP. But if I run this one, uh, see now this time you have everything like this has gotten fatter, right? This is same thing. So last time what happened was that we had new connection event. So we had these things populated, fine. But re recall, origin size was zero, state was zero, num packets was zero. But now they are full because this event is connection state remove, which basically means that, you know, Zeke saw sin, synac, ack, then it saw uh, fin, finac, ack. It was the complete connection was done. It was uh, com uh, closed and once Zeke was happy with that connection, it actually logged the line. But connection state remove is the event which happens right before the connection is logged. And it actually now gives us a lot more information. It get, gets us all the bytes in the connection from responder, bytes in connection from the source. It even further goes and like attaches the SSH analyzer uh, with it. And then it says, you know, what kind of uh, things it saw in SSH. So it actually is like, uh, here is the service SSH. Uh, here is all the host keys. Here is what the algorithms were, what were the SSH handshakes. So it actually understood all that. So if you want to tap into the entirety of the connection, connection state remove is good. If you want to just trigger on like, uh, I want to know about every new connection, you tap into it. So based on what connections do you see? Now let's look at the third one, which is actually a hybrid. What this one does is that it actually taps into new connection, connection established and connection state remote. So basically this is like uh, T equals to zero, T equals to five and T equals to 10 in terms of the life cycle of this particular uh, SSS connection. And uh, I just tried to make it like, uh, like make the output more readable because yeah, this thing actually hurts a little bit of ice. But if you see this, like I think uh, uh, I was just looking at my own notes, look at the SSH this on the 10th line onwards, the output, because this is all, uh, which I already talked about, but yeah, this is all basically uh, like 
SSH information inside the connection. Uh, so, but let's run this one for you. So, this is 03. And I make the same, okay, here. So if you run this trace and it's same PCAP, what I showed you first time, the second time and third time. But what I did is instead of just dumping everything on the screen, now we are just looking at the bytes. So the first event was the new connection, then there was connection established and then removed. So when it was new connection, everything is zero. Connection established, now it actually says that there is you know one packet was sent, 64 bytes were there of which like I believe uh, uh, what 40 bytes are IP and then like 24 are uh, TCP, something like that, right? The size of the IP header is 40 bytes to TCP or something on those lines. So, but it has 64 bytes. Uh, there is not much going on the response part, but the connection was established because it's all like SIN, SINAC, ACK. And then here, when the connection is removed, it actually knows that how many bytes the origin sent, how many bytes the responder sent, what, what are, are the total things uh, going on. So, so this actually gets you idea. But if you look at this particular code, what we see is another thing, which is uh, see like so far in 01 exercise and 02 exercise, we just printed C. But if you want to print the uh, values of other parts of the record, then you can use the operator called dollar. So now here, what I said is, you know what? There is another record called origin and another record called response. So I wanted to print that out of the C, the big C record. So it's like C dollar origin. And here, uh, see, so it has C dollar origin. And then this record actually has these particular members in it, which is size, state, bytes. So let's just pick this one. So if I say, go back and edit this file, and I want to see how to access the bytes, I can actually go further down and this. I will get into more details on this one once we actually are in the record, but, oh, I, I put it in the wrong place. But yeah, see the origin IP. So now it only just showing bytes. It doesn't dump the entire record, but only, what I referenced here. So, so the takeaway is that, you know, Zeke has built in events. You should know which events to tap into by, how do you know that you go into uh, base, uh, uh, proto base directory, you search for like going to your pro protocol bucket. Then you actually like, for example, DNS, you go into DNS, base protocols, DNS, grab on event. It will give you a list of all the events or look at the built-in function files. And then based on where you are in event, you can actually, ex Zeek will keep populating the data structures, which are arguments on in those events. And you can actually access those with using a dollar operator as a part of record. So that's the takeaway here. So, but, uh, Uh, so these like one, two, and three actually just gets you a peek inside the connection. Now exercise four is more of a conditional check. So now what I have done in this one is let's walk through this code for a minute. I have a module training. Uh, I am tapping into event connection established. C has entire record of that connection. Now I want to just get the IP address of the orig, origination host or the source. So the way you do it is C reference the ID, which is the connection identifier and then connection identifier has orig edge. Now, how do I even know that what are the parts of the records and where they are? So the one way to do that was Well, what I have done in past, which is actually just dump the variables, the arguments in that event. And then you can look at it is like, this is identifier, this is orig, uh, this is the start time and so on and so forth. And other way to do the same thing is, uh, let me just go here because it's easy here. Uh -huh. So I'm in the base directory, I go into protocols, look at it. So I am in user local Zeek, share Zeek base protocol. Let's go to con. And then if you look at the main.z, here is the record. 
this is the timestamp unique identifier this is connection id which itself is a record of that connection identifier here's protocol service so you look at this thing there is all the description here and this particular record is what you see in the connection con dot log file as well but it has all the description uh, i don't expect you to go remember all this stuff or look at this feel free to ask eventually or in an email as well or explore otherwise i mean the best thing to do is just grab uh, you will see a whole lot of things coming up so but uh, he uh, yeah so so uh, we were looking at the four so here this is how you will actually go and get the value of the origin ip in here this is the how you get the port in variable called service and then uh, recall i mentioned about the variables as well which says like the data type so if the service is equals to port 22 then you can say i found the sss connection if the ip is 8692 then i find this connection and this service so basically what I am doing here is literally tapping into the connection record, extracting the IP address and the service, checking what they are, and then printing an output out of it. So let's just run this one. So it says, you know, found the SSS connection on port 22 found connections from this IP to 22. And if I chat on con.log, this is literally what it's showing. Here is the start time, unique connection identifier. Here is all the service and SSH and whatnot. But what I have shown you folks is a tab before the con log is written and after the network bytes are seen on the wire. So this is how the scripting allows you to actually delve into things a little bit more. So let's see let's look at this one so this is actually again uh, i am tapping into the connection event remove which is at the very end of the tcp reassembler i am tapping into all the different variables so there is like you know i can print the connection record as c con but then i am like you know what here is the ip address which is c uh, connection identifier and then origination host connection identifier respond host then we have a destination port and then there is a service and then what is the connection state so we actually are able to tap into all this and pull those values into this variable and then i say that if the ip is in local nets so this is my set of network subnets so if ip is in local nets then you actually say that here is this output so this is the way you actually tap into these built-in connections to pull things what you want so let's run this one too uh zero five right zero five and let's run this one so it's a it's here so this is c a c dollar con so it actually gave me the entire connection and then it went through the conditional check and told me that you know i attempted an ssh connection to this ip on this port so this ip address so uh, are you folks with me where I'm trying to explain that, you know, there is bytes on the wire to use a policy, a Zeek script as an instrument to translate those bytes, like Zeek already does a translation of these bytes into values. But what you can do is that in terms of security, you translate that into a security awareness thing where you actually are like, you know what, here is this SSH connection, which will happen. Uh, thanks, Kevin. Uh, your uh, uh, comment is great for me as well, because I was actually getting nervous that am I actually uh, like scaring people who are or confusing. It's, it, this is useful to hear. Uh, so let's, let's now I, I'll get ambitious and show one more. Uh, so here is one. Uh, uh, so here is this thing. Like the sixth one is connection attempt versus connection established. So let's just run this one first, and then we can look into it. Zero six, and then you run this code. So what this output shows me is that you know here is new connection, 
now I, I am tapping into the connection unique identifier and what are the connection uh, orage, yeah, orage data only. So here is connection established, here is more stuff, here is this thing. But it actually started counting like what events ran. So the new connection ran one time, established ran, state remove ran. But connection attempt did not run. And why did connection attempt did not run? Because Zeek actually did just not on, did not only see a sin packet, but it after that it saw sin, sin act, act, and so on and so forth. So it understood that this is not an attempted connection, but a full connection, and it saw, saw everything between sin and fin. So that's why this thing is, but like try and investigate. So Okay, so so I actually I, I, I am ahead of myself. What I wanted you to do is actually see in this particular trace, like you know, if we run it with HTTP PCAP, this thing. Let's run this first. I think I already answered the question, but it's still a good illustration. So we run with oh. Yeah, so we run with, uh, where am I? Huh, okay, maybe this is not quite updated. Let's just run it with uh, 07 again and let's go from there. Oh, okay, yeah, so let's look at this first and then Go. So what this one did is like, you know, connection established, found an SSH connection and then say thing. Oh, I, I remember now. Okay, so, so we talked about connection established, connection attempt, connection uh, state remote. Now in this particular example, what we are doing is, let's create our own events and functions. Recall that like there are built-in events, built-in functions, but now we are trying to do my our own. So I created this event called my event and that's of type event. Uh, arguments are IP address and the port. And then I created a function called my function and the argument is just port. So the way I define function is like function, my function, and what does the function return? Function returns a string. And the condition here is that if the port is 22 TCP, return SSH. If it's not 22, return unknown. And the event I created is actually my event, which is off in module training. So I actually do a namespace thing. And then I, for service name, I call my function. So now this is a built-in event which Zeek has. So it says connection established, populates the entire connection record C. Uh, then I check if it's this IP address, if it is this IP address, I say connection established, uh, says found SSH connection and then I actually put the connection identifier. But then I actually call my own event, which is my training my event and then I pass the response IP and the response port. So when I call my event, Zeek actually aligns this event inside the event queue and event queue actually is full of all the events. Like every time Zeek sees a new packet, it creates an event. Every time Zeek sees a new sin, it creates an event. Sin uh, SYNAC, it creates an event. So there is all these events which are getting created, gets added to the queue. My event now, if I actually call with this reserve word event, my event will get added to that queue itself. And then the queue is getting flushed. It will actually call this event, which will call the function, populate it with SSH, and then dump this output. So if we look here, that is what is happening. This is a Zeek built-in event which actually calls my event. And then my event says that, you know, connection was made on this on port S20. Instead of port 22, it says SSH. So, but yeah, this is how the takeaway here is actually, how do you create your own events? How do you call your events inside the Zeek built-in events? And how do you actually integrate functions with it? So, so this is what this particular exercise will show you. And recall back, we talked about scheduling the events. So 
like events is the only thing which we can schedule. Uh, uh, so if we uh, schedule an event uh, 08. So how do you schedule an event? So the way you do it is you actually say schedule and then you put the timestamp, like how long after which it should get scheduled. And then you can call that. So this is, I mean, in the most simplified way, this is the syntax of calling an event, a scheduling an event. Now, when you schedule an event, there is one thing which needs to be kept in mind. Zeek will run in two ways. One of them is running, running on the PCAP and another is running on the wire. So on wire, as long as the, like, like even if no packets are coming on the wire, as long as Zeek process is running, it will keep running. It doesn't exit out. But if you're running Zeek on a PCAP, as soon as the last P, uh, uh, last bytes in the PCAP are done, Zeek actually exists out of the PCAP. So in this case, we are running on the PCAP. So the way you stop Zeek is you actually redefine this built-in variable called exit only after terminate equals to two. So this means that until I put a control C, Zeek will not exit out. And the reason for that is because it will process the PCAP, but the schedule of the event actually happens with the time relative to what the time is in the PCAP. So like Zeek runs, it takes less than microseconds to run through the PCAP and then it schedules it for one second. By that time, the PCAP is over, Zeek will exit out. And if it exits out, I, it will not schedule my event. So this is my artificial way of actually making sure Zeek does not exit out. So let's, let me show you this. Let me show you this. I'm going to say false, Zeek dash R places zero A. Oh, if there is no, uh, yeah, let's just use this. So if I run this, Zeek ran and, oh, this is a long peak. Oh, okay. I, this is interesting. Uh, I did not anticipate or thought about this one, but I think it gets even better. So <laughs> let me tell you how time advances in, uh, Zeek. So Zeek actually, when it sees the PCAP, the very first PCAP, like if I do a TCP dump dash NR. So Zeek sees this timestamps. And when it sees this timestamp, this is T equals to zero for Zeek. And then it actually keeps moving forward in this particular time. And the concept inside Zeek is network time. So it actually, the clock, Zeek's clock cycle moves with the network time. And then there is a current time, which is actually the time of the uh, operating system or the host, which is running it. But Zeek moves with network time. So every time the new packet comes in, it moves forward in the time, assuming that your network card actually manages the time properly and all sorts of things. So in this particular case, if you see my event ran one, two, three, four, five times, the reason for that is because it was scheduled for running every second. And it actually saw like seven, uh, nine, 11. So it's, it's like every, what, two seconds we see packets. So that's why it just keeps running every second and so on and so forth. But uh, uh, zero, eight, if I do this, and if I run Zeek, So, so now my event is running one time, two time, three time until I cash, uh, uh, I, I, I stop it. And if I just run this, so this is how long Zeke took to just go through the code, run, boom, bang, done. So, this is how you actually schedule the events out. You actually say the times. And in this particular case, I just said, you know what? Uh, in Zeek init, call this event. And then this event actually schedules itself every one second. But uh, uh, let's take another little break. And uh, any questions so far? Yes. Why would one use schedule? So let me just think about it. Like where, where have I used schedule before?
Yeah. So, uh, one example of schedule is like, let's say you want a summary of all the connections which have happened in last hour. So you can schedule uh, with a timer of one hour an event which actually goes through like your data structures or tables or sets, gets a summary and dumps it every hour for you. So that would be one way to do it. Other places I have scheduled is like, you know, one thing I can just remember directly is we have an end-to-end -end check running at Berkeley Lab. What that does is that it actually checks if the border DMZ blocking is working or not working properly. So when somebody scans LBNL, we find the scanner with Zeek and then we actually block them so that they cannot scan us anymore. Uh, is this capability working or not? So we actually have an end-to-end check which schedules itself every half an hour to make sure that the blocking and unblocking is working or not uh, inside the Zeek subsystem. Uh, other places you schedule events is actually, let's say you have a file which you need to read uh, every now and then. So you can schedule and then you can call input framework to read that file. Uh, and let me think of other places where I have used schedule quite a few times, but most of the time it has been generally for reading some values. And then once I have collected all that information, then schedule an event to do something. For example, here, Kevin, you send me an email and that email actually says, hi, Ashish, how are you? And then you send me another email and it's like, uh, uh, hi, Ashish, uh, you didn't respond to my first email. So what I do, is that I actually just read, like I make Zeke look at every email which Kevin sends to Ashish. And then I can schedule a summary of like how many emails did he send me all day and how, what all actually was the keywords in them, something on those lines. So, but we have another four minutes actually if there are other questions uh, and uh, I, I, otherwise people can have a bio break or a break, drink water. Uh, relax, take a breath. And folks who actually uh, feel a bit adventurous, I would really love you to do like these exercises. Calculate and print totem bytes in http.pcap. And then this will actually make you look into the HTTP events. So we looked into the con events, but now you should look into the HTTP events. And I think uh, in Keith and Fatima's training, uh, uh, good question, Brian. So uh, it sounds like it could risk getting messy if you schedule in a cluster setup. Yes, because uh, what will happen is that you schedule something, cluster actually is a divide and conquer approach where the bytes are going to different workers. So ideally, you know, I, what I have done is that I actually create an event from workers to manager and then schedule an event on manager. That way all the workers report, uh, I actually aggregate those uh, uh, values in the manager. And then basically, uh, let me see if I can sh show that one. Uh, No, I, actually, I might not be able to show on the fly, but let me see. But yeah, in this case, the cluster actually, uh, the best way to do it is have workers go and uh, report to manager. Manager aggregates that data and schedules some, something on there. So, so that's uh, one way. Uh, what was I... Yeah, so if you go and look into this one, uh, the fun would be to actually look at HTTP PCAP and then actually tap into the right events for HTTP. And uh, I think Keith and uh, Fatima's talk, somebody actually did ask this question. What is the difference between orange bytes and orange IP bytes? So you should actually paste those outputs out, see what numbers do you see? So one of them is actually based more on uh, TCP uh, sequence and acknowledgement number, and it Zeek tries to get guess the bytes based on how TCP protocol works. Whereas the other one is actually the bytes in the uh, IP headers. So, and then uh, it just goes on to like 
compare history connection fields for both so this is a little more advanced but you know you will definitely like uh, to learn out of these extra credits too so i am not going to go into this because i think uh, uh, i am i am doing pretty slow actually here uh, what do people think about the pace should i speed up okay let's let's just keep it this way no no let's just keep it this way i, I have no hurries to finish the slide there uh, i'll rather have everybody like learn something and walk away even if we do two slides today so let's just keep it this way uh, while we are into the break still uh, this was my ambition part where it was like you know what let's develop a new heuristic while doing the talk and but i am not even going to attempt this but if anybody is interested in like if you go into the directory exercise exploring event what this particular heuristic does is it actually makes you tap into dns analyzer so what you can do is you can come into this directory uh, ls and then you can look at this thing which is called <coughs> dns.z and what this one does is that you know it's module dns it actually taps into a built in event called log dns which actually has the entire record of that particular dns request and then it actually just prints that record remember we did the same thing with event connection established connection rip state remove we do the same thing here so z dash r traces dns and so this actually just dumps the dns record that's all it does but now we are actually beyond the ip layer we are beyond like connection layer now we are actually into the protocol level so so this is just simple and let's see what 11 does yeah so the question here is that you know uh, print and examine dns record if the destination ip is part of this subnet so if you can do that this is basically the exercise here so i actually find the right dns event then i actually say that what is the local network here is the network if uh, uh, ip is not in that uh, network return if it is in the same uh, subnet basically print that record that's all this does so if you are interested you can follow this one as well but let's go it's 3 o'clock let's go uh, and do chapter 3 now chapter 3 is uh, co complicated but very important for anything you doing with zeek scripting if you can master chapter 3 you will be writing scripts left right and center and you will be writing some uh, heuristics which you will amaze yourself with and the thing here is uh, you cannot write zeek scripts without uh, using this sets and containers container type sets tables and vectors and so on and so forth so these are very very fundamental to zeek scripting what i am doing here is that uh, next seven slides basically is introduce you to what sets and tables are what their use cases are then what is the richness like how powerful they can get and this is where things get confusing for a bunch of people so if you don't understand uh, fear not either ask or bear with me i would rather prefer you ask i think it gets little confusing when we are talking about expired functions and stuff but then we'll go through the exercise and i can actually walk you through a few of them myself and let others actually try it out too but yes i know it's 3 o'clock i know it's long it's dense i accept all that pay a little more attention if you can so so there are four container types inside zeek one of them is a set uh, another is a table then there is a vector and then there is a record so the set is actually uh, used to store unique elements of same data type so let's say you have a set of ip addresses now 
unique is that you know let's say the set of ip addresses is like 1.1.1.1 2 3 4 5 and now the same uh, ip address appears again 1.1.1 it will still be just one value inside the sake it's unique table is an associative array literally like uh, you know you can have a table or, uh, add of uh, index address of type uh, of uh, count of a set of a more complex record then there are vectors and i think the vector are pretty much arrays but uh, the person who i find is like stellar expert in vectors anthony kaza uh, if you have a vector thing you should like he has done stuff with vectors which are way beyond uh, actually me but uh, yeah vectors is pretty much the arrays like that's the way you should uh, uh, see like you know here is the vector of all the time stamps for this particular ip address um, or he is a vector of uh, uh, services so something on those lines and then there is record where you create your own unique data structure which is not provided by zeek but you think that you know what i need a record or a data structure to store this particular things which are of my need so let's let's see this will make it much easier so like for example set so set you can use sets to represent networks for example you know there is local nets you can actually create something called never drop nets like if here are these subnets do not ever block on them you can say here are my live networks here are my dark nets here are my uh, subnets uh, or the ip addresses which i have to scan machines on them because if you have a vulnerability scanning program going on you don't want zeek to alert on everything your vulnerability team is doing so you can actually create sets and tables for some things like that you can even go further down and actually do much more better encapsulation like for example you know you create a table of type string of set subnets and then you can say you know what building 11 has these subnets building 12 has these subnets building 13 has these subnets so now you have a table of all the buildings and what all subnets are in those buildings so that way like you know you have a border zeek running and you see something and then you're like ha huh, why is this traffic going to building 11 and then you actually get somebody in building 11 to go and look into it so you can do like a very uh, amazing kind of mapping of physical world with uh, network world here too or you can do things like whitelist ignore these ports ignore these services here are my institutional sets of dns servers mail servers so table sets actually allow you for them so now sets how do you uh, use them so the set is connection of unique elements so like if you see on the right side of the screen like i created a set called a set which is a set of addresses and now you actually have these values in there and then you can do a membership test as well like is this ip in set yes that ip is in this set and then it's a unique element so uh, like even if you add like something 20 times like the cardinality of the set is not going to change uh, but if you add 20 unique things then yes cardinality will become 20 so at cardinality by mean that i mean number of elements in the set unique elements means but set is unordered so that's also important so let's say you say that you know i am going to create a set of time and then you start like adding all the time stamps in there and then you expect that they will be in the order or uh, no you said create a set of ip addresses and then you actually start adding those source ip addresses and think that they are getting in the order of connections no every time you print a set for example if you look in right side again with a slight purple background box every time you print set it will actually print it in different manner so set is just a membership check it's not uh, uh, actually uh, an order test an order thing for order you end up using vectors so and the way you do membership uh, test is using a uh, keyword in so is 22 tcp in allowed services so this is how you actually do a test of membership in a set now to add a value you actually use keyword add and then so like let's say host host is actually a set of addresses i need to add an ip to the host so i can just say add ip to host if you want to delete you just use delete and then same thing now set actually allows you some very powerful things for example you can do intersection of the set union of the set difference of the set 
So, and where do we use certain things like this? Well, what IP addresses overlap in building 11 and building 13? So you can actually do certain things or you say, you know what, physics, physics department spans over building 11 through 13. So I'm going to do a union of this and create something called physics. Uh, physics department equals to set one, set two, set three. And now you actually have a physics department basically is three buildings and now you actually, so you can do certain things like that. Uh, now, uh, what happens if we delete a value which is not present in the set? Actually, nothing happens. Uh, I think I when I was creating the slide deck, it was late in the night. So uh, I tried to be, be funny. It's not funny, but I didn't delete this one. But yeah, nothing happens if you try to delete something out of the set. If it doesn't, is not there, it's not there. So, so it's a pretty robust data structure. I think that's the takeaway. Now, what tables do is that you define a table with what kind of uh, index the table has. And then what's the type of the table you want to create? So for example, you create a table called peers, which is a table of all the addresses and then the count. So what this does is that it actually like, you know, let's say you want to count how many uh, connections does a remote IP make to your network. So you're just counting connections, how many times those connections happen. So every time a remote IP connects to you, you actually increment the count here. And this way you will actually have a list of, you will have a table of all the unique IP addresses and how many times they have connected to your network. And that actually is a very elementary scan detection. So you can say, oh, why is 1.1.1.2 connected 432 times and 1.1.1.3 connected 67,000 times. So you can do something like that, but table is a handy container data structure, which will allow you to do this right there. Now you can expand the table in functionalities by doing something like create expire, what's the expire function and what's the backend, where the table is stored. So what this does, so these are like extra uh, parameters for lack of better word, uh, you can actually put along with the table declaration. So this will say is, you know what, every time a new value gets created to the table, expire it in one hour so that your table doesn't grow forever. Otherwise, let's say the example I gave you remote IP addresses connecting to us. Now, if Z runs for a year, your table is going to have probably like a million IP addresses. You don't want that. You are like, I'm fine with expiring certain values if they don't uh, show up again or if the purpose is solved. So you can do is like, you know, you can create uh, exp expiration timer and then you can say every time a value gets created, run this timer. When it expires, it will actually fire a function called expire function. And this way you can actually say, you know what, this value got added to the table after an hour it expired. And when it expired, let me run a summary uh, analysis. And then you run, uh, like you run this expire function, you do your things in there. Either you extend the value or you expire it and then run it. So, and here is the more elaboration on like, uh, what is the expire function? It's called right before the element expires. Uh, and I think the best is to actually go and read this thing too. So, but uh, let, let, let's not get complicated here. Let's just tell you that table is a associative array where there is an index and then there is a type of uh, record or data structure you can use there. This one is the most simplified model of having a count. So now let's go here. So when I was talking about expiration, you can do four different things. One of them is create expire, which basically means expire the value in the table once it's created. So the time starts the moment the value is added to the table, the index entry. Read expire actually changes the setup where it's like, you know what, you are uh, checking the table. So you say is 1.1.1 in the table. If you do this check, that was a read of the value in the table. And if you do that, that will re reset the counter back to zero. But where would you use this? So like, let's say you have a table of IP addresses and this IP has not even connected to you for three days. So there was no check which actually 
was done on the table. So you want to expire this and you can say, this IP last connected to me three days ago. So that is the one way of doing it. So you can do expirations on create, you can do expirations on read. Then there's write expiration, which actually is how often the values gets written to the table. So let's say we have a table of addresses of count. So every time same IP address comes, we increment the count. So if the count gets incremented, that is considered as write. And if that is a write, then you know until uh, the value does not uh, does not get appended or written again, that's when the timer will expire and it will go. So I know this is more than you asked for. That's why I put the URL. You should go and read this documentation. This will actually talk a lot about read expires, write expires, and create expire. But you know, like for example, create expires given amount of time since it has been inserted into the container regardless of reads and writes. This one is expires amount of time, the last time it has was written. And same goes for on change. On change is basically, is the value gets manipulated, then you actually fire this event. Uh, most of the time, I generally end up with these three, create expire, read expire, and write expire. But let's make it a little simpler so that it makes sense to you. So let's say I have a table, uh, I have a table called distinct peers, which is actually a remote IP connecting to all the IP addresses in my network. So how many distinct IPs did a remote IP connect to? And let's say we give an expiration of three days by defining create expires three days. And once it expires, it actually calls this function called expire distinct peers. So what will happen is a remote IP, let's say IP.1, connected to 15 IP addresses in the lab or your network. So the set will contain 15 unique IP addresses. Let's say of those 15, it connected to one IP 20 times and another IP just one time. Doesn't matter. Remember, set only stores unique values. It does not store the number of times. So it will just still have 15 elements in there, even though the connections were uh, uh, 20 plus 14, 34 connections, but it will still show you 15 unique element IP addresses here. And then it expires, once it expires, it calls this expire function. The way expire function is formed is actually what kind of table was it? So it's, it's this thing is literally the same definition of table here. So it's a table uh, of index address of type set of addresses. And then what was the index? So you actually define the expire function this way. So let's say there was a table of type address comma address. So the expire function will be have table address comma address and index would be address comma address. And expire function generally returns a value of interval, which basically means if you don't return anything, it will return zero and expires the value. But in this case, I'm saying that, you know, if the IP is 1.1, just extend its life, don't expire it anymore. So while I'm showing examples of table, uh, yeah, so this I'm showing you in table, but yes, this is a good, I'm happy to put this note here that, you know, expire functions work just the same for tables as they work for sets too. So this is theory, maybe you are with me, maybe not, but let's go through the exercise and I'll explain a lot more and it will make uh, a lot better idea here. So uh, I will say just look at the uh, zero zero uh, valid invalid sets and then basically just look at this script and see if you, it makes sense to you before I start actually going through other exercises. And let's uh, spend like 10 minutes on here till like 3.30. Yes, Brian, depends on what is the expire function. If the expire is create expire, is it read expire or is it write expire? So uh -huh. if you say that, you know, you reapply it with a write expire, then it will get refreshed because, you know, the values get written into the table. But if you just said create expire, and then uh, create expire IP address of count and you increase the count, 
doesn't matter because even the count goes from five to seven to 15, the creation time is the timer for that value in the table and it will expire after one hour if the create expire was one hour. So that's where you have to be careful if you are doing a create expire, read expire or write expire because the values get applied differently across these expirations. So read expire would be like if you did a membership test that is counts as read and that would just reset the counter back for expiration, that expiration timer back to zero. So uh, folks who actually are advanced or understands this stuff, I would say that, you know, if you are familiar with tables and sets, you should actually attempt these things. Like for each remote IP, how many unique ports do you see? Each remote IP, how many unique destinations do you see? Uh, then you can expire to get counts every hour. And then there is like do stuff in extra credits of like calculate how many bytes do you see? for each destination port and how many bytes do you see for each IP and destination port. So that, like there are all these different things. So if you want to do this and like the material I have covered would allow you to actually be able to answer these questions. But these are like extra extra credits and a little advanced stuff. Uh, let's go to the scripts. So this one basically just literally does is shows you set operations. Uh, so I'm going to keep quiet and take a break myself, let people read it for a few minutes, like at least like two minutes, then we, I start talking again. Okay, so <clears throat> let's let's go through this one, the zero zero. This literally is a, a theoretical exercise to show all the set operations. Like you know, uh, are sets equal? Uh, what is the union of the set? What is the intersection of the set? What is the difference of the set? And then recall long ago we did talk about local A, we did not even define what type it is. And then here, so that becomes a set of IP addresses. And then this is the membership check is 1.1 in one a new. If yes, print this way, uh, same thing, print this way. And then 
the membership test. So when you run these things here, this is the kind of output you're gonna get. And then same goes for that addition subtraction. So here is, uh, in this exercise, we have following two sets. One is the set of ports and remote host is the set of IP addresses. So we store, oh, Z dash R traces zero one. If we run this, it actually says, you know, unique services are seen are three, unique IPs are seen are 56. And if I look at this, uh, what it does is that I, I, I just want to know how many unique IP addresses I have uh, talked with us and how many unique services. So I tap into just new connection event. I pull origin IP, I pull service, and then I create, uh, actually I create uh, two variables, services, which is a set of port and remote host, which is set of addresses. And now remember, these are not exported. So they are global only in training module. So they cannot be quite accessed from another module. So let's say you have a module called DNS or training two, it cannot to do, in order to do that, you have to put it inside export. In this case, I did not need it, so I did not do it, but you have two sets. If service is not in the set of services, then you add service into the set of services. If IP is not in remote host, you add it to. And in event Zeek done, what I am doing is that I am part, traversing through the, all the members of the set and going through each service and then print the service, doing the same thing for host. And then the way you do the cardinality or the membership count is actually by putting it in between two pipes. So now this will actually not give you all the elements of the services, but the number of unique elements in the services. And that's the output you see here that the unique remote IP seen is 56, unique services seen as three, but here is the dump of all the elements of the set. So hope that makes a bit sense. So what I am doing is I'm actually dumping all the unique services and then all the unique IP addresses, which are seen remote and then the counts, which is the membership. So, uh, Let's look at, uh, so these are all the set of operators in tables. Let's look at tables. Actually, this would be a better one. Uh, so in this case, what I did is remember in last time I had a services, which was a set of ports and host, which was a set of addresses. So I changed that now to actually have a table of index port of count. So now for every port, it will act, we will have a count of how many connections were to that particular port. And same is for how many connections we had to a particular remote from a remote IP addresses. We do the same thing again. We tap into new connection and we pull the variables out of the connection record uh, values. And then we do a membership test. Same thing what we did in table. Uh, so set is service in services? No. So in this case, because it's actually a service of type count, we have to initialize. So we initialize by saying services now has a service. So let's say 22 uh, TCP. Is 22 TCP in services? No. So services 22 TCP equals to zero. And then we increment the count here, plus one. And same thing we do here. So this, if I run this one, it actually does this that you know the unique services seen were seen were three, unique IP seen were 56, which is what we saw in the last run. But now we know that port 22 was seen 30 times, 23 was seen 30 times, port 45 was seen four times, and this unique IP address was seen four times. And if I do a less on con.log, this is what we'll see in the con.log. That you know what? Uh, here is this thing, right? All the services, uh, here is this IP addresses. So traditionally what you do is this thing, of dash F and dollar six, which is the service. So you see the dollar six and then you say sort unique dash C and then you see this thing. So what I have done in this spe specific script 
is just take these bash commands and translate it into Z code. So now we know that port 22 was 30 times, 23 was 30 times, and 445 was four times. So let's just look at this again for simplicity purpose. I created a table, how many counts for port, how many counts for addresses, do a membership test. If not existing, initialize it. If it exists, no need to initialize, it actually goes here. Now, you can skip this part by actually doing something like this, where it's like default zero. So if you do a default zero, you don't even have to do a membership test to initialize. But it's a nice thing to do because when the, this gets complicated, like a table address of type, custom type, then you actually either do a default initialization or you just do initialization. So it gets, when your tables get complicated, initialization helps a lot here. So it's a good habit to actually do it this way. So let's look at uh, distinct peer services. So this one is same thing, but what I am doing this time is that, you know, what, remote IP addresses was doing service. So I am doing more of a unique IP and the port count. So because we don't know yet that, you know, when we saw port 22 has 30 connections, like what IP had those 30 connections. So, and then I'm looking at distinct peers, like, you know, how many uh, distinct destination IPs did a, uh, did a, a, a specific remote IP touch talk to? So how many distinct peers a remote IP ad address had? Same thing again, we pull the variable values out of this connection record. This is built-in function. Zeek auto populates it for you, gives you everything handy. You test the membership. Previously, we were just testing the service. Now we are testing the response and service because that is the index we have here. Initialize them, increment the value. Same thing goes here. But now you see the difference. Oh. So now what you see is that unique services seen over 18, unique remote IP is this. But the cleaner version is that, you know, this particular IP connected to the 18 host and here are those 18 hosts. So another way to see this is I grab this on con.log and here are those 18 hosts. Uh, a good extra credit would be like, you know, of these 18 hosts, what services were they connected to? So you can actually create another table, which is like source IP address, address port. And then you can actually just increment the counter there and you will actually have a breakdown of all the three things together. So, but yeah, let me show you an expire function demo. How does this work? So I said, you know, the create expire is gonna be 10 hours. And so once the value gets added to this, after 10 hours, just expire them. Doesn't matter reads or writes happening. And I call the expire function expire distinct peer, which is this function here. The arguments to all expire functions will always be what kind of table it is and what is the index. So if you have a more complicated table, which is a table address address port, this will become table address address port. So basically this thing. And then expire function will always return an interval, either a zero second or another arbitrary value you have. Now, in this case, we did the same thing. We, in an event new connection, we just initialized it, added values, done but expire function will kick in after 10 hours. So after every 10 hours, it will actually give you these numbers. So let's run this thing. So here it literally says your process is not frozen. And the reason for that is because remember, I have a read if uh, exit only after terminate as true. So this thing is true. That's why Zeek will continue and the expire function happens here. So let me run this again, this. So now uh, it still shows me everything, but
but my output actually is coming from the expire function. My output is not coming from Zeek done. So this is one of the ways you can actually add values to the table, uh, generate a summary as you see fit and expire it after a certain amount of time. Now, you may not uh, be with me, but the takeaway here is that, you know, if you look at this code, you will know how to write an expire function, how to use it. If nothing, just have that as a takeaway. But uh, the th fun part is like, you know what? I can actually go even further. So let's just do this. Uh, let's do eight. And I'll explain eight a uh, little slowly as well. Uh, so let's run this thing. So it runs, but uh, it's not displaying anything. And that the reason for that is because uh, uh, it's exit out of terminal. Oh, okay, so so it's uh, read if as exit only after terminate. So I had to press control C. So if you run this thing, press control C, it will dump output after seeing a termination signal. But it says that, you know, this host is listing on port this, this, and this. And it says, why, like, have you looked at HTTP log? So I'm like, oh, okay, let's look at the HTTP log, but let's not look at it first. First look at, uh, yeah, so this one is identify all the services per host. So this is a table of address of set port. It comes in here, you populate the services and then event Zeek done, actually it just prints everything out. So in this case, uh, the print was, that you know, the services running on this are these three services. And now how do I know that these are the services running when the con log is like this crazy, like how many unique lines are there in the con log? So the con log has 3,768 lines, but it says that, you know, it ran three services. So how does it know that these three services were running? So we see all the services, but note, this is all sin. Right? But somewhere, there is OTH and SF. So uh, if you note, I tabbed into connection establish. And connection establish is an event which will give you in already Zeke knows that, you know, there was a full sin, synac, ack, that's when this event will fire. So of 3,768, there were three events which actually were full TCP connection. And that's when this fired and it actually weeded out rest of the nonsense sin scans, but only gave you the right information here. That, you know, this machine was listening really on these only and not other garbage, which was just uh, uh, scan or probes going on. So, so uh, look at these stuff again and find the bugs is a good part to learn in this one as well. Uh, I wish I would do it, but you know, we have another like what, uh, do you guys want me to do find the bugs on this one and elaborate or uh, we can go further down and I'll explain certain more things. Uh, I my like my big win is if we have, we are able to just be able to generate notices. So let me know, meanwhile, I'll continue. So here is the deal. What I showed you so far has been Zeek scripts, but uh, ultimately it just comes down to let's translate security into the code. Like, you know, the security is like, I would like to track how many connections does a remote IP address make. So that is the security. Now it translates to code as like, you know, table scanner of unique IP addresses, unique connections and IP address makes. So the IP address is here, it becomes index and how count is actually how many. So this becomes a, basically a, like Zeek script of a security question. Like how many times two hosts have talked with each other in last one hour. So now that's a good security question. So what you do is you say, 
chatty or distinct peers. And then you can say, you know, here is source and destination IP addresses and how many times they have talked. And because it's past one hour, you say create expire of one hour. Every time the new record gets created, the timer actually expires in an hour. In expire function, you can actually go and say, uh, dump this output. And now you know how many times these two hosts have talked in last one hour. But it also matters which particular event you want to tap into. So you just want to know they have connected to each one, each other connection attempt is a good one uh, or a new connection. Or if you think that you only want to talk, you want to know about meaningful connections where the data has been transferred, then you actually go with connection established. So depending on what particular state of TCP you want to know about. So the third one is like, can you build all the services which are running on all the hosts in the network? And like this now actually translates more to security philosophy than even security question. It's like know your network. So, and by know your network, you want to know all the services running on all the hosts inside your network. It, it's literally this simple when it comes to Zeek script, you say, you know, host profile table address, which is going to be the response or the destination address of set port and tap it into connection establish. And if you do that, it will actually build you the list of all the IP addresses which have established the connections to a given service on that, uh, the destination or on, on a server inside your network. So, so this way, if you dump this table, you will know all the services running inside your network. So, so this is this is how you will translate security into the code. So you think about the next question you have, think about what data structure you want to use and then think about what event you want to tap into. So right now we, we are just talking at IP layer of like connection event. You can get into like, I want to know all the DNS servers in my network. Like even if somebody is running a rogue DNS server, you can actually do this, but instead of tapping into connection established, tap into DNS event. And then you will have all the IP addresses which actually have DNS running on standard, non-standard port, authorized, unauthorized, and so on and so forth. So, and now this is again like developing the new heuristic. Let's not go into this one. If I have cycles at the end, I will just walk through all of this together. Now, this is a little, any questions so far? Okay, so let's go to chapter four. This should be a simpler chapter actually. In this, we, we have like four slides to cover in theory and then we'll just run some more exercises. Uh, if you want to go run the exercise, you can too or look into them as well. But uh, what are records? How, how do you access the records? How records can be used? And then certain exercises. So record is a, actually a custom data type. In C, it's actually a structure uh, in C++, you can call it a class in loose sense, actually, but yes. So the way, and then record is actually, a, you know, your own defined data type. It's a user defined data type, and it allows you to build a lot of different uh, heuristics in a much more elegant manner. So in this particular example, what we are doing is we created a record called connection info. So the way you do it is the syntax is actually literally you say, this is a new data type, put the name for that type, it's a record, and then what are the members of that record? So we said, you know what, I want to create a record called connection info with start time, end time, how many host, and because it's a set, it's going to be unique host, and what is the connection count? So basically, we are creating, we are actually now recording how a given remote IP address, when did it start touching our network? When did it end touching our network? How many unique hosts did it touch? And how many unique connections did it make? And if I say a word, it will make more sense to you, scan detection, right? When did this IP start scanning us? When did it end? How many did it, uh, host it touched and how many connections because sometimes they touch only one host uh, sometimes they touch one host 100 times 
so the numbers will be different and so the way you will end up doing this is global con it's a table of remote ip address of type connection info and connection info is this record here and to access the member of record remember long ago i showed you that c is a connection record and it has member of like connection id type so you use dollar to actually reference it and then if this id has further records a record of record you use a dollar to reference it as well so and then sometimes there is uninitialized record long back when i dumped the connection record uh, in new connection event if you recall there were a lot of uninitialized uh, variables so if it's uninitialized the way you check initialize or uninitialize is by putting a question mark in front of the reference to the record so if it's initialized if the value is set for this value uh, start time it will be true otherwise it's a false so this is how you will actually know if the record is initialized or not how you will know it soon so basically this is stolen from the tutorial sorry manual zeek manual if you want to access the fields in record you use a dollar sign if you want to know if the field value exists you use a question mark and a dollar and this is a boolean value so it turns out to be a true or a false here are certain examples so the connection record c actually has smtp and then is mail from set up in smtp or not so for that you just do a check like this is refresh set up in http or not you do a set like this so but here is the one i am talking about so you you create a log here is a remote ip it was blacklisted how many days was it seen uh what was the first time seen what was the last time seen how what when was it last active how many hosts did it connected to how many total connections did it make and then because this is blacklist it's actually the source of this blacklist was tor so these were all tor ip addresses so the way i created a record here is that you know connection stats is a record what was the start time default is supposed to be zero and it's of type time same thing end time is type time default is zero and then let's not go into opaque for now but i there is a data structure called opaque of cardinality and this is a probabilistic data structure so this allows you to replace sets and actually do a much better uh, uh memory management but let's not get in this one let's go this way so uh, instead of calling it opaque of cardinality you just call this a set of addresses and connection count is count so this is how you will end up actually seeing how many uh start time and times what how long it has been active when was it last active how long it has since been last active and how many connections and hosts did it talk to so so this is how you do records uh, we'll go through the exercise and when we do the exercise i'll literally talk about all the things i actually just mentioned here and uh, those who want to go further they can actually go through creating this this on their own otherwise let's just look at this so the question is you know you can go through this things like how many of uh, can you keep a track of start and the end time of each ip pair that's the big task we have and then how many of those ips attempted a connection what was the unique remote ip addresses and so on so forth so you like if you understand records you can try something like this and then the real extra credit here is that can you do it at a scale like the example i showed you was a tor generally like 2000 ip addresses but can you do with a blacklist which has 10 million ip addresses 100 million ip addresses and that's when it really the rubber hits the road so and actually one of the take away here is that you know when you are writing zeek scripts write them with scale in mind don't write them like you know what i have uh, 3000 things in the record and that's what it will be think about like what if my particular script can my script handle a million records can it handle uh, like 5 million entries in this data structure 
And that's how you should design things. In this one, let's go through. So, oh, this one is easy. So this one is just one file which has actually records. So let's walk through this thing. Of course, we have a module called training and then I'm exporting. And when I export this type, I can actually use this in other scripts as well, which we don't need to. But you create your own connection record. So you have a type connection info, which is of record type. There is start time, there is end time, there is connection count, and then there is host, which is set of addresses. And then I create a table called stats, which is table of index addresses of record connection info. So if I run this thing, So you can see in this dumb below, you can see the contents of stats table. So this was our record, right? So when I try to do, so here's the unique IP. It actually has a start time of this thing, end time of this thing, total connection counts were 31. And then I literally dumped the entire uh, set of IP addresses. So now this is not elegant, but this actually is the most coarse way of looking at this thing. So when you, this particular, so what I did was I dumped the values of stats table. And when you see this, this is how stats table looks in the memory. There's an index and then the index has, is a table of uh, connection ID. So start time, end time, and then all the sets. So, so now I think what I say is, uh, Try to pin, print individual members of the record and you can use the dollar operator. So how do you do it? Like, can anybody answer that on Slack? If I want to print the individual members of this host record, how would I end up doing that? So basically use dollar operator and then, yes, using the dollar operator. And then you actually just go through a, a for loop. So uh, what I did is like for I in stats and then I print stats I. So let's just do it. Let's just modify it for everybody's sake. Uh, ID origin, no, but, but no, no, no. In this case, C. Uh, what we are doing is we are using table stats and stats has origin host, which actually is a uh, <clears throat> set itself. So, you know, for all the entries in table stats, I, instead of printing this, what I will do is for IP in stats, I, which is a host print, I stats Let's see if I can do it in front of everybody and do it right. And because this is multiple things, so you just add two more person S. Otherwise we'll debug it. Okay, uh, syntax error, redef at end of file. So let's just go. Oh. Bug here is that I put everything in a, I didn't close the parenthesis like this for loop. Okay, here. So what it did is this actually went through host, every value of the host, it iterated through it. And then it actually print, this is the IP address, like record I, start time, end time, and then what are the elements values in the host. 
So it actually went through uh, the table and then it will print the value. Exactly, yes. So this is what I did. I actually went, I put another for loop and this. Okay, uh, 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 experienced advice. <laughs> you know, try to avoid for loops inside Zeek. So this is nice for illustration purpose of like dumping in Zeek done event, but try like if you're putting a new connection event, try to avoid, try to write scripts without for loops. It's possible. If you ever find yourself writing something with a for loop inside a Zeek event, think twice or send me an email, ashish at lbl.gov, uh, but uh, try to avoid that. It's nice as an illustration. So, uh, but oh yeah, it's like, see, when we are developing this U U DNS heuristic, same thing is like, you know, DNS pointer queries are types like, you know, zero, one, two, three, four, five. These are different kinds. So you create a record and now you actually say, you know what, here is this different things in this record. But uh, don't worry, I'll go through this at the end. Like at 420, I will walk through this entire thing. So now, uh, so this was so far, we have been pretty much stuck uh, with connection uh, log and everything inside connection. So we used sets, tables, records, uh, we use data types, but uh, all our examples have so far only been limited to uh, parsing the connection record with an assumption that, you know, you can do the same thing in HTTP, you can do the same thing in DNS, SMTP, SSL, and so on and so forth. So if you understand this part so far, it's just changes what particular uh, analyzer you are dealing with later on. Now we, let's spend some time actually like 10, 15 minutes looking at extended logging. No, maybe five, seven minutes and then uh, looking at the notice framework. So the logging framework actually is uh, another powerful tool. Yes, uh, there are other common pitfalls, like definitely don't use for loop, but uh, the, uh, the other common pitfalls generally comes into picture. Uh, Brian, you already mentioned one of them, which was a cluster. So when you're writing heuristics, make sure that they actually are clusterized or at least uh, uh, localized in a manner that it doesn't create a mess. So that's another common pitfall. People don't think of it from the clustering point of view. And I will, I, I have a few slides letter in the deck, which actually uh, make you think in that manner. Then there is another common pitfall, uh, which actually is like, you know, try to minimize the number of uh, uh, execution paths or steps inside your Zeek script. If you don't need something, don't process it. And I will illustrate that too. But uh, let's look at logging and I will answer you. I, I'm gonna keep this question in mind and answer it. I have a very good section to do that actually. Uh, so in logging framework, what Zeek allow, allows you to do is like you see the log. So we did talk about uh, uh, network bytes and connection log. And we talked about uh, most of the like tapping into the connection record we talked about is much closer to the network than to logging. But when we talk about logging framework, it actually is like we can tap into the things right before the uh, information is logged in the file or a little further than that, as well as you can create your own logging. So the way logging framework works is actually, you know, you should just look at this page, read this thing. This will actually explain it in thousand times better than I would ever be able to explain. So I, I put a handy URL here, but a log actually is basically there are log streams on those log streams, you can actually put filters and like the filters, the concept of the filter was generally that, you know what? <clears throat> I just want to log source IP. I don't want to log destination IP addresses. I want to log uh, uh -huh, only this part of the network, but not other part of network. And sometimes these are actually policy decisions. For example, Europe has a different way of uh, saying what you can log and you can not. US has a different way of. Uh, my lab has a different way of logging certain things. So there are filters put in place for that. I generally end up using filters more uh, on things which are just too verbose logging. Uh, I remember a university used to have a undernet IRC servers uh, on their campus. And it's like, 
I don't want to log these billion connections to internet. Other times it's like, you know, your uh, name server is actually part of certain configuration file, which uh, Apache distributed to rest of the world. And now you don't want to log those. So you can do certain filterings like that. And then there are custom log files too, like where you create a new heuristic, a new analyzer. So you want to have your own custom log file. Won't it be pretty cool to have your own log, uh, which logs your own things? And then there are certain log separations and policy compliance. So the way you extend logging, for example, is basically you, so like the connection record, actually connection has a, connection log, which we see here, like this thing. So this is a connection record and all the values of this record are actually these fields here. Now, let's say you want to actually put something after this, let's say country code or GOIP was one of the things which Keith and Fatima's uh, session actually mentioned. So you want to extend this further. So what you do is that, you know, uh, in this case, the example is like, is this a private IP address or is it not a private IP address? So you can actually extend the connection info record, which is this thing and just say is private. And then that would be a true or false. So the way you do it is you say plus equals to, remember long ago, I talked about redef. If you don't say plus equals to, it may overwrite. So make sure it's plus equals to, and then you extend is private of type Boolean default is false. And then you can actually in connection state remove, you can say, is it, uh, see site private address space is actually in a set. Is your IP address in this set of private address spaces? If they are like 192.168.172.16.10.0028, then you say this value is true. And if you do that, you will actually have an extended line in this connection record with is private as set as true and false for private IP address. So this is the way you extend the logging. So do says like, you know, you enrich your logs with more data. Uh, you like the things which you care for and you remove the log size file sizes by removing like uninteresting things. But remember when you extend the logging, especially for stuff like con record, don't make sure that you, you know, the log file is not going to be the same as default. So if you are exporting your logs to Splunk and you change your logging file, you, you may have odd, like problems in parsing the columns. Uh, so especially in ASCII, now you can actually like dump in JSON and it's a much more elegant way of parsing things out. And the order matters too in extended logging. So like, you know, uh, if is private and then there is something else here, like country code, that ordering will add two columns in the order in which this was written. So, and I, I, I put this actually because we had a personal, I had a personal experience. Uh, LBL, the logs actually get pulled into ClickHouse. And I actually, what I did was I added, like I had two extensions or three diffs of the con, con, con info. And one was peer like what particular line worker of the cluster actually processed this log line. And another one was GYP country codes, like source and destination country codes. So I, I, I loaded the files in different order. I first loaded peer and then I loaded country code, but ClickHouse actually was expecting country code before peer. And those that actually broke ClickHouse. So <clears throat> a colleague of mine came and is like, whoa, the logs are different. I'm like, what's different? It's like, oh, the order is different. Turns out the order was different because I loaded the, uh, I read F them in a different order accidentally. So this ordering definitely matters, especially when you're looking at parsing. So now how do you create your own stream? So, uh, let, no, how do you create a log stream? So like, how do you put a filter in there? So like, you know, you create, there is this built-in words called log create stream. And then I can say, uh, my log is going to be called connection summary log. And all the columns are actually the record con info. Remember con info record here? Oh, I, I called it con stats actually. But somewhere I called con info. Yeah, here is the con info. So this is the record con info, start time, end time, host, this thing. So I actually come here uh, and then I say, 
that the columns will be the record of con info and the log is going to be this. And then I said, okay, just put the filter as default. And then I added the filter. So then I have this some, some function where I actually uh, create info called con info of type con info. I add all the, like I populate all the variables which are there. And then I just say log write and this would actually write. And this thing would pretty much generate a log like this. Where did it go? This one. So this one is like, you know, just that this one was more of a con stats, but this would create you another log of your own choice. So I think the takeaway for you right now is more of pay attention to the syntax and this is how you do things. And uh, uh, you can actually use config framework. This is a little more sophisticated. So, you know, I, I want to log all the connections as long as they are in my, they are not in this list of filtered port. So you can use a configuration framework, point to a point file called filtered port. And then it says like you put a hook in there and hook has a break. So if the destination port is in list of filtered port, it actually says break in the log policy. And then this particular log line will not get written to the log file because it was a filtered port. So, and remember uh, long ago, I talked about events, functions and hooks. Hook is a hybrid between event and a function. Events don't allow you the capability to break out of it, but hook allows you the capability to break out of this particular thing. So this particular log policy, if this condition doesn't fulfill, it breaks out, which means that no further logging will be done. It, this is illustrated a lot better actually in the logging framework documentation if you look here. So, go through this more any questions come but uh, the idea here is like i walked through the slide deck but let me just go through the exercise and explain this little more those who understand logging or want a challenge of the logging uh, <clears throat> should actually uh, attempt this particular parts of the thing now i i see there is a question uh, how expensive should we consider log writers to be uh, actually, you know, I have found log writers to be more disk IO dependent than actually CPU process dependent. And is it acceptable performance wise to use regular expressions and filters? Oh man, I love your questions. This is such, such practical questions. So is it acceptable performance wise to use regular expressions and filters in production environment? How efficient are regular expression implementation? Wild card matches, wild card matches in Z. Regular expression implementation is very, very efficient actually. Uh, recall one wrote run Z regular expression stuff, and one actually is uh, uh, wrote Flax and Bison as well. At least he improved them at one point or another. So the regular expression engine is really good. I, I think I have done certain like I will not uh, recommend you to like put a million things in the pattern with like or, but if you put that, it will not have a big performance dent. Uh, definitely don't go million, but a few hundreds is fine. Uh, few thousands is fine. I haven't found problems with it, even with few thousands added in the regular expressions. That said, in reality, in practical world, you will not even get to few thousands. Like what I showed you here, let's say you want to do certain logging policy where you want to filter on certain ports. That will end up becoming a configuration framework thing. And now you may have like 10 port, 30 ports, and this is just set in tables. But if you're going with the regular expressions, for example, you know what? I don't want to log any HTTP connection as long as the string foo is in it, or like there are, 20,000 regular expression strings, put them, I think you will be okay. Now a practical advice here for running Z. If you're, uh, uh, you know, you can, when you're running in the cluster mode, you can have a logger node separate from your worker nodes and the manager node. So if you see performance uh, uh, hurting, you can dedicate extra hardware and run things. For example, I know that Keith's and my network are different and different with a scale of 20. So if we generate a, a million 
कनेक्शन लॉग्स कीट्स नेटवर्क वुड जनरेट लाइक हंड्रेड मिलियन और नो नो ट्वेंटी मिलियन एक्चुअली सो दे आर लाइक ट्वेंटी टाइम्स मोर देन आस सो समाइम्स इट डिपेंड्स ऑन योर नेटवर्क टू लाइक वॉट पर्टिकुलर थिंग इज कॉजिंग यू बैकलॉग एंड इज एक्सपेंसिव बट आई कैन गिव यू दैट रेगुलर एक्सप्रेशन आर pretty solid uh, efficient actually inside seek so let me just show you exercise 5 let's go through exercise 5 so if people can keep up with it go look at the extra credit part uh, <clears throat> it will be become like a uh, take away in zeek scripting is look at volumes think about things in terms of millions maybe billions too uh but let's go to script so here is the oh okay wow i kind of forgot this i am happy that we have this thing so this one is actually uh using the configuration framework the list of, read the list of filtered ports and then uh basically enable the logging and disable the logging so what this does is that you know uh, i export uh, so like somebody didn't mention about option so option is primarily used when you are using configuration framework either generally it's local or global sometimes constant but in this case i have a i'm i want this variable or this set of ports to be actually re, uh, manipulated by configuration framework so i said option filtered ports and then here is my file uh, of filter ports so anything you add to this file will get propagated to filtered ports without zeek restarting and in this thing what i am doing is actually uh, i have a hook called log policy so which basically sees that what is the response port if the destination port is in the list of filtered port is not in the filtered port it actually doesn't log if it is in the filter port it will log so basically this is an example of how to do a log filtering let me see what second uh, this one is oh okay so how about i run okay let me just run second first so z dash r this is so what i did is i actually ran uh, uh, this script which creates a new log file and first i ran it let's just look at this so now because zeek needs to read and this is a pcap we just use the expire function and we have a artificial uh, ex exit only after terminate but what happens here is that uh, i have a new log called con summary dot log and it actually says uh, what is the start time what is the end time what is the host count and what is the connection count and remember we we created a record right long ago uh, which was con record con id and this is what we ended up putting in there so now let's look at this code first so this was our con info record and con info was start time end time host which is a set of addresses then we said host count which is a count and connection count and then we actually came in the new connection event where we said is actually let me uh i skipped one thing which is uh, this table so table is called summary which is a table of address of connection info so if you see we are just building on the data structures we learned so far and so this is the table and then it has actually a create expire of 3 seconds with an expire function of called expire summary so this is the function remember arguments pass are literally what you define as the table and then the index of that table and it always returns an interval value generally 0 seconds or something you want 1 hour 7 hours 3 days depending so in this case uh, <clears throat> so what we did here is that we look that the index orage is it part of the table no we initialize the record so we create a local record of connection info 
set addresses, we initialize everything, and then we append things here, and then we increment the counter. Now we did all that, but what did we do here? So we call expire function in which we actually say that, you know, info is of type connection info. We populate this local record with the values coming from the table. So table has index address, what is the start time, end time, everything. Now, why did we not just dump connection info itself? Because, you know, we don't want to dump the list of hosts. We want to dump the no total number of counts of the host, the cardinality of the set. So which is given by two pipes. So that's why we said host count, which is going to be the number of elements inside the set host and connection count is just the value here. And then this is how we will write the log entry. So, so this allows us to write the entire thing. And how do you create the log stream? So the log stream is created in zkinet slide one, which says why, where does zkinet being used for? So zkinet is used to create a log stream. I call log stream connection summary. What are the elements in there? It's connection info, which is the record we talked about. The filter, we just put default filter. We could have changed this to like uh, <clears throat> IP. And then we can say, you know, if the IPs are from this subnet only, then log, otherwise don't log and so on. And then we just, so this is how we define the log stream. And ultimately we are using an expire function to write it. But yeah, this is the way you can actually uh, create your own log. So there is a con dot log. So this log actually logs all the things. And then there is a con summary, which logs actually this uh, start time, this end time, this. You know what's missing here? IP address. I don't know what IP is actually here. So uh, that's the example here. Logging add source IP to the log. So if we do this, now what I did is that I expanded the connection record to have timestamp, the IP address, and then all these values. So if I run this now, Again, because we are using an expire function, I just wait a little bit and then I cancel con summary.log. And now I have expanded this log to actually say, here is the IP address. So here is the remote IP. It started connections at this time, ended connections at this time, and here is all the cons. Now let's verify, is it true or not? So if we say con log, uh, it's 510.304 and 565. So is it started at 510.304? Yes. Does it end at 565? Yes. So here, start time, end time, and all. And you know, uh, you can take this time. This is just a tool we use at Berkeley Lab, CF, which actually converts the Unix times to human readable time, uh, dash F percent. Uh, yeah, so now it actually gives you years and everything too. So when I created this PCAP, that was 330 uh, on September 29, 2020. So well, still holding the test of time. But yeah, this actually gets you. Uh, now, this is the memory efficient logging stuff, but mem uh, what it does is instead of using a set of addresses, it uses opaque of cardinality. This is going to get a little complicated. I think I'm going to not go through this yet. If you are curious, everything is here. You should be able to look and build upon it. So, but here is exercise five. So this one is like, you know, here is this code, expand it and you should be able to actually address this entire thing. So what have we learned so far? We've learned actually how to find the relevant events. We uh, like go into uh, like Zeek base scripts, protocols, and then see what events you want, grab on word event. Uh, like we have found events like connection established, new connection, DNS request, DNS reply, so on and so forth then how do you tap into those events and access the right data? So I showed you how we can actually dump the values which Zeek self-populates inside the events which 
are part of their built-in functions. Then we got familiar with the data types like uh, <clears throat> interval sets, tables, records, and then event handling, like how do you tap into the event? How do you feed PCAPs into the script? And then you look at the logs and they generate. Uh, so now actually what I wanted to do was go through the notice framework. We have good 11 minutes to do it, which is amazing. <laughs> so I don't know, I can do it in 11 minutes, but I want to do it in three, four minutes because I want to do one more thing before I close this thing. So notice framework is basically same thing. Uh, you know, the big picture in the Zeek is, Zeek does not tell you what's bad. Zeek tells you what's on your network. It's on you to decide if it's bad or not. And we use the scripting to actually do certain kind of analysis and uh, anomaly detection. But once you know what's bad, you want to know about, like Zeek can write to a log file, but you want to know a little bit more than that. You want to actually generate a notice and that notice will actually take an action. So for example, at LBNL, if somebody is scanning us, we not only generate a notice, but we actually escalate it up so that we can go talk to our border routers and block the thing. So kind of create a dynamic firewall. Uh, in other cases, if something somebody does something, you want a notice to generate a page. And now your page is like, oh, exploit downloaded. So something like that. So that's where the notice is used for. So how does the notice work? So you extend, there is a built-in notice type. Uh, what you do is you just keep extending that. So now you have a new notice called attack. So you read if this notice and type, just remember this thing. And just like now you need to do attack two. So you do read if nm notice type plus equals to attack two. This is how you inside the script, you actually populate the notice record. So it's like note, is attack, here's a connection record. What is the identifier? So each unique notice, you can put a unique identifier and that way notice framework will allow you to suppress a notice. Like I don't want this notice to be generated more than once an hour. And then you can actually define the policy for notice. Like for this like training attack, I want an email. For others, I just want it suppressed. For others, I don't want an action. Uh, yeah, alarm or action page. So notice allows you these different kinds of actions going on. Now, remember the connection record, when I dump the connection record, similarly, if you dump notice record, this is what it will show you, the timestamp, the identifier, what is the connection ID, then it also has the connection record, but then it also has these things, like, you know, what is the notice thing? What is the message of the notice? What are the actions? what is the suppress for and so on. But this is noisy, hurts the eyes, very detailed. So what I generally care about in notice record is just note, source, what is the port, what are the messages, if I am actually doing connection, uh, record information, and then what, if I want to suppress this notice, not generate it every like thousands of times. Generate one, wait 15 minutes, generate another entry. So, <clears throat> So how do we do use notices in the scripts? You define notice like this, and then uh, you basically start populating. So in this case, there is an attack. What's the IP origin is the source. Uh, what's the number of count is the thresholds. And this, so basically we'll generate a notice where one, two, three, four has scanned 512 host. And here are the subnets of how many of those 512 IPs are in which subnet. So you can do certain things like this with the notice framework. Uh, and there are built-in notice things too, like these are notice variables, like, you know, ignore types. So if you say, add something to ignore types, for example, like training attack, if you add that to ignore type, it will always get ignored. So it results in notice being ignored. It won't have anything to do even in action log. It will completely say, if you see false positive, I would recommend against blanket ignoring notices, but you can do that. You can actually say, you know, the I want emails for this. I will again recommend against it because, you know, let's say you say attack and now 20,000 notices get generated, you will get 20,000 emails. So do it reasonably sensibly when you are playing with certain th things like this. So uh, here is a good example. Like for example, here, 
Uh, I have a CV 2020, 20, 13, 50, high confidence. If I am actually detected with high confidence, send an email and send an email to alerts mailing list as well. But it's a potential, then just send an email, but uh, just instead of sending it to alerts, send it to reports. So, you know, you can do a, a little manipulation of notices like here the notice is sensitive user agent if it's not scan machines it's not local then drop them if it's harvage then send an email and drop them so you know you can go into the notice policies and you can do definitions like this here is some examples of notices i have but uh, i want to actually spend six minutes doing something uh, which Brian actually asked for too. And I think it's a good thing to end with. So there are all this opaque of cardinality, bloom filter. So when I was talking about scales, this is how you will do scales. Like you can actually put million things in uh, like opaque of cardinality and you won't even burn any memory or bloom filters. I have used bloom filters exclusively, extensively for a lot of things, including like putting 10 million IP addresses in blacklist or actually watching for all the HTTP URLs if they get clicked on. Input framework is, if you want to learn two things, learn input framework and learn uh, Intel framework. I will just pass all the stuff. Uh, I apologize, but I feel better actually that I did not rush to things. Uh, same for clusterizations. Let's pass all this stuff. But I want to talk about this do's and don'ts of script so how do you write zeek script so here is a zeek script uh, everybody i know you're tired just pay attention to this this is worth it uh, i created a new module called http 404 and in this module what i did is i actually have a table <clears throat> track all the 404 requests for from a remote ip address and count them and default is zero, right? Expire, do it every six hours. And then I tap into HTTP reply and HTTP reply already like gives you me in platter all the things I need for an HTTP connection, which is all the connection record. What is the version string? What's the code and the reason? And what we care about is the code. Is code 200 okay? Uh, 302, 404 not found, depending 517. So depending on that. So what I do here, so this is all pre-baked, ready for you after passing the network byte stream passes through HTTP analyzer and Zeek files this event for you. You tap into the event, you say, okay, give me the IP address source destination. Then you say is code 404. Yes, code is 404. So you actually say, is this part of the table? No, you actually initialize the table, you increment the value and you are done. And you then you can use the cardinality uh, two pipes to see how what how many of them are there. If they are hundred, you print that there are hundred HTTP four hundred four not found for this IP address. And this actually is a detection to find web spiders. If somebody is like running a spider uh, on your uh, uh, web server and trying to like access these URLs which don't exist, you're like, why is somebody doing that? And like some kind of vulnerability scanner going on you can just count the number of 404s and good enough to block this thing. This is a working heuristic. This works. But what I want to show here is that, you know, what's wrong here? So what's wrong is that, you know, we don't care about response. So you don't need to declare this variable and burn extra memory in here. This kind of is a got you as well, because, you know, HTTP, event is going to fire a million times, 10 million times uh, in a day. And it will create this variable and destroy this variable. You don't need it. So you, you don't use it, declare a variable you don't need to just because you are in habit of doing it nice. Then here is the big one. I, actually, I learned this from like reading original like one scripts and Robin script. They would never do something like this. Uh, you always think it the other way around. You know, there are like how many, like if you do a graph of 200 OKs and 404, 200 OKs are very high. So if code is this, then do this. So if the code is not this, the code is, it still goes here 
calculates the value, does a condition. So there is like at least three instructions more which may be running, which you don't need. So what you do here is that instead of saying, if the code is equals to 404, say code not equals to 404. So if it's not 404, none of the further code runs anymore. And if none of the code runs, you actually like the system just returns back and now you saved million executions of this variable and 10 million executions of 200 OKs. The code never comes to this part. And then there is an off by one error because you know you are setting it here and then increment here. This should be zero. And a vast majority of non-404 will doesn't need this. So you should not come here. So what you really need is actually this global take track this thing. You define orage. You see if orage is not in your local nets, is in local nets. So you don't even want to worry about the IP addresses which are actually inside your network. You want to worry about the IPs which are remote, trying to run a scan on your web server. So you ignore everything which is local nets. So the code will never come even this further down. Then if code is not 404, you return. None of this will execute here. Otherwise, you see, you initialize, you count, and then you go and you do this. And I think the exercise for you is that you know you need to create a notice called HTTP 404 spider and then generate the notice similar to what I did here, like notice attack, generate that. And if you do that, that will work. So basically eliminate all uninteresting connections. That is one of the gotcha for performance. If it's all not of interest, eliminate it. If it is interest, keep going further down. So use return as many, like as much as you can. And risking over going over it, but when you're writing scripts, write them like this link you know there is only so many things attacker can do attacker scans the system finds a vulnerable machine runs and exploits downloads the malware misuses it this is basically an attack life cycle they will almost always do something like that so you know when you write a zig script you write a detection which lights up like a christmas tree you know you can write a detection for scan you may or may not be able to write a detection for vulnerability you write a detection for exploitation if possible. You write detection for download. You write detection for misuse. So some things might run. Some alerts might run here. Some alerts might run here. But you think of an attack from a state machine point of view. And you, know, you write attack-centric detections like that. So that way, you think about like, you know, here is the vulnerability. Here are five things attackers will do. Let me write heuristic for each one of them. So I wrote a heuristic for shell shock in back in 2014. If they attempt, it will generate a notice. There is a domain generator notice, URI generator notice, compromise generator notice. So I wrote this detection. 2018, Apache stress comes, same attack, exact same thing, different vulnerability. It, there was an attempt, there was a URL, there was a notice. And then log4g came last year. And I'm kidding you not, I started writing detection and I'm like, oh, this seems to be similar to a stress and uh, uh, which one was this shell shock. So I literally took uh, shell shock, uh, change the regular expression. And there is an attempt, there is a callback, callback domain, callback. What they did is they actually were using base 64 callback. So there's additional to that. But yeah, all three of them separated by roughly four years because this was in November, December last year. But they, all had different vulnerabilities, but same way of exploitation. There is an attempt, there is a URL. So like, if you are vulnerable, there was a user agent, which would actually call, curl, download the exploit, execute the exploit, and then exploit will do a domain lookup, and then there would be a URL. Same thing happens with log 4 g So when you write scripts, think in this manner. I think I'm about the time. Uh, any questions, anything? Uh, I, I'll still be here for another 10 minutes if you want to, uh, but uh, I think uh, I will stop at this place. So uh, everybody who is still here, uh, we will have this channel open for another week, two weeks, maybe a month. Uh, send questions here. If uh, actually uh, I stopped the screen. Okay, hold on. And 
if you want, uh, here is my contact info actually here. Uh, you can send an email to Ashish at Zeek or uh, Asher at LBL if you have any questions. Uh, I will make sure we are available for you. All the material is already on GitHub with the slide deck. So I know this is too much stuff, but uh, uh, we haven't even scratched the surface. Thanks, everybody. And any questions? I'm still around for the next few minutes at least. So. Yes, please do provide feedback because your feedback will really uh, at least tell us how to change the training, especially Zeek Week is coming uh, soon. So what to do, how to break it, is this format okay, acceptable? So please do it for Fatima and Keith's training as well as mine. And, 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 and feel free to be harsh, so. It's a lot of content. It is a lot of content, but like if we don't, uh, like the stuff which I have told you, no, no, actually, I think uh, not much more, Kevin, pretty much just feedback would be useful. And I am available for answering questions. We'll keep this Slack channel open for at least next few weeks. So if you are going through exercise, feel free to ask questions or if you get stuck. All right, folks, uh, seems like no further questions. Uh, thanks for your patience and staying. This, this was a long day. Uh, I totally empathize with everybody. So, but great work. I hope like we, we have more people contributing with Zeek and scripting and everything. So. Bye everyone. Thanks, Ashish, for the training.